two, one. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, to our joint um, Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council uh, uh, funding meeting. Uh, my name is Eric Edgley. I'm the Habitat Section Chief for Division of Wildlife Resources. Um, Randy, you, you want to introduce yourself really quick? Yeah, and I'm Randy Oppler. We're a fisheries advisor. Thank you, Randy. Um, as we get started in this meeting, uh, we will be going through a roll call. Uh, Daniel Eddington, if you could put the agenda on the screen now at this point. And as that's occurring, I wanna welcome anybody from the public who is watching this stream. Uh, and thanks for joining us today. Um, great. Thank you, Dan Daniel, for putting the agenda uh, on the screen. Everybody should be able to see the agenda on the screen now. And, um, with, with that and seeing the agenda, I'm gonna go through a quick roll call of all of the Habitat Council and the Blue Ribbon Council members. Uh, each of you, when you hear your name, please uh, unmute your mic and indicate that you are here and you're participating. Um, and then uh, you can mute your mic again. Um, if, uh, others join on. I would ask you to mute your mic. Uh, Pam, if you can mute, that would be great. Um, okay. As part of the roll call, um, this will also be a vote to approve the agenda for the meeting. So um, we will start with the Habitat Council. Um, Tyler Thompson. Uh, Tyler Thompson, I'm here and I vote to approve the agenda. Thank you, Tyler. Justin Shannon. Justin Shannon. Sorry, the mute button took a while. I'm here and I vote to approve the agenda as well. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Drew Cushing. Yes, I'm here and I move to approve the agenda. Thank you, Drew. Darren West. Yes, I am here and I vote to approve the agenda. Thank you, Darren. Dwayne Reading. I'm here and I vote to approve the agenda. Thank you, Dwayne. Jack Ray. Here, approve. Thank you, Jack. Paul Burnett. I'm here and I vote to approve the agenda. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Blue Ribbon Council members, we'll start with Dave Yunin. I'm here. Okay, and you approve the agenda? Yes. Thank you. Megan Birdsey. Megan Birdsey. Megan, I'll come back to you. Uh, Larry Finch. I'm here and I vote to improve the agenda. Thank you, Megan, are you on? Yeah, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. I'm here and I approve. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rex, Rex Infinger. I'm here and I approve the agenda. Thank you, Rex. Herbert or Bert. Yep. Herbert or Bert Lay, I'm here and I approve the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Ben Kurtz. Let's see if he got his mic working. I'm here and I approve. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. I heard you loud and clear. Okay, Ken Strong.
uh, here and Okay, I heard heard that it was a little shaky, but I got it. Thank you, Ken. TJ. Still present and I approve. Thank you. Last one, uh, George Weekly. I'm here and I approve. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, everybody. Um, the roll call went well. The um, motion to approve uh, the agenda has passed. Okay. Um, so we call this meeting to order and our start our meeting date is April 14th, 2020. It is now uh, 9.24 a.m. Um, again, I wanna thank our technology team for helping us out today. And um, I wanna indicate that there are several Division of Wildlife uh, personnel on with us today. Uh, I'm kinda of gonna go through that, that list, Alan Ward, Allison Whitaker, uh, Calvin Black, Chris Crockett, Clint Brunson, Cody Edwards, Daniel Eddington, Danny Summers, Darren West. Um, and if I get some of these mixed up, I apologize. Drew Cushing, he's part of the council as well. Um, Gary Bezant, thanks for joining us. Um, Jim Dorito, thank you. Mark Farmer, Jim Lamb, Jordan Nielsen from Trout Unlimited. Um, Kent Sorensen, thank you. Um, Nikita Hansen, thanks for joining us. Mark Farmer, I already mentioned that. Um, Mike Slater, Nick Braithwaite, Pam Kramer, Pat Rainbolt, um, Brett Boswell, Richard Hepworth, Robbie Edgel, Scott Walker, Stan Beckstrom, and that is it. Thank you all for being with us. Um, okay, at this point, if there are no questions, I'll ask for if there's any questions that we will move into uh, presentations um, of proposals. Are there any questions before we move into that? Okay, if there are no questions. Let's get this meeting on the roll. And so we will start with uh, our Southern region projects. Daniel Eddington will be providing a screen share of the project that was in the WRI database and or slides that have been sent to him. And um, so if you are the one presenting, remember to state your name and your affiliation um, and go ahead and present your project. So we'll start with project uh, 5305 Fish Lake Perch Tournament. Go ahead. Okay, this is Sam Beckstrom. I'm in the Southern Region, the Assistant Aquatics Manager. Hey, Stan, make sure that you uh, speak up. It's a little bit light uh, on your volume. So uh, okay. talk, talk loudly and we should be fine. Okay. So uh, Daniel, can you pull that up on the WRI database, that project, 5305? Are you guys not seeing it? I have on here Doe Valley Boater Access Improvement. Right. It looks like a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, that one's a bit further down the list. Yeah, you're... Your WRI database window is not sharing for some reason. Hey, there we go. Okay. Um, and probably just on all of these, probably just need pictures from that are in there and, and then go to the finance when we get talking about that. Um, but I, I just wanted to give a little background on Fish Lake. 
uh, Fish Lakes are one of our most popular fisheries in the southern region. It's a beautiful high mountain lake, stable elevation, water elevation, very popular recreation area, not just for angling, but for um, all kinds of recreation up there, very popular. Um, we do have about over 150,000 angler hours annually up there. There's three resorts with marinas. There's there's campgrounds. There's um, a lot of really nice facilities up there. Uh, it's increasing. Business up there is increasing every year. And right now it's a major area for the division to focus on for improving our facilities out there. Up there. They've been in poor condition over many years. Uh, very little has been done in the last 30 to 50 years up there. And we're in the process of doing a lot of work up there, improving marinas. The last couple of years, we've been working on the marinas, improving them. And these um, first three projects I'm proposing and asking to be funded are just some further improvements. They're kind of related to the marinas, but in general, it's improving all the facilities up there. So um, one thing, so the first uh, project proposal is about our Fish Lake Perch Tournament. This is, this year was our fourth annual perch tournament. It's been great with the public. We've had a lot of interest, a lot of good positive feedback from it. The last two years, we've had approximately an estimated 2000 people attend this. It's a nice fishing event. And um, we give out a lot of prizes. Uh, Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife has helped uh, with the prizes, but we also involve the local governments. We, um, the private individuals help. And, and it's just a, a lot of um, cooperative effort to pull this off. And it is a really popular event. So this, um, it costs us about $5,000 each year to put this event on. And most of that goes towards snow plowing so we can open up enough public parking so we can get that many cars and people up there at one time. And then we need to um, rent portable toilets and buy some five gallon buckets for prizes that we give out. And so um, in the past, we've been funding this with our regional aquatics budget and the Salt Lake office aquatics budget. And so at this time, we're just asking for another source of funding this that, that our regional and Salt Lake office budgets are tight. So we're just asking for Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council to fund this $5,000. And this is the first year we've asked for it, but I would expect us to ask for this every year. And I think that's all I have on it, if there's any questions. This is Paul Burnett. Um, I have a question. Is there a registration fee for the tournament? No, and, and that's one reason it's so popular. This is a free event. Anybody can, can come and participate. We do have an online sign up prior to it. We ask people to sign up online. And we've had over 2,000 people sign up, but not everybody shows up. But it is a free event. All of the prizes are donated, and we have different contests and raffles and stuff like that that happen. Are there any, are there any other questions about these three projects? Well, this is just the first one, the Perch Tournament. Uh, Ken Strong here. I got a question for you, Stan. Uh, this, this tournament was originally set up to promote uh, taking the uh, perch out of the lake, hopes of being able to grow bigger fish. From what the division has said, it takes three quarters of a million fish to be removed in order to uh, do anything at all or near that being removed. Uh, in the past, we've got by with money that's been donated from groups. Uh, and as you know, there's been a problem now with, 
with the advertising company that you guys have. Uh, I'm just, I'm just wondering if this is really essential for a free tournament that gives away seven thousand dollars in prizes. Thank you. Um, could what specifically was your question again, Ken? I understand. I understand what you're saying, but you want to know if this is a worthwhile pro tournament to hold, or is that what you were asking? Here, I, I just, I wonder if this is money well spent uh, for the perch tournament when it's not really doing what it was designed to do five years ago, and the money could be used in other ways for the perch tournament. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. When when we hold this tournament, we estimate there's thirty to forty thousand perch removed in one day, plus the all the perch that are removed throughout the year, and that amount of perch has no impact on the perch population there essentially, but there are millions of perch in that lake. Even a hundred thousand really doesn't make any difference and the perch population as far as what we are seeing so far. Um, but that doesn't mean that this isn't a valuable tournament, that this is so popular with anglers. Um, there's so much positive feedback from people. People look forward to this event and it, and it is getting the word out there that perch, illegally introduced perch and other fisheries do impact fisheries and that we can't always do that. It's a good project to promote um, conservation and not moving fish and managing fish. And uh, it's still well worth holding this tournament just for the uh, anglers themselves that want to go. Um, there are some indications maybe the perch, perch population is decreasing, but this would take years and years and, and it may not decrease at all, and it may not change our perch population up there. It just certainly benefits to the public in the division of holding this event. And, and um, in, in our opinion, it's well worth $5,000 to hold this event every year. Plus there's a lot of, you know, the donations and the benefits to the businesses up there. Um, the community businesses in Richfield, Loa, other places, this is a boon to their economy on that weekend that they're sold out of hotels. You know, there's a lot of the economic benefits as well. So I, I think it's well worth $5,000 every year. Thank you, Stan. Are there any other comments about uh, the perch tournament? Okay, hearing none, uh, Stan, if you wanna move on to the next one, Fish Lake Marina. Okay, Fish, Fish Lake Marina aerators. So like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're doing a lot of work on improving the marinas, expanding them, uh, upgrading them up to more modern standards. Um, one thing that happens is Fish Lake is a large water body. It freezes late in the year, it's usually Christmas or later before Fish Lake freezes. But the problem is that um, the marinas freeze much earlier. They freeze in October or very first part of um, November. And once those marinas freeze, then anglers can't launch their boats and fish that November, December period, which is really a good time to be fishing up there. And so we we're proposing to purchase and aerator to put in one of the marinas, Lakeside Marina. And this would keep it ice free. And so we could run it in November and December and keep that marina open so that people could launch boats, fish up there, uh, extend that fishing season in the fall. It would add another four to six or seven weeks of fishing up there every fall. And uh, we've had people ask us to do this and, and I think it would be a great benefit to the whole fishery and anglers 
at Fish Lake. Um, it's $9,000 to buy the aerator. It would be connected to electricity. And, um, and then we need about $2,000 to install it, to run conduit and, and connect it to the electrical system. So we're asking for $11,000 for this um, project here. Any questions on that? And this is Drew. Who would who would be responsible yes. for maintaining the aerators? Would that be the concessionaire? I hope. Um, we haven't worked out that detail. It would be a combination with uh, Fish Lake Resorts and us. We'd probably just work together to do it. Um, it would be connected to the Fish Lake Resorts electrical system, power system. So they would be handling that part of it. Um, but yeah, the um, owner of Fish Lake Resorts is real good to work with. We have a good relationship with him. And, and I think it'd just be a combination effort with both of us doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Are there any other questions or comments on this project? Stan. This is Rex Infanger. Um, oh, sorry, Bert. Um, I, I was just wondering, this new aerator will be big enough for the, the new marina, is that correct? Yes, we've, we've worked with the, or talked to the manufacturer of these aerators, so that's recommendations on the size of aerator and everything to use. And the fact that it being solar powered, this would be connected to the electrical system so we can it's a lot cheaper to buy a larger aerator that'll keep the lane open from the boat ramp out to the mill. That's why it's only $9,000 for a larger aerator because it's electrical instead of solar powered. Stan, this is Bert Lay. I have a question regarding engineering and whether or not aerators have been used in situations like this. These marinas are relatively shallow. It would seem like aerators work best if they are uh, aerating in deep water to bring the warmer water up from the bottom. I'm concerned that they may not work as intended, but I was curious to know if they've been used in other simi similar situations, marinas like this. Um, Nick, Nick Braithwaite has been talking to the manufacturers and I, I'm sure that they've been used in similar situations. I don't know the specifics of it. Um, these aerators would be a long perforated hose line. They wouldn't just be a round aerator. They'd be a long um, hose with holes in it to aerate it. And it's not that the water comes up from the bottom it's just the movement of the, the air creates movement in the water and, and it does help circulate, but it's the air bubbles themselves is what really keeps it ice free. And um, the manufacturer said, yes, it will work. So, so I think they have experience with it and they tell us it would work fine. So this is Nick Braithwaite, if you can hear me. Um, so yeah, we originally looked into it um, we got the idea from the aerators we've used on the Boulder Mountain for oxygen issues, and that's done such a good job keeping open water there that that was kind of the, the first idea for it. And when I talked to the manufacturer, I found out they actually build aerators specifically for this type of use, keeping marinas open. And I think they're really popular more in the Midwest and stuff, but, but it sounds like they have a lot of experience with it, and it's fairly common. Nick, this is Bert again. Thank you for that. And also Stan, thanks. I, yeah, any insights from other parts of the country where these are used would be helpful. Um, I think this could also be a good kind of project or pilot project for the ultimate installation of aerators at the forthcoming fishing pier at Fish Lake. Any comments on that? Um. Yeah, yeah, we, we would want to run an aerator at the fishing pier that we have planned for 
a year or two down the road. And yeah, this would, um, this would help us identify any potential problems there as well. Thank you, Stan. Are there any other questions about this project? Okay. Um, thank you uh, again, Stan. You got one more uh, fish cleaning yeah, stations, yeah. fifty-three sixty-two. Okay. Um, so the like I said earlier, these facilities and things up at Fish Lake are old. <laughs> we just haven't. There just hasn't been a lot of money put into Fish Lake until recently. So there's three fish cleaning stations at Fish Lake, one at each of the marinas. And uh, the two at the, the one at Lakeside and the one at Bowery Haven Marina, those were really old. We didn't, we haven't even, we're not even sure how old these are, but they do work terrible. They're constantly needing to be repaired. Um, they may they may be from the 1960s or 80s or 90s, I, we're not sure, but but they um, function so poorly that you can't put the fish carcasses down them because they don't grind them up small enough and people put fish down them and then they plug up the sewer system up there and it has to be cleaned out. So right now at, at these fish cleaning stations, they ask you to put the fish carcasses in the trash can sitting next to it and then the Marina, marina operators need to haul it away and dispose of it, but while they're sitting there, it just attracts flies and animals, and they're just not very efficient. They're just not working. They just need to be replaced or just completely removed or something, but they're not serving their purpose at all, really. Um, so we're proposing to purchase, we'd like to replace two of the uh, fish cleaning stations. The one in the middle at Lakeside Lodge is a little newer, so we think we it functions a little better. Um, so we'd like to keep that one, but replace the two on the north and south end of the lake. And uh, the, we've contacted the manufacturer, the same ones that are at Lake Powell that they can grind up stripers like nothing and work great. So we've contacted the same um, manufacturer and they've given us, this is the cost to do them. There's about, well, we need about $75,500 to purchase and install these fish cleaning stations. Um, they're used a lot and they really do need to be repaired because they're replaced just to benefit, the, to help the anglers up there. Um, so if there's any questions on that. Uh, Stan, this, this, is, this is Drew again. Uh, yeah. Same question as before. Uh, do we have a signed or any kind of agreement on who would maintain, repair this, uh, the, these fish cleaning stations? We, we don't have the signed agreement yet, but they would um, be the responsibility of the resort owners, both Bowery Haven and Fish Lake Resorts, that they would re be responsible to take care of them and maintain them. Um, we haven't gotten to that point until we know that we're gonna buy them. If the, the division would not be responsible for them. Uh, the ones that are currently there are owned by the Forest Service and they take care of them, but they wanna get rid of them. They keep trying to give them to the marine owners and the marine owners tell them no because they don't work. So, but these new ones, they would take them on and do them. We wouldn't buy them or purchase them and install them unless the resort, on, resort owners will take responsibility for them. Thank you, Stan. Okay, additional comments. I know there was some other folks that wanted to comment. I, I was gonna say, we were just looking at purchasing one this year. This is just the cost for one. And then in, in a future year, we'd like to replace the other one as well. Thank you, Stan. Any other comments? Uh, 
Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate uh, your presentations there. Um, thank you, Southern Region staff, for joining us for those. Um, we're going to move next to uh, Central Region Projects, uh, Project uh, 5240, uh, Lower Provo River. And I'm not sure who the presenter is on this, um, but I'll let them jump in. And I want to thank our Central Region staff for being on with us today. Thanks, Eric. This is Mike Slater, and I'll be presenting the information that, that we have on the Lower Provo River. Um, Daniel, if you could take us to the images. I'd like to look at the very first one. It's a map, that, that one right there. Thank you. Um, this is a pretty unique proposal that we're submitting um, and asking for funding to help us with. Something that hasn't really been done before, but essentially we are asking on this Blue Ribbon Fishery to have some in-stream flows on about 1.2 miles of the river right near the mouth of the canyon. Um, if I can explain this, I've got a few dots there. I don't know how well you can see this, um, but we're right at the mouth of Provo Canyon. And at the base of that canyon, there's an Olmstead power plant, which has just been renovated. And because of that renovation over the last several years, all of the water has flowed straight down through the river and down through the mouth of the canyon which has created a great fishery um, and anglers have really taken hold to this and spend a lot of time fishing here. Now that the power plant is completed, most of that water is all being diverted through a pipeline so that it can generate power. So we have essentially lost the water in the river itself, minus approximately six CFS that will flow through there for other water rights purposes. So that's kind of where we're at and what we're trying to do is, is again, secure some water to maintain a, a fishery there. Um, I had a video, but I don't think we'll do, uh, we'll go through that just because of time. But back in 2018, for a little more history behind this proposal, it was a very dry year and some angler, Trout Unlimited and others, um, amongst ourselves as well with Division of Wildlife, recognized the fact that there was essentially no water flowing through this section. I mentioned six CFS is required to go through here, but the river commissioner changed that to where the water was only allocated to 50%. So it was three CFS that needed to go through here, which essentially we had some fish kills that were taking place. We didn't have any habitat, fish don't do really very well without water. And so it brought this up to our attention. And now with several partners, with several different individuals, they're really helping us try and come up with a way that we can secure um, some consistent water here in the mouth of, of Provo Canyon. So we feel that this project will, without a doubt, um, enhance the, and make the fish population possible um, without water. So. Thank you for that photo there. This is the stretch that we're looking at. It's approximately 1.2 miles of stream. And this is what it looks like. Actually, this is more than the three CFS that was flowing through here. But this river is usually wetted width all the way across there, a lot of fish. But this is what it's starting to look like on an annual basis for approximately 90 days. And so we're needing to secure water so that we can enhance the fish population as well as the habitat um, for the fish in this stretch. We have several guides, several anglers that are utilizing this stretch of stream. And without the water, we're really losing a lot of opportunities for anglers uh, to be able to fish here. Um, that being said, um, back in 2003, we had a krill survey done on the lower Provo River um, we're scheduled to do another one of those coming up soon, but based on that information and some information from the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Council in calculating the value that's placed on the Pro River through the amount of use that's being um, experienced on the river and what anglers spend on a fishing trip. 
we calculated approximately $290,000 are being spent by anglers per mile on the lower Provo River. And so, so that's, again, very old data. I think there's a lot more anglers. This is anecdotal information, a lot more anglers using it now. So it's a real economic loss if we don't have water in this stretch of the river. Um, Daniel, if we can go to the financial page, maybe I can explain how we're trying to purchase this water. I don't know if you can see this very well, but what we are wanting to do is purchase um, for 90 day period at a cost of $47 per cubic foot of per second of water. What that equates to is we are paying for the power that is no longer generated because we're taking water that would have gone through the power plant, but we're leaving it in the stream and we have to pay for that loss. It's a unique way, a different way, uh, much, much cheaper than purchasing water rights, which essentially really aren't even available. So this is a different way for us to get some water into this stretch of stream and over a 90 day period to have 10 CFS flowing through this stretch would cost approximately $423,000. And we're wanting to split that between Habitat Council and the Blue Ribbon uh, Council. Now, in addition to this, we're partnering with Bonneville Engineering Foundation who have already contributed or in the process of contributing $380,000 to do essentially the same thing for another nine CFS. So that's money that's already spent, already um, pretty much taken care of. And Jordan Nielsen may be able to help us with that, but it's in the final, final stages of that being taken care of. So we've got great partners with Trout Unlimited, with Utah Water Conservancy District, others working with this Bio, um, Bonneville Engineering um, Foundation. There's a lot of people that see the value in creating this habitat, providing anglers with fishing opportunities here in the lower Provo River. Um, and so that in a nutshell is really what we're asking for. One additional item that we're asking to help us with the monitoring, um, the financial transactions, taking care of that is Trout Unlimited. will be doing a lot of that for us. And so there's another $15,000 that's um, attributed to that or to help us with that. Now, again, this is a 10 year proposal. This is to allow us to get at least this much water into this stretch of river. There's been several other studies and I would ask the council members to maybe look at some of the objectives and plans that are associated with this proposal that explains it a lot more in detail. How we really would like to have 57 CFS based on some earlier studies is what this stretch really would need to maintain the kind of habitat that has traditionally been here. But this 10 to 20 CFS will be huge in, in providing, again, fish habitat and an opportunity for anglers to continue to fish there. Um, I guess there's a couple other um, partners with us, Jordan Nelson, uh, Brian Wimmer with Trout Unlimited, uh, Chris Crockett. If any of you have anything else to share or to add that I've kind of missed, please chime in on this. Hi, this is Jordan Nelson with Trout Unlimited. Um, I just want to add that uh, Bonneville Environmental Foundation goes out and they, the, the, the way this is funded through them um, is unique to the way that we've worked in Utah in the past. So this, they, they go and they find corporate partners that want to offset their water use. So we have businesses in Utah that are using water that want to have a positive environmental image that are contributing water back to the system by working with us on projects like this. So the, the deal is brokered through Bonneville Environmental Foundation, but we have a local business that's, that's bringing money into the economy um, with their business, but also pumping money back into the environment by uh, funding projects like this. So uh, we like this. We think that it's exciting and a, and a good new way of doing business here in the state. Thanks. Thanks, Jordan. This is Brian Wimmer with Trout Unlimited. Um, this is a very important piece of uh, river. There's some amazing German brown trout in this piece of river, and it's really um, a, a, a very 
popular with some of the better fishermen. And it's one of the pieces that is kind of left alone by the kids in the rafts and the tubers. And so it's one of the places that anglers can really enjoy getting out and fishing and going after. There's some really big browns in this area. So when we found it with no water in it, we were thinking we were gonna kill out all these beautiful browns and we were able to find enough water just to let them survive. I just think that this is really important that we find some consistency in this. And, and it's a really, it's a big deal for the anglers. You know, so we have some of the top anglers in the world that live in Utah County, and it's one of their favorite places to go. People, a uh, couple guys on the U.S. Uh, fly fishing team. And they're in fact the ones that brought it up to us. And we're just, we're really excited about the possibility of this. It, it, I think it's really important. Thanks. Hey Mike, this is Chris Crockett. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to applaud, uh, applaud everyone on their efforts to get this put together. And I, as far as a message to the council, I just wanted to mention that I really don't think we're ever gonna find a better opportunity or a cleaner opportunity to provide adequate water in the Provo River. I mean, this, as Mike alluded to, we've got partners that are matching us on pretty much all of the cost. We're trying to secure a sizable portion of water to increase flow so that we can maintain a fishery. And we're really talking about a pretty small economic, uh, excuse me, we're really talking about a small amount of money that we're putting forward to generate over $300,000 of economic value every year. The other nice thing about this is it should not be able to be contested. We are not purchasing water rights. Um, there's not even any water rights available. Really what we're purchasing is that bypass to allow that water to flow down the stream. We're purchasing the cost that would have been associated with the, the energy law. So I don't really think we're ever gonna find a better or a cleaner opportunity to enhance flows on the lower Pro River. This is Rex Anger. Um, I, so we're basically looking at about uh, $80,000 a year split between Habitat and Blue Ribbon. Is that correct, Mike? We're actually asking for all of the funds right now to purchase the water for a 10 year period at the current rate, knowing that that water is going to get more and more expensive every year for this power generation loss. But they are willing to go and allow us to do this all at once right now. And I would just add that this will also allow us to look for other opportunities to secure more water, water in different ways um, for forever, essentially. So this is a temporary thing for 10 years, but that 10 years should give us an opportunity to perhaps even generate power with water. Maybe we even pipe that water back up and dump it back into the river and allow it to flow down. That's just an idea, just some thoughts that are going out there. So there's a lot of work by various different individuals looking at this as to how can we make this happen forever rather than just having to pay for, as Chris mentioned, the very, very clean way of getting some water in the river for a period of time. So it would be a 400,000 approximately asked for each habitat and Blue Ribbon for this year because it all has to be done this year, correct, Mike? Actually, I would split that in half. It's approximately $219,000 for the Habitat Council and the same amount for Blue Ribbon, which equates to the total of $438,000 that we are actually asking for. And that okay. will be matched with the $380,000 that Bonneville Engineering Foundation has already put up. Thank you. Great, thank you everybody. Uh, this is a screaming deal and I appreciate everybody chiming in on that. Let's just take uh, one or two more comments on this. Uh, you heard her? And then Dave. Yeah, this, and then Dave. this is Bert Lay. I just had two quick questions. Just want to confirm that public access is completely open on this, access and accessibility. And then the second question, uh, does this have any impact on endangered species June sucker? I presume it does not. Good questions, Bert. Yes, it is completely accessible. There's a trail right along the river, very easy access from the mouth of the canyon to what we call Canyon Glen Park. 
And as far as native species, um, we have mountain whitefish there, but it, it's not going to negatively impact the June suckers downstream because this is again, waters bypassed this stretch of stream where we have no June suckers up this high. So where the June suckers are being impacted, that water will still make it down there. Um, but this will certainly enhance, you know, the whitefish, the rainbows, the cutthroat, uh, the brown trout in this stretch of stream. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Dave, Mike. I got a question for you. Can you hear me? What's that, Dave? Go ahead, Dave. Because I've looked into, I mean, obviously, uh, Powers clean clean power. Power company is going to have somewhere, and it's probably going to be coal generated. Have you guys looked into? It? It's almost counterintuitive to be doing something like this for such a short stretch of river. Been on that one, Mike. This is Jordan Nielsen. So this power plant is part of a, of a pretty complicated exchange of water rights that allowed Jordan L Reservoir to go in. Uh, the water is excess power on the grid. Um, they don't need to generate the power other than to exercise the water rate and maintain that, that water rate. The, the power loss, um, the, the reason that the water is so inexpensive is because that power loss is not very valuable to Central Utah Water Conservancy District. So like Chris was saying, this is a unique situation where we can secure water in a really clean way that benefits benefits the environment and doesn't hurt uh, the power uh, generation that the economy generated around that or uh, take any other like farming business or anything else upstream out. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be offset by uh, a less clean way of making power at this point. Well said, Jordan, thank you very much. There's a few chats going on asking about water banking and other solutions. Yes, those are some other things that are being looked at. I mentioned this proposal is for the next 10 years. Hopefully that will give us that period of time to look at, can we lease water further upstream um, from different water users or water owners? and then send that water down the stream. Can we pipe water from the power plant just upstream a mile or two and put that water back into the system after it's already generated that power? There's multiple different things that are being looked into as to how can we get water in this stretch of river without just simply paying the interference costs. Good questions, but that is being looked into. Chris, my Thank only you. Uh, uh, question uh, for Mike in, in this in the group is: This is Drew. Yeah, uh, should that be looked in before we invest four hundred thousand dollars plus into uh, leasing water when water banking might be a more permanent solution? We feel we need water today. And so that's where we have this clean opportunity to purchase the interference costs, which is a significantly cheaper, to be honest, to be able to do this. And that would give us the amount of time or some time that we can start looking into a more permanent solution. But we need something today that we can utilize so that we can maintain that fishery, maintain the economic boom, the angling opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, we are looking into that, but we feel we need something more immediate. And where we have this partner that has come in, they're already purchasing some. We feel we wanna jump aboard and be a part of that so that we have enough water in this stretch to meet the goals and the objectives that we have on this stretch of the river. Drew, this is Chris. I'll chime in just to echo what Mike's saying. Um, we've been looking at water banking, I think it, I think it could have some potential, but quite frankly, um, I don't think it's something that if we are able to work it out, I don't think it's going to happen very quickly. It'd be a nice problem to have if in, you know, five or seven years, we realize that there's another solution long term, but I don't think we're wasting money by buying us that opportunity to actually work on some of these other ideas. As you guys probably 
no, it seems like water banking is always an opportunity that's five years out and it's been five years out for the last, you know, 10 years I've been here. This is this Rex Enfanger. Um, we were talking about angler access and there being a trail alongside the river right there. The trail is asphalt. I mean, this is probably one of the most angler accessible stretches of the Propol River there is. So there really is a lot of angler access availability right through this section. Good point, Rex. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the good discussion there. Let's just take one last comment and then we'll, we'll move on. Go ahead. Who was jumping on? Anything okay. else? Or? Yeah, Mike, you want to wrap up on that one? Okay. Again, we just feel this is a great opportunity for us. Um, council members, there's a lot more information in that proposal that kind of explains the details a little bit more, the objectives, the monitoring, and how this is really gonna make, make a huge benefit to anglers as well as the, the habitat. We can do an awful lot of manipulations, manipulations with habitats of various different kinds, but without water, fish don't do too well. And so we feel this is, this is kind of a, uh, a no-brainer as far as the habitat benefits that we could see. Now it is expensive, but we're hoping that in the long run that we'll see that this is actually pretty cheap. But thank you, thank you for your um, comments and, and discussion on this. Yeah, that was a good discussion. I really appreciate the comments. Uh, thank you, Drew. I appreciate that too. Um, uh, I'm not a voting member of, of either council, but uh, I would highly support this. This is over a 10 year period that is super cheap water uh, for getting some uh, hopefully fairly guaranteed flows. And, uh, and anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you everybody on that. So um, let's move on. Uh, I appreciate a good discussion on that one. That was a really important project. Um, we'll look to try to keep our, our discussions uh, a little more shorter on the other ones, but that's okay. Um, Let's move on to the next one, Strawberry Reservoir Co-op uh, Snowplow Project. This is Alan Ward. Uh, just going to chime in on this one. Uh, got a couple of these today, but we'll start off with the snow plowing. This is not a new one. Most people have, um, at least if you've been on the councils for very long, have heard this one. Um, and it's it's kind of a continuation of what we've been doing. There's there's a few minor changes to some of the uh, proposals in the past that I'll get to towards the end, but to kind of go through the, the checklist, this is mainly for access to the reservoir. Uh, during the winter time, we have a lot of people that fish strawberry during the winter time. We get as much as 250,000 hours of angler pressure during the winter alone at Strawberry Reservoir, and they have to have somewhere to park. Um, so we've developed a system with uh, state parks uh, that we've been working with them over about the last 15, 14, 15 years to go in and help us maintain or plow some of those parking areas so that we have angler access to the reservoir. Um, and it's been very relatively inexpensive uh, compared to the number of hours that we actually get out of this. Like I say, 250,000 hours. We normally don't spend more than about twelve to $15,000 a year out of these Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council funds. So it's a pretty good bargain. Um, the state parks has been able to do this uh, with a couple of pieces of equipment and one person hired on during the winter uh, to do this. Um, they also, state parks portion of this is that they keep some other parking areas up there open for snowmobile access as well. And so when you go to the funding portion of it, they, they chip in their fair share of the cost uh, for the total operation uh, for that. And then we pay them, we reimburse them for the access to the fishing uh, fishing lot, if you will. Um, there's a couple of the changes that have, that have happened up there is that uh, some of you may have heard that during this past winter, um, the Phillips Marina has started charging people to park at the marina to help offset some of their costs for plowing at the marina. Uh, so with that, uh, we don't have to help 
uh, with that portion, or at least with that parking lot, uh, keeping that open. Um, there was also a parking lot over on Soldier Creek that was uh, on private land that was closed off to public access this year. Um, without getting into the details, which are still very much up in the air, we are working on a solution for that in the near future where um, hopefully we can secure uh, some parking over there on Soldier Creek side again for this upcoming winter. Um, so we are definitely working on that. Um, again, you know, as, as far as going through some of the checklist items, you know, this is definitely a, um, a focus water for Blue Ribbon, one of the highest used bodies of water in the state, particularly during the winter time. Um, and we're really getting a, a real good bargain for how much we're spending up there and maintaining these, these access points during the winter time. And, uh, uh, as far as that goes, I'll, I'll field any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Alan. Go ahead with any questions. <clears throat> okay, uh, I don't hear any questions. So let's, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Uh, Chicken Creek East Boat Ramp. All right, um, this one may take a few more minutes uh, to go through. Uh, we, we did go through this with you guys. I know last year um, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot from them from, from that point when we talked about it last year, uh, but we do have some new updated numbers and the Forest Service engineers have gone through the project and have updated some of the engineering drawings which are available on the WRI page. Uh, so you can go through and look at the drawings. Um, but just to give you a quick rundown of what the, the proposal is here, we up on the north end of Strawberry Reservoir over in Chicken Creek East, we have a small parking lot. And actually, if you can go to the, the image that shows the entire overview um, of the project there, I think it's titled Lot Locations on the images. Um, okay, so the, the red portion there is where the new parking lot and boat ramp would be located. Uh, and the two yellow dots there indicate two smaller parking lots that uh, would be decommissioned after this new parking lot and boat ramp was, was uh, finished. Uh, the Forest Service didn't want to increase the footprint up there, but we want to make it more usable. Uh, the two yellow dots, the old parking areas, were located very, you know, a long ways away from the reservoir, uh, which makes it difficult to launch any kind of craft, hand launch craft or anything else, because you have to walk several hundred yards. Uh, also, uh, in the wintertime, you have to trudge through three, four feet of snow to get to the water. Um, so by developing this new parking lot with the boat launch uh, at the parking area, we would be able to accommodate the public a lot better and get people out on the reservoir easier, uh, both in the summertime with boats, with small watercraft, with, with uh, you know, float tubes and things like that. Um, and in the wintertime as well, for the ice anglers, uh, it would be a better, larger parking area that would be, we'd be able to plow a lot easier um, and provide better access for ice anglers as well in the wintertime. Um, I have talked to state parks about this, and they are definitely on board with helping us uh, maintain that during the winter time with the snow plowing operations as well. Um, there will be some uh, benefit also to habitat and to the fish populations up there with this project. If you'll go back to that overview shot or the picture showing the lot locations, um, you will see that there is a tributary. Well, it's difficult to see but there is a tributary that runs down through near that parking lot, but there are a lot of problems with that uh, tributary. Yes, it's exactly where it is, where he's pointing now. Um, the tributary itself has been channelized. Uh, this is the actual Chicken Creek West uh, tributary, and it's been channelized in the past when it went under the highway, and there were a lot of problems that that created, and now we have multiple channels after it comes out under the highway that spread out and kind of disperse that flow over uh, through three different channels out there. Uh, what we would intend to do with this project is we would do some uh, habitat restoration and rehabilitation of that stream channel to put it into a single channel 
and to be able to get that water to flow um, through through one channel, which would be better access for the fish, for the spawning fish uh, as they're going up to spawn the cutthroat and the kokanee possibly. Um, and you can see on this this image here that he just brought up, you'll see that there are several different channels where that that water splits off and does not create a good pathway for spawning fish. Um, so there, there is a definitely a habitat and population uh, benefit with this project as well. Um, that's a small portion of the cost and, and it's really absorbed in a lot of the other operations or the contractual services as well. Um, but the main goal of this is obviously to provide access uh, on that north end of the reservoir for the public. Um, it's safer, it's in an enclosed bay which is good for smaller watercraft, kick boats, float tubes, things like that, because it's more protected from the wind <clears throat> up on that North shore in that, in that bay. Um, so it's a great location. It's immediately off of Highway 40. Um, it's going to see a lot of use. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, as far as the, the money aspect of this, uh, if we go to the, the finance page there, it, it's yeah, I've got it all broken up there as far as you know where the money will be spent. Uh, what we're asking for uh, right now is about um, let's see, twenty-five thousand, just over twenty-five thousand dollars from both Blue Ribbon and the Habitat Council uh, to to come up with a match so that we can secure the motor boat access funds. The total project cost is eight hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. Um, we do have a hundred thousand dollars that we were secured last year from the um, Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation, and that grant has to be used before May of 2021. So realistically, we only have this summer and this fall to get this project done, or we lose that grant of one hundred thousand um, dollars. So if I do not get the the additional match funding, the non-federal match here, uh, I cannot access that that federal motorboat access money, which I've been told that there is enough of that left. It's just a matter of coming up with a 25% match. Um, as far as partners uh, in this project, I've got, uh, I think, six or seven different partners. Um, as many of those are actually contributing money as well as in-kind services, uh, the Strawberry Anglers Association, uh, Utah County Alpine Anglers, uh, High Country Fly Fishers, Friends of Strawberry Valley, the Utah Council of Trout Unlimited, and then we also have the uh, Wasatch County has contributed about $64,000 worth of services of their, their road crews to come in and help with this project as well to help meet some of that match. Um, and so, and then of course the Forest Service is partnering very closely with us and done the engineering and the NEPA and all of that work is completed so that this, this project can be ready to go. Um, so we've got a lot of partners, a lot of people interested in seeing this happen. Uh, they definitely want to see this happen. And uh, and with that, I can't think of anything else off my head. So if anybody has any questions, I'll answer them. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Alan, this is Rex Infanger. Um, would the with the stream restoration there being as close as it is to Trout Creek, would you expect the gravel and stuff to be very similar to Trout Creek? So we'd expect fairly high recruitment. I know uh, a fry recruitment is just tremendous on Trout Creek. So are you kind of expecting that same kind of results once we can get all these little streams all together and 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 so that would be uh, not only better access but would are you expecting it to be pretty good recruitment for the fry yes that's a good question uh, it's probably not as uh, you probably can't compare it as well to trout creek as you can to uh, another stream right over near there um, the, right over by Chicken Creek West rather than Chicken Creek East. Uh, but, but we do see, just to give you an idea, up Chicken Creek West, uh, we see 150, 200 large spawning fish going up in a very small tributary, very similar to this one, 
and and that's at a single time. You know, obviously there's more that come through throughout the season, but on one count alone, I can count as many as 200 or more of these large spawning cutthroat up in that stream. So I would definitely expect that we would see something very similar to that. Uh, as far as the gravels, it's not quite what Trout Creek is. We have a little bit better flow, a little more consistent flow out of Trout Creek, but this does have a pretty good flow in the springtime. So for the cutthroat, I think we would see really good spawning potential out there for the, for the kokanee, it might be a little more iffy just because of variability in the late summer flows you know, during the fall. Great, thank you, Alan. Are there any other questions about this project currently? Fantastic, uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, thank you, Central Region folks, for being on with us um, for these projects. Uh, we're gonna move on uh, to our Southeastern Region projects um, for this combined meeting. Um, I want to welcome any of our Southeast Region folks that are on with us. And uh, we're going to move to Project 5283, uh, Huntington Creek Restoration Phase 1. Turn it to you. This is uh, Calvin Black with the division here in Price. Um, I guess I will be presenting this project to you guys today. Uh, Daniel, if you don't mind, maybe go into to the images and document and pull up the map. Yeah, well, we'll just start with that first image for right now. So, um, so I am listed as the project manager, but we have a lot of collaborators here in our, uh, um, in our region and uh, a lot of partners on this project. Um, so I, I might be listed here, but everybody is working together. Um, Hi, Calvin, can I interrupt you for just one second? Sure. Uh, I just want to make sure your, your, your audio is kind of Kind of drifting in and out, so make sure you're you're sitting close to your mic and and uh, and staying close to that, so that we can hear you really well. All right, can you hear me a little better now? Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. Okay, um, and so uh, we have a lot of collaborators and partners on this project, and uh, I just want to, you know, um, let everybody know who else is kind of helping on this uh, this project this year. Dan Keller, who's our native fish biologist, uh, who's done a lot of work. Um, work on this project. Cole Nielsen, our restoration biologist, and Jordan Nielsen with Trout Unlimited are all collaborators. And basically, all four of us are project managers with this project. Um, this Huntington Creek restoration phase one is in response to the 2012 Sealy fire in Huntington Canyon. Um, shortly after the fire, we had major rain events and debris flows that um, came through the king and really gutted the stream, the main stem, and then several of the, the forks of Huntington Creek. Um, over the last few years, there's been some work done and seeding on the upland and the hill slopes um, through the canyon, and we finally feel like they have rehabbed enough where we can install structures in the stream channel um, that won't get blown out by any type of debris events. And so um, that's why we're now proposing this large scale project in Huntington Canyon. We have several goals, uh, objectives for this project. Uh, one is to improve fish habitat near access points along State Route 31, increase distribution of fish throughout Huntington Creek, decrease erosion at strategic locations, improve riparian vegetation, increase recreation in Huntington Canyon, and rehabilitate stream function in Nuckwoodward post the Sealy Fire. So, uh, this first uh, photo you can see is of uh, um, our first site. We have four locations, uh, Little Bear Canyon, Little Bear Campground, which are on the main stem of Huntington Creek. Uh, we have Left Fork uh, of Huntington Creek and then Nuck Woodward. So as you can see, we're, we've got proposals of large scale um, um, bank stabilization, um, cross, be cross veins, W weirs um, for Great control structures. Um, you can all see some J hooks and sections of the streams where our long runs where we can't really uh, put any hard structures in. We're going to put boulder clusters in um, to kind of have like a pocket fishing uh, for anglers. Um, put some big pool or big deep or big large boulders to help um, break up the water and create some more habitat. So 
Um, each one of these locations are areas where um, we have great access. Um, they were originally great um, fisheries uh, or a section of the river that was a great fishery and very popular, um, but they're not rehabbing on their own and they need our help. And so um, as Daniel goes through some of these pictures, you can see um, some of the great control that need to, needs to be done, some of the banks that are eroded away. Um, so our idea is to go in, um, secure these banks, but also create fish habitat while we're at it. Um, we have populations of both cutthroat trout, Colorado River cutthroat and brown trout above and below all these locations. So if we can provide the habitat or better habitat, um, we're gonna see an increase in our populations through these stretch of river um, in all these sections. Um, on uh, the left fork of Huntington, uh, we'll be working from the trailhead all the way down to the confluence of the right fork. And in Nuck Woodward, unfortunately I don't have a map of it, uh, we'll be looking at installing 50 to 75 BDAs in the lower mile and a half of um, Nuck Woodward. Um, Nuck Woodward historically had a core population of Colorado River cutthroat trout. And because of the fire and the debris events following, uh, we lost that population. And so to start working to um, get that um, population back, we need to uh, do some habitat work in that section of the mile and a half. Um, so a lot of our work um, that we're proposing is uh, installation of these structures. You can see our costs here, um, motor pool and equipment and materials. All the work will be done in-house with our uh, equipment operators in our region. Um, this is kind of a neat project for us because uh, myself, Dan Keller, and Jordan Nielsen have all went through the all four levels of Rosgen training. Nicole, I think, is on her level three with Rosgen training. So we've been through all those processes, have learned how to do these projects, and have implemented them as the manager, but we haven't got to play with the equipment and actually construct these structures on our own. And this is kind of uh, a neat thing for us with this project is um, with Dan being a heavy equipment operator, we can actually put these uh, structures in and all these processes that we've learned and put them into to use and, and do it ourselves here um, on Huntington Creek. Um, so we're looking at, uh, I think 14,500 for each um, Habitat Councils and Blue Ribbon Council, and then uh, 29,000 for the DNR uh, fire rehab. So, um, any questions about the project? Cal, this is Bert Lay. I have a question regarding funding. I don't see the Forest Service listed among the partners here. Do you have any comments on that? So they are a partner, and we um, just kind of a hindsight, they're not. Um, contributing any funding, but they're doing the NEPA for us. And they are also have told us any deadfall or any uh, burnt trees within the project sites or rock, go ahead and use. And so they've been given us to go ahead to use any type of, um, you know, material that we need there on the forest. Uh, higher up in the canyon on Huntington, on the right fork of Huntington, uh, there was a, a, a big uh, avalanche two years ago and uh, we can haul all the trees we want for days on end to use for our, our, our um, structures. So uh, they are a partner. Um, I should also mention Emory County uh, will be providing rock and trees also um, as a partner, as in-kind costs. Uh, Jordan with TU uh, has got, will be helping out with some in-kind costs. And then Pacific Corps, uh, they also aren't listed, but they provide funding to the division to do monitoring of the right fork and main stem of Huntington King. And so they're providing funding also uh, to monitor the population before and after uh, this, this project. Thank you. I also have a follow-up regarding uh, long-term. Are you looking to continue to do projects like this for several years into the future, recognizing there was so much damage that you might need uh, restoration in several locations? Uh, up, up above. Yes, we, we are looking at other phases. Uh, this is going to be probably the largest um, because of how 
difficult it is to get into the river from the highway with heavy equipment, our locations right now are our easiest access, you know, it's easiest accessible um, locations. Um, in the future, you know, potentially next year, we'd like to move higher up into the drainage in Nutwood Woodward and in the right fork where we'd have, you know, could use smaller equipment. Um, but for now, um, the, 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 these locations on the main stem and left fork are where, you know, we can get the big equipment in to do a large scale project. And we're looking at a time frame of about a month being in there. All right, thank you. Kevin, this is Paul Burnett. Um, you know, and looking at some of the images up here, it looks like some of these areas are um, are really ripe for an opportunity to use some uh, more um, some innovative types of uh, structures like the pals and um, and things like that. Have you given any thought to some of the more dynamic type um, restoration approaches uh, up in this area? We have, and, and you know, the structures that we've put on the map are, you know, kind of our first phase of maybe this, you know, this is what we'd like to do. And these are the structures that we know we can build, but, you know, throughout this planning phase this summer and, and before implementation, yeah, we'd be, you know, looking at other options with as much um, trees and everything else we've got coming in. Um, you know, Jordan has some other ideas also, and, and I, Jordan is welcome to chime in if he has any other thoughts, but, uh, but yeah, we are open to, you know, changing some of our structures, you know, to, to try something different. Yeah, this is, this is Jordan Paul. Um, some of the areas uh, where we're working, there's probably too much flow for us to be able to, to really effectively use PALS. They'd, they'd, we'd lose them pretty quickly. Um, plus uh, debris flow is a problem in the basin. I mean, UDOT went in and built a whole bunch of debris basins to control uh, all of that stuff coming down. So anything that we put in needs to be able to stay in place for, for quite some time. So we're, we're gonna have to take a careful assessment of what we can do with non-permanent structures like PALs and BDAs. And you guys think even with debris flow that J hooks and cross veins are gonna stay in place? I big rocks, we, really big rocks. Yeah, I think we can anchor them in pretty well. And in, in these areas, I think they're you know, secured enough that we could get these uh, um, structures in and without any blowouts. You have okay, a good point, though, Paul. So oh, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, we you, Paul has a good point, and uh, and we're considering all structure options. We've just walked through this and and kind of mapped out where we think different types of structures will work immediately. So, and uh, and as Calvin said, this is kind of a, a first look, a first pass at this. So, uh, hopefully, we'll be doing future phases as well. Great, thank you. We'll take one more comment if there is. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Calvin. Um, so we have one more project uh, for our Southeast region and, and I'm not sure Calvin if that's you as well. Um, but we will after this uh, next uh, presentation, we're going to take a five minute break. So just want to let you know, that's kind of the plan. Uh, so yeah, let's move to 5289 Joe's Valley voter access. And yes, I will be presenting this again. Thank you, uh, Calvin. So the uh, project manager for this is Chris uh, Nichols. He is a biologist with the uh, Manti LaSalle National Forest. Um, Daniel, if you could go to the images, um, I think you provided a small uh, PowerPoint um, that Joe's Valley, very first thing. Um, and if it's too much to pull up, that's fine. Um, let me give a little background about this project. So starting in about 2017, uh, the DWR, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Emory County, and um, Emory Water Conservancy District, and UDOT uh, all met together on ways to improve voter access, um, you know, at Joe's Valley on uh, along Highway 29, um, the, the new or the existing uh, 
um, boat, uh, boat, um, boat ramp. And uh, they came up with a, a, a plan and a lot of funding came through uh, motorboat access um, in 2017 and 2018. And, uh, and we started this project up there um, and was part of this. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide if you can, Daniel. Thank you. Um, there was a list of items that we had identified to, to fund and to construct in uh, with this first phase. And as you can see, we had um, expand the boat trailer parking area. Um, we had install a wash pad and drain field, um, install a boat launch extension. So we extended the uh, boat ramp. Um, we were gonna replace a, a, an aging uh, vault toilet and then purchase a new one on top of that and install in another parking lot and expand a, the fisherman parking area, they call it the fisherman parking lot and then uh, replace the boat dock. Um, and uh, over the course of engineering and um, some other items popping up, um, we had to install an oil and debris collector at the bottom of this parking area. Um, we didn't have enough funding to fully fund all of these items. And so Chris with the forest uh, helped with the NEPA uh, document to um, do all this work up there. And they wanted to see the remaining items um, funded and, and installed while we're still up there working on the, the boat uh, launch parking area. And so if you can actually go back to the first picture, Dan. Thank you. Oh, oh that one right there. Uh, you, in the kind of the right side of the picture, you can see the existing parking lot and you can see the red extension, big portion. That parking lot has been expanded and we're waiting to um, install and lay asphalt this spring as soon as it warms up enough. Uh, an AIS lane was installed, uh, that's that little finger to the left, um, with a wash pad and a drain system to collect any type of debris or um, and mussels or anything like that that could potentially come off a, a boat um, while being cleaned. The boat ramp was expanded, or extended 50 feet uh, into the reservoir. And so what we're asking for, what the forest is uh, asking for is to help um, finish this project up and putting a boat dock uh, along that boat ramp. And if you notice to the far, far left, there's that parking area, that red area square, um, replace a toilet there and expand that parking lot. Um, so if you can thumb through a couple of pages, Dan. Uh, go ahead and keep going. Yeah, you can find, go all the way through this one. Um, this was put by Chris and I wasn't completely sure what he was doing there. Uh, so what we're asking for is uh, $25,000 for a boat ramp to construct and to um, be placed there um, next to the new ramp, um, a, a, a single vault toilet at the Fisherman Angler parking area and then a little extra money to bring in some uh, road base. Uh, to put down uh, before they put some other crushed rock on the parking area, the new parking area. Um, right now we um, have an in-kind uh, contribution of almost $600,000 for the other portion of the projects. Um, as part of the forest um, in-kind costs, they will be constructing at the parking area there on the fisherman parking lot on their own. Uh, that was a kind of a, a, a match uh, for this project. So that parking area will be expanded. They're just asking money for the, the restroom there. Uh, next slide. Uh, one more. Uh, you can see the, uh, our, the current boat dock. Um, it can't be weighted down. And anytime the wind blows, it blows back and forth and, and uh, uh, covers the, the ramp and it's difficult uh, to keep it in place. Next slide. Um, and this is the style of a dock that uh, um, they are looking to install. This is a picture of the big sand wash uh, um, boat dock that Natalie had built. And uh, they're looking at this because it'll be a little easier to haul up and down the ramp with the fluctuation of water levels. And uh, will be a little more secure because it'll be on the ground and not floating uh, like the current one. And then one more slide. 
Um, you can see the uh, fisherman's parking area. This is going to include a little extra parking for boat trailers, but also um, an area for parking for more hand launch uh, access for that north end of the, the reservoir. Uh, one more slide. Um, go ahead and hit one more time. I think there's some pictures here. There we go. Thank you. Uh, you see this toilet is uh, outdated. Um, I can tell you for a fact the door doesn't close and lock. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is the restroom that they would like to um, um, remove and install a new uh, vault toilet. So um, with that, I don't have anything else. If you guys have any questions. Cal, this is Bert Lay again. I just had a question about the fisherman's parking expansion, which you just showed. You mentioned hand launch. Uh, is that reasonable? Is there access to the water that one could uh, drag a kayak or a pontoon boat down? Yes. So uh, in that picture on top right there, you see the end of the parking lot with the cottonwoods. There are several trails from the parking lot down to the water's edge, and you're talking about 50 to 100 yards. Um, also, as part of the phase one project off of the boat launch parking area, uh, there's been two new gravel kind of walkways off of that parking lot down to the water's edge away from the boat uh, ramp. That way, uh, people can walk down to the shoreline a little easier and be out of the way of the, the vehicles. All right, thank you. Thank you, Calvin. Are there any other questions about this project? Great, thank you for the presentations on these. Um, with that, we're gonna take a five minute break and then jump back on. So I wanna thank everybody from uh, Southern, Central, and South, Southeast region for their presentations. We're going on a five minute break. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna give folks two more minutes to, to jump back on and then we will we will get back going again. Two more minutes. Okay, everybody, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started again here. Um, before we jump into our, our Northern Region projects uh, for the combined portion of the meeting, um, I just wanna ask if there are any issues with audio, video, with the process. I, I think it's going well so far. Um, but if there are any comments really quick about, about how we're moving ahead, uh, I, I wanna know that now if we need to change anything. Okay, great. Well, we're going to move ahead. Um, I think uh, what I'm seeing that when we do have competing comments on on projects, I'm kind of kind of watching to see who those are, and I'll probably call out an order of of kind of who's in line to to make their comment as, as we go along. And so, uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and move to our northern region projects. Uh, Want to welcome any of our northern region staff that are on with us. Um, and so we do have 11 more projects to go through at the combined portion of our meeting. So uh, we're gonna wanna kind of keep these moving along, um, but we're gonna start with uh, project number 4114, Lower Dal Dalton Creek Culvert Fish Passage. Uh, I'm not sure who's up for presentation, but go ahead. Well, I don't know if Paul was gonna do it or if he was gonna want me to, but I certainly can. Okay, well, looks like you're not not hearing any objections. I guess <laughs> I'll uh, take it from here. Um, this project isn't really anything new to most of you who have been on the council for some time. Uh, it's been submitted numerous times, uh, but I think right now uh, was a, would be a good time to <clears throat> to actually run with it since uh, the design has been completed uh, through the pretty much the hard work of Paul and uh, Weber Basin, who he's partnered with. Uh, they have pretty graciously uh, come up with a, a design that we think will work as a, as a complete fish passage instead of a complete fish barrier, which is there now. So Weber Basin has been a wonderful partner with this and they, like I said, fully funded the design. Uh, Paul's been doing the lion's share of the administrative work, trying to to keep all the ducks in a row on this one. And hopefully, you know, we can come in and just pony up some money for just materials. Now, all we're looking for is the uh, the kind of squashed culvert that we can lay in the bottom and and make sure that this. This uh, barrier is no longer a barrier, but a passage for the cutthroat, that fluvial population of cutthroat in the Weaver. Um, if I forget anything, my apologies up front for, uh, to Paul. Uh, he's, he's done a lot of work on this and 
we'd be changing this from just a, a round 60 inch culvert that's got a four to five foot vertical drop to a 120 inch squash culvert with a natural bottom. And then we would step up uh, grade control structures and create, oh, three or four additional pools and resting areas prior to the fish having to access the culvert so that, that they will have uh, complete access uh, at least in the spring when they need to get up there for spawning. Um, one of the things we have seen anecdotally is through uh, previous connection efforts, we're starting to see more cutthroats of the larger variety that fluvial population of adults caught in this section of the Weber than we ever have before. Now, bear in mind that the aquatic section hasn't had the opportunity to go through and do a full population estimate, so we can't scientifically say there's more, uh, but just more reports of them and more, you know, the phone call index sort of indicates that, that this has been a success and we'd like to keep moving forward with it. Really, all we're asking for is about $18,000 split between the councils for this, just for the culvert. Uh, Weaver Basin again is going to pony up the money in in kind for the the install and the uh, step pools we'll need as grade control control structures on the downstream side. Great, thank you, Sorno. Any questions about this project? This is Bert Lay. Just curious about the length of the stream above the culvert. How much spawning ground is there? Uh, this Creek is probably several miles. Yeah, there's oh, about yeah. two and a half miles. Of, um, yeah, there's about two and a half miles of spawning habitat upstream of uh, the Weaver, um, and uh, you know, in this reach of the Weaver, all these tiny tributaries are really important for spawning habitat for the for the fish in the main stem, which is why uh, we're uh, really pushing uh, this project. Um, this is complementary to four or five other projects we've done in this reach. And thank, thank you, Sorno, for, for delivering the presentation. Great job. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other questions about this project? Great. Thank you, Sorno. Uh, we're going to move on to project uh, 5227, uh, Weaver River Main Stem Reservoir Deepwater Habitat Augmentation. Oh, thought I was doing another one of Paul's. Okay, I'm out of order. Anyway, this one is a, it, it probably isn't going to be too unfamiliar to anybody who's who's seen these the last couple of years. Um, Chris Penny and I are pretty keen on these projects for stabilization of our perch populations. We've tried a little bit in Pineview. We're going to do, go ahead and do another one there, but this one would be for Rockport and Echo Reservoirs. We did a, a kind of a pi pilot project in Rockport last year, put some structures deep water. And the reason we're doing them deep, for those of you who aren't, haven't heard the spiel before, uh, is that we're finding a lot of evidence that the young of the year perch are actually using the hypoxic zones of these reservoirs. That, area where the dissolved oxygen is between probably two and a half and four milligrams per liter. They're using it as a refugia from predation where the bigger fish are finding a little bit hard time making a living in that low of dissolved oxygen concentration. The young ones seem to be doing just fine in it. And as a result, we can grow them up to just about the time they recruit, but then we have fall turnover and the predators there again have full access to their new, newly found all you can eat buffet. What we're gonna try and do here is add a significant number of artificial structures in the deep water so that the fish have some cover other than that chemocline. Uh, it's pretty easy to do, it's kind of intuitive. We just drop weighted structures of certain designs that's been approved by the Bureau of Reclamation into these areas that are anywhere from 40 to 90 feet deep, creating a, 
kind of a field of artificial trees or shrubs. And uh, then the, the young fish can use those as cover once their chemical cover is, is blown. Uh, it's pretty easy. We do just motor them out over a predetermined area that's been mapped, dump them in and sit there and wait. Now, have we seen a response yet? Not yet, because we've only been doing it for a year and a half. We do know that the fish are using them in places where they've previously been used. And we do know that the fish are inhabiting those areas before we get cover in. So, you know, it's again, it's kind of intuitive. We're, we're dumping structure into a reservoir. Uh, it's going to help the fish population. Ultimately, ultimately it's going to help angling, especially if we can stop this boom and bust of the, the perch in particular, where we have this one dominant year class that just eats all their progeny until they finally wink out of the system. And then we wait four or five more years before we get catchable sized fish from that last spawn. Most of this is just in purchasing the structures, a uh, little bit in the, the um, ferrying them out and uh, some of the flagging materials and things like that. Uh, we do a little, have a, are asking a little bit out of Blue Ribbon for this one because Rockport has traditionally been a candidate. Uh, if we can get over this hump of this boom and bust with a perch and make it more consistent, we feel that quite possibly Rockport could become a full-fledged Blue Ribbon. Uh, we're not asking as much out of Blue Ribbon for that reason. And we're hoping that because Echo is a new state park, uh, greater access, much more pressure than it's ever had, particularly through the ice, uh, that we can, we can uh, use a lion's share of structures there too. So it's, it's just, we, we basically did it as unnamed reservoirs and called it the, the Weber main stem. Uh, and just in case that we get some pushback from the Bureau or Weaver Basin so that they're saying we, we can't put them in one or the other, we wouldn't be dead in the water. Great, great. Any questions? So now what's the process of getting approval from um, the Bureau of Reclamation or Weber Basin on installing this, this, this is Paul Burnett, sorry. Uh, the process is basically uh, informing them and asking permission out of the Bureau. We do have an MOU with them that allows for this. We just have to verify that we're only using the structures which were specifically outlined in the MOU so that they have some level of comfort that these things won't end up in their outlet works and become an O&M problem. Just a quick question, Sorno. This is Bert Lay. Uh, how do you propose to monitor and see if these are actually making a difference in the future? Long term, it's going to be probably uh, just looking at the fish assemblage. If we start seeing a more big air quotes, normal distribution of fish where you have lots of younger ones and fewer of the, the older fish as you march through the year classes, uh, mimicking a natural system, I think that would be an indicator that they are working. If we continue to see this one dominant year class march through time, then we'll probably, you know, give up after a while. If we think we've got a, enough of a critical mass down there that it should have made a difference and it's not, we'll discontinue it. But <clears throat> I think that's the long-term uh, real telltale. In the interim, we're, we're also um, mapping them and, and uh, looking in detail with sonar to find out if the fish are actually using them. We're also dropping cameras down there and, and seeing that the fish are physically in the structures. And so far in Pineview and Rockport, they are. Um, whether it's gonna make a long-term difference, we can't really tell yet without waiting a, a, you know, at least a couple more years to find out that we've not only recruited, but the fish are, are continuing to survive and grow. 
All right. Following up, is there a role for angler uh, perception and creel surveys through the ice, particularly? Oh, I'm sure there would be, but I'm. I don't have a, a spot on the organizational chart high enough to say you need to do creel surveys on these. Fair enough. Okay, any additional questions on this project for Sarno? Okay, um, seeing none, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next project, uh, project 5263, uh, Lower Logan Conservation Easement. Who's up? I'm guessing that one's me too. Way to go, Sorno. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna hear a lot of me in the next six or seven. Okay, uh, we'll keep trucking. <laughs> um, this was a project that was basically initiated uh, through the, the Logan River Task Force. Um, Frank Howell and I put this one together for the most part with a little bit of help from Jim Dorito. And what we are proposing to do is augment the purchase price of a 73 acre uh, conservation easement on the lower Logan River that was identified by the Logan River Task Force as something that we really want to do. In the meantime, we have had Logan City jump on board with providing vastly more money in grants and, uh, <clears throat> and other <laughs> in kind, uh, well, not, not so much in kind, but mostly grant monies that are being chased by them for recreation type grants. And it looks like we've got amassed about $1.1 million in grant monies through Leray McAllister, the Logan River Task Force contribution, um, and all we're asking for out of Blue Ribbon and um, Habitat Council is about $87,000 for the purchase of this easement. <clears throat> this one's pretty important uh, for the task force and it would be kind of a, a keystone block to get some of the uh, areas in the middle have already been addressed through uh, habitat improvement, channel restructuring, but this one would be actually keeping houses from being built down in that floodplain area and in the riparian, because it is kind of developable, um, depending on your point of view. I personally would never build a house there, but that hasn't stopped many developers before. Uh, it is 73 acres. There's a little bit over a mile of river that would be open to public access. And the reason we're asking for just a small share of Blue Ribbon is because one of the goals of the Ro Logan River Task Force is to alter the status of the Logan River, much like the Ogden River Project did for that river corridor to attain at least a portion of it in Blue Ribbon status. It's got wonderful public access. It's got pretty good water um, flows down there. The quality could use a little bit of improving, but we're hoping that with some channel improvements and some buffers that that will happen. And they're looking at everything from water exchanges to diversion uh, retrofits to use less water. Um, this one is, it's got lots of zeros in the price tag. Fortunately, most of them aren't ours it would really benefit the community, the anglers, and the fish populations uh, in this reach. So I'm, um, I don't have a lot more to add, but I'd be happy to answer any questions on things that I may have kind of blown by quickly. So no, this is Paul Burnett. Um, What's the probability of getting the Leroy McAllister funding? I believe it's already been awarded. Oh, really? Oh, great. Okay. 
Sorno, this is Bert again. I see in the future management quite a list of avian species that might benefit from this. I don't see a list of what uh, uh, fish species are present currently and what you expect this might do for the fishery. Right now, it's it's pretty limited because the water is, is warmed. It's not shaded well. Uh, and it's got some pretty dramatic impacts from grazing and other land use practices. There's some brown trout there. Um, and then any of the, the non-sport fish you might find in Cutler are, are, you know, colonizing some of those areas. There's a few channel cats, but we, we ex expect with an increase in water quality and a lowering of the temperature that we'll start to see more of the fish that we see further up through town in the Logan, uh, a few cutthroats, but mostly uh, browns and some white fish. So we would expect those to colonize downstream as the water quality and quantity comes into a better condition. Frank put a lot of this together. That's why, the, that's why it's heavy on the avian because he was down there doing a lot of, of surveys that way. But, you know, we can't just tap Chris Penny and his crew on the shoulder and tell them to go down there and find out what's there. So a lot of this is presumptive. A lot of it's based on historic uh, fish surveys. Nothing really, really recent. Hey, Sarno, I might add to that. This is Jim Dorito with Trout Unlimited. Got to respond to Bert. Um, TU and DWR did an angler creel survey on this stretch of the river last year uh, that basically ended about the downstream end similar to this project area. Um, we did find primarily 95% of the catch was brown trout. Uh, that does correspond well to Utah State University's monitoring they did down there 2001 to 2008, where they're finding anywhere from about 1,000 to 4,000 brown trout per mile, averaging about 3,000 browns per mile. And so it is a, a pretty robust brown trout fishery. Uh, when you do add water, I think giving the access to this area and improving habitat, uh, I think we'll greatly see angler access along this stretch of the river uh, with this purchase and, uh, and some of the access facilities that are planned on it. Thanks, Jim. All right, thank you, Jim. Great. Are there, any, are there any other questions about this project? All right. Thank you, Sorno. We're going to move on to the next one. Um, 5265, uh, near ramp. Um, Central Arcade. Thank you. Central Arcade Habitat Enhancement. <laughs> Appreciate the help there. <laughs> Uh, um, this is this is another one that uh, was was brought to my attention primarily from Chris Penny, who still reads technical journals in his spare time, apparently. But uh, he's find he found a paper that showed uh, really pretty good evidence that uh, centrarchids, primarily in a, in this case, would be bluegills. Uh, are doing a pretty admirable job in eating villagers and even in some cases the adults of quagga mussels when they're first introduced. Now, that being said, we have not yet seen an introduction into Willard. So this would be more of a preemptive strike to try and provide some habitat really close to the boat ramps at Willard Bay Reservoir so that anything that does get through the gauntlet of inspections and somehow gets introduced into these marina areas would also now have to go through a gauntlet of bluegill models. So if we can enhance the, the habitat for them, it, it would not only immediately benefit uh, angling, but it would have a possible uh, prophylactic effect on having an introduction of the Dracenid mussels into Willard Bay. 
the proposal is just to put a much like the deep water habitat, only this is obviously gonna be shallow water habitat, some artificial structures in these areas so that bluegills are gonna find it more uh, comfortable to live in at higher densities. Uh, we will be targeting both, both marinas adjacent to the boat ramp areas and throughout the marinas where the parks personnel feel comfortable of, of kind of throwing a bunch of stuff in. Um, they, they tend to be a little bit uncomfortable with the mess that uh, fish habitat is, at least good fish habitat is. And they like things a little more tidy. Um, my job is to convince them that uh, tidy is not good when it comes to preventing uh, a mussel invasion. And this one is just primarily, again, the, the, uh, the budget is mostly purchase of artificial structures. Uh, the, because of the fluctuation of the reservoir, natural vegetation doesn't seem to work real well. It doesn't persist as long. So we're gonna go with the artificials. Okay, any questions? Um, so I know this is Paul Burnett. Um, just a question: Can you describe what the artificial structures look like, and is the permitting process the same as the deep water habitat? Yeah, just a second. A visual is good. Something like these. Uh, we'll probably have a little bit larger ones, but they are primarily made of an anchor with some sort of bush uh, type thing. This one happens to be re recycled vinyl siding, um, but we can also use this the real similar ones to the ones we used in, in Pine View and the ones we're planning on using in Rockport and Echo. Uh, moss back structures, the, the safe havens have been good, the root wads, um, the Palm King shrubs and trees are really pretty good. So uh, any of those, they deploy nicely, they last a long time, and permitting is going to be virtually the same as with the other reservoirs. Okay, thanks for the visual, Sorno. Any, any other questions on the project? All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next next one. Uh, project fifty two eighty four, uh, Bear Lake Tributaries Restoration. This is Jim Dorito. I can cover this one. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, maybe we can go to the map, Daniel. So this is a partnership project between Toronto Limited, DWR, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, and some of the local water rights holders in this area. If you can zoom in just a little bit. Uh, two tributaries to Bear Lake, uh, maybe zoom back out, sorry, on the south end um, of Bear Lake, make that out. Uh, Lake Town Creek is on the south, near the town of Lake Town there in Round Valley. Uh, that's where the Bureau of Land Management ground is that we'll be addressing there. And if you kind of go to the north there, Daniel, or zoom out a little bit, uh, also including North Eden Creek, uh, right up there by the Idaho border. And then the ground in between is the upland portion of this project that'll be addressed as, some, as far as some of the uh, pinion juniper and upland treatments to uh, remove those conifers from sagebrush habitat. And that's the forestry fire and state lands. Maybe you can go to the photos, Daniel, please. So on Lake Trown Creek, uh, the proposal is to address uh, three uh, crossings of Lake Town Creek. Uh, this sideways picture is shown with a uh, UTV on the other side of the creek looking up the creek. Uh, that's Scott Tolentino in the picture on the left, the Bear Lake biologist. Uh, they got up there with the Bureau of Land Management. All three Ford crossings are pretty similar to this uh, in that they're very over widened. And uh, maybe go back to the next one. That's kind of looking downstream, I think, from that crossing. But all three are, are very wide and shallow, but they're in high flows. The water actually runs down the UTV road and creates a lot of erosion and sediment. So the proposal is to do the survey design assessment work 
and come up with some uh, solutions basically address these three crossings on Lake Town Creek. Most likely, given that you can see these are very broad and wide, we're probably looking at hardened fords, kind of narrow up the creek, but improve the approach on both sides of the, uh, the creek while the road crossing. So we can eliminate the, uh, the erosion and sedimentation and also the water running down the, uh, the trail itself and maybe improve local habitat. If you go to the next photo, Daniel, I think again, this is looking downstream from that same crossing. You can see how narrow the creek should be if it wasn't, you know, had a ford across it, uh, like shown in the previous picture. So again, the, the uh, idea on all three of these is to fully address them with construction uh, as part of this uh, proposal. You go to the next photo, Daniel. So this is going up to North Eden Creek. This is actually looking up uh, the valley on North Eden from near the mouth. You can see the creek itself. What is a, a channel there is pretty much a straightened ditch between the uh, fence line shown on the left and the road on the right. Uh, this is across an alluvial fan where they do irrigate quite a bit. You can see the green fields there on the left beyond the fence line there. Uh, they irrigate about 150 acres on this alluvial fan uh, to Bear Lake. Of course, the stream has been straightened and channelized through here. And the, the uh, proposal is to address about a half mile of the straightened stream to re-meander and prove habitat uh, for those fish coming up out of Bear Lake, these uh, migratory cutthroat trout. Go to the next picture, Daniel. And this is the, uh, the culvert under the East Lake Road. Uh, it's a full fish passage barrier. You can see it's about a four foot jump there for fish to even try to get up into the culvert. So it is a full fish passage barrier to the remaining uh, almost nine miles of North Eden Creek. There is no use of migratory cuts and probably little to none below this um, because of the habitat and then this fish passage problem here. You can go to the next one, Daniel. And this is really the, the crux of what we have to address to make this all work. And so this is looking downstream last March at the irrigation diversion on North Eden Creek. Um, this is before they're actually taking water, but basically they get up there, take a bulldozer in every year and turn water into kind of see some, some uh, screening and some posts and other things there on the, the right bank. That's where water goes into a pipe that delivers water down to that alluvial fan and that irrigated acreage down there. So this basically dewaters the stream almost entirely during a good part of the irrigation season for about a mile and a half from this point down to Bear Lake itself. And so we actually had the water rights holders approach us and, and see if we can come up with some ideas about addressing the, uh, the road crossing I just showed to you. We said, well, we first want to actually take care of the water problem before we take care of the passage. And so that's really the two key features to come up with a alternative to deliver water to their irrigation system, maybe utilizing what they have there and rebuilding it, but also maybe looking at alternative sources of water. Uh, they do have an existing agriculture uh, well that could be improved, uh, maybe looking at some off-channel storage, possibly during high flows and then delivering it during the irrigation season, or looking at pumping water out of Bear Lake up to the acreage there, uh, to their pivots and such, or a combination of all three. And so the proposal is to hire an engineering firm to survey and assess the existing irrigation system and then come up with the best solutions to really address delivering water, not only for the agriculture, but we want perennial flow from this point down uh, all the way to Bear Lake. You go to the next photo. Uh, this is actually looking downstream on that same channel I stretched back towards Bear Lake. You can see some concrete slabs in there. Again, it's basically just a ditch for that half mile from the East Lake Road culvert all the way to Bear Lake. And this is what will come up with a uh, design as far as uh, stream restoration goes uh, to basically remeander, create habitat, create spawning habitat, and again, have the uh, perennial flow delivered down through there. Uh, so we can actually get the migratory cuts up in there, spawning, and then get recruitment back to Bear Lake. Uh, unless you know that Bear Lake is a blue ribbon fishery, a lot of similar work has been done on the other side of Bear Lake in terms of Swan, Fishhaven, and St. Charles Creeks. Uh, we've seen the wild cutthroat trout recruitment go from in the uh, late 1990s for about 10% uh, wild cutthroat compared to 90% hatchery uh, based on the netting that DWR does in the lake. It's well over 60% now uh, wild recruitment uh, as far as cutthroat trout uh, in Bear Lake. And so we're hoping that this really is the next big project, open up this 10 miles of stream, get migratory cutthroat spawning in it, and then ideally we're going to see even uh, enhanced uh, wild trout uh, recruitment back to Bear Lake. Next one, Daniel, photo. Uh, this is a look, just some of that uh, pinion juniper and other conifer encroachment. This is North Eden Creek above. 
uh, that diversion point that I showed you is kind of giving you a feel for the north facing hill slopes, where again, this used to be historically just sagebrush, now it's got trees on it. You can look up the valley to the left there as well. These are the areas that would be treated, uh, improving not only wildlife habitat, but we're hoping around some of these spring sources, maybe increase even the flows coming out of those springs uh, down to North Eden itself. This is an old reservoir site in the foreground. And so this is kind of a long-term project. If we can get perennial flows, reconnect the stream, improve fish passage again to 10 miles of stream, then there is quite a bit of habitat restoration work in the future. But again, uh, we're getting no recruitment now from this creek. Uh, it's got a ton of potential. So the next photo. Just another photo looking above the, uh, used to be an old upper reservoir. You can see some of the flows there. This is spring flow. So if you get fish above and spawning, there's lots of habitat, decent flows as far as base flows go. Uh, get them above that point of diversion, uh, a lot of habitat potential. There is a resident population of cutthroat as well as brook trout in this part of the stream. Next photo. That's back to Lake Town Creek. Maybe go to the finance section, Daniel. So the proposal is for uh, $35,000 from uh, WRI Habitat Council and Blue Ribbon Council, uh, total for Lake Town Creek, and then $35,000 for North Eden for the engineering firm, and then $12,000 for TU to kind of do the survey assessment work, coordinate construction, do the stream alteration permitting on Lake Town Creek, and then do the similar work as well as design work and uh, coordinate the engineering firm on uh, North Eden Creek. And that's what I got. Uh, I guess as far as the in-kind, uh, forest fire and state land is contributing all of the in-kind there. I see uh, the 28, where is that 20, almost 23,000 worth as far as their treatment of the uplands. And then the other uh, in-kind would be um, basically DWR, BLM, and then a lot of the water rights holders that we're working with to make these projects happen. So that is it. Thank you, Jim. That's a Great presentation. Any questions for Jim? Yeah, this is Drew. <laughs> Jim, did you reach out to Fuller and and uh, see if he has any fish passage money? No, that's that's a good idea. I think certainly we could do that. I think that would be maybe the key point would be the next step. If we get design done on that culvert there on the East Lake Road, then yeah, certainly we'd want to hit up the Fish and Wildlife Service for construction funds. And so I think that is kind of the broader plan. If we can get the uh, design work in place for North Eden Creek, then I think we can certainly expand our uh, partnership base as far as NRCS, Fish and Wildlife Service, and others to really pay for the construction. Thank you, Jim. Yep, thanks, Drew. This is Clint Brunson. Um, Drew, we have talked to Fuller in the past about some culverts, and he's been more than willing to put money into some culverts farther upstream um, where the road, there's a little dirt road that goes across a couple of the streams that feed into the top end of North Eden. So he's aware of it. We can, I think we can get some money from Fuller if we need to. It, it would be, I think in our best interest to involve Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and most certainly Mark in his, in his funding for these types of projects. So I appreciate it. I have uh, another comment as well. Um, we've been working and we'll be installing some BDAs on North Eden Creek. As Jim mentioned briefly, we do have cutthroat. Um, these are fish that are 100% pure, uh, Bonnevilles, and uh, they come from the lake. Uh, we want to enhance that and give them some additional habitat there, as well as try to raise the bottom of this using BDAs um, because the channel is pretty incised in, in one specific area um, due to some uh, erosion. So this is uh, part of a project that I've been doing for the last two years. Um, great to see um, this kind of be being broadened and uh, stretched out. The fish that are in Lake Town Canyon came from North Eden Creek. Uh, in 95, according to Scott Tolentino that talked to me yesterday. So um, we're trying to really enhance the fisheries and, and fish, specifically the native cutthroats, their habitat with, with this project.
Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Drew. Any other comments? Uh, this is Bert Lay. Just curious about angler access. I presume there is none on these upper reaches. So Bert, on Lake Town Creek, it is fully accessible. Uh, that road runs right up along the creek. It goes from the, uh, the little reservoir there, which is a community fishery, and the creek feeds into it. So that's all accessible through there. Uh, as far as North Eden Creek goes, most of that is private and inaccessible. Really the fishery that we hope to improve is the lake fishery, which is obviously the blue ribbon fishery and very accessible. This is right, Clint Johnson. Uh, there is walk-in access to fishing access for brook trout and cutthroat trout on the upper end of North Eden Creek through um, the Tykert property that's currently listed on the walk-in access webpage. Uh, I secured that years ago with Ron um, and we've continued that access there's about 2.75 miles, if I remember right, of angling access where there's where there actually is cutthroats and brook trout. The stream farther down either gets too warm or there's there's something there that doesn't hold the trout as well once it gets to the bottom of Ron's property, but and and above these old irrigation reservoirs. So there's a there's a place there that just doesn't hold a lot of fish. But I had I did secure access years ago through Ron, and it's still it's still valid. All right, thank you, Clint. Thank you. Great. Any other final questions on this project? All right. Um, thank you. And we're going to move on to we're going to move up to Pine View with project uh, number fifty three twenty seven, uh, deep water structure enhancement phase three. Go for it. Me again. Um, this one's not any different than the previous two phases, other than the fact that we're going to be putting the projects in a different location. The uh, structures right now will be targeted for deployment in the North Fork arm. We have now put structures in the Middle Fork and South Fork arms. This one will be uh, dedicated to the North Fork arm and uh, right off the yacht club, essentially, it will give the young fish that have been spawned in uh, backwater areas of the North, North Fork Arm some, again, the deeper water refugia uh, in hopes of stabilizing the uh, perch population into a more normal size distribution rather than the boom and bust. It's not really any different than the one I previously talked about except for the water body and the fact that we've done it two previous fiscal years at Pine View, uh, I am not sure that the aquatics section has determined whether or not the, the uh, perch population is achieving any more of a normal size structure, but from anecdotal information of my own angling, I have caught more multiple size classes of perch the last two years than I have previously done. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, it seems to be working. I am, you know, I'm optimistic that it's going to continue to work, uh, but I, we don't really know how much is this, what, what's the critical mass of bottom structure to make sure we have a uh, number of fish coming through to recruit to a size where they're going to survive. Uh, this again is primarily the cost of purchasing the same structures. This one has, for some reason, the, the Bureau of Reclamation doesn't recognize that Pine View is one of its reservoirs and our partner there is the Forest Service. They have been wonderful to work with. They wrote the EA, which is like a mini EA, so that we can continue to do these, these projects here. We just finished one last week on the South Fork Arm, and now we're hoping to get funding for the third phase of this, which would put a pretty good field of structures in each of the three major arms of Pine View Reservoir. Great. I think that's probably about it. Thanks, Ken. Any questions?
Awesome. Thanks, Kent, for the other presentation. Now we're going to move on to project number uh, 5388, again at Pineview Reservoir, Invasive Mollusk Pre Preventive Measures. Cody's coming. Okay, I see him scrambling. Sorry about that. We're gonna jump onto his machine to do this presentation uh, because my mic uh, is not working. But can you hear me, Eric? Yep, I can hear you just fine. So go ahead. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. So this project is very similar to what uh, Ken Sorensen has proposed at uh, Willard Bay, um, except for the type of habitat we're going to be deployed. So the best thing probably to um, view the parts of this project is to go to the, um, the documents section. And then in the documents, first, there's two types of images there. So the, the Pond King, um, these are two types of habitat instead of being deployed in the bottom of the reservoir on the benthic zone. These are actually suspended from the dock structure, so they actually don't touch the bottom. Um, but the reason for this is that we're seeing a lot of uh, use at Pine View Reservoir. We're actually seeing between, I think last year was, let me grab my notes on that computer. Sorry. So we. We had just over 13,000 watercraft enter Pine View just last year. And so we're seeing that um, the risk of invasive species introductions into Pine View Reservoir is quite high. And rather than relying solely on um, the work of our interdiction specialists, we're hoping to provide an additional uh, barrier um, using centrarchids, or in this case, sunfish, to, um, to predate on the, on the juvenile ages of these mollusks. Um, if you go to the bottom two documents, you don't need to, yep, so here's the second type of structure. These are a little bit larger, um, but those two documents, you don't need to open up the um, Culver and the Wong, but if anybody wanted to read about um, the literature that we're using to substantiate this reasoning for protecting this water body and this method with these um, dock structures, they can look at those two uh, peer review documents to kind of garner some background, but we just observed that this was a threat to you know, our fishery, if we were to become inoculated with an invasive species, and this is another way of preventing uh, preventing introductions by having those located at the docks. So primarily we're looking to introduce these dock structures at the port ramp, which is on the map located at the dock habitat. Um, we've looked into cemetery, uh, which is the center south side of the arm and the south arm at Anderson Cove, but the docks there are quite shallow. And so we don't feel that these structures would provide an ad added protection at those areas. And the majority of the traffic uh, at this fishery is located at that port ramp, at least as far as boater traffic. Um, if this initial um, installation goes well, we're hoping to move that further to the yacht club um, and working with them as a partnership to get these installed on their private docks. Uh, right now, we're only able to work with the, the concessionaires at the port ramp to get our, our structures installed there. Uh, in this project, uh, last thing, we can go to the finance uh, page. I don't know. Is it showing on anyone else's screen yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, but anyways, the funding for this was asked um, from to be or asked to be funded half for Habitat Council and half for Blue Ribbon. This is a Blue Ribbon fishery, and the introduction of these habitat will not necessarily just offer protection, but it might increase the populations locally, at least at boat ramps. It's overall not going to have a huge impact on habitat or reservoir-wide populations, um, but it is going to at least provide some increased habitat um, for the fish in those areas. Um, unfortunately, as far as the angler perspective, since we don't allow fishing off the docks, 
these increased populations might um, supplement populations in a small way, but overall, this isn't going to provide an increased uh, recreational use for anglers in that sense. So, are there any questions? Thanks, Cody. Uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, last call for questions on this project. Paul? Uh, no, no questions. Okay. Um, all right, then. Thank you again, Cody. Uh, we're going to move on to the next project. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. Project 389, Ogden River, Marriott Ditch Diversion Reconstruction, Phase 1. We'll let yeah, you this is Paul. This is Paul Burnett. I, I can present this, Sorno, give you a break. Okay. Um, so uh, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the map, thank you. Um, okay, so this, um, this project's located near 21st Street Pond on the lower Ogden River. So just for reference, the uh, Ogden River Restoration Project that uh, was funded back in the uh, late 20 aughts was uh, right right to the east of there um uh so it's in pretty close proximity um this diversion structure uh uh is is a, is a main stem diversion um historically it's been composed of uh kind of a whole range of materials including waste concrete um uh and then in 2017 weaver county came in and um tried to fortify it um with uh some large boulders tried uh, and, and made it even more of a fish passage barrier than it than it has been historically. Uh, historically, it's been about a uh, about a four to five foot drop over the rocks. Um, you can kind of see it uh, if you zoom in uh, to the to the Ogden River just below the the longer um, black mark um, for the project. So that yep, that one right there. So it's just to the south of that. You can see it just if you scroll up just a little bit. There you go. Um, so this diversion structure, again, is about a four to five foot drop before Weaver County did their work. Uh, this image shows the, the uh, work that was after it was completed. Um, during lower flows, the water will actually flow through the rocks and, and uh, is, a, for most of the year, is a complete passage barrier. Uh, at really high flows, uh, fish can get through it, um, but, it's a, but it's a big problem. After Weaver County did their... their uh, uh, their restoration work, so to speak, um, that also caused some additional flooding issues because there's no control. They constrain the flo the channel and there's no control of the water uh, over the structure. Um, uh, so as a pro as as a I guess in addition to that issue, um, the 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 water company, the Marriott Ditch Company, that takes water off of this diversion, the water actually flows to the north of this of the structure through an oxbow that kind of parallels the, the junkyard here. And um, as, it's, as it's flowing through, um, it, it uh, collects a, a bunch of debris and junk and pollution from the junkyard. And then it hits a head gate um, uh, about 300 feet to the north uh, at the end of my black line on this map. And um, what the water company doesn't take, they, they bypass back into the river through this bypass channel. So basically the water is picking up all this debris and junk and pollution. The water company is taking what they need, which is about uh, probably about a third of what's actually going through this bypass channel. And then they're bypassing the water back into the river with all of the, all of the, the, the debris. So, so this project has kind of two phases. Um, this phase one is to uh, remove the live water from flowing through the junkyard and to set up um, a buffer or a setback uh, where, uh, where we can protect the riparian area and the water quality. So, so, so phase one, which is, which is what we're proposing here, is going to be to build a pipeline, which is highlighted in yellow, and, uh, and, and fill in uh, part of this, this uh, oxbow channel uh, with the pipeline so the live water isn't flowing through the junkyard. Uh, and then um, after we fill in the channel, uh, we because we're going to fill in the, an active channel, it's going to be a, a, a wetland mitigation requirement. So we 
So we're going to be um, mitigating uh, wetland loss with these with the large black uh, marks here on on the map. Um, <clears throat> this does uh, two main things. One, it protects the uh, it, it protects the water uh, from from uh, pollution, but it also keeps the main the the main flow in the river instead of uh, being diverted out of the river and then back in. Um, Let's see. Uh, and, and the other the other benefit of this project is we're, we're going to set up, we're going to develop a setback, uh, which we still need to work on with with Ogden City on exactly where that um, delineation is. But they essentially, we'll protect the riparian area from uh, activities from the junkyard. Um, and then phase two, which will be done next year, uh, would be um, would be actually constructing the diversion structure. So if you wouldn't mind, yeah, go to the Go3. Uh, which I think is the first the first link here. This is our 100% design on on this project. Um, so basically, the the red areas are the areas uh, that we'll be filling in uh, up up on the north end of this or the top end of the document. Um, the purple areas are are wetland mitigation areas, uh, and then um, the the green uh, is where we will. Um, will enhance the diversion structure so that it's more of a, a broader uh, structure uh, with three drop, basically three uh, dr drops below it to facilitate fish passage. Um, so if you want to go into the budget page. Um, so this is, this is, these are costs uh, based on the engineering uh, engineer's opinion, uh, cost opinion, basically uh, three main components here. Um, well, two main components really uh, for this project, which is the pipeline installation and then uh, filling the old ditch and then uh, reconstructing floodplain or developing the, the mitigation areas. Um, and then we also have, um, we, we've, we've had a, the Corps of Engineers on site uh, verbally, they've, they've approved our, our, our general plan. We still have to go through that permitting process, uh, but, uh, um, but but overall, we, we feel like this is a, in pretty good shape to, to move forward with at least phase one uh, uh, this year. And that's all I have. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions? Great, Paul. You did such a fantastic job there. No questions. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, we've got uh, two more, three more that we're gonna run through here before we uh, break for lunch or, or separate to our different groups. So we're gonna move to uh, 5390, Lost Creek Reservoir Restroom Replacement, phase three. Go ahead. Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, this is Clint Brunson. Uh, I would like to present this project. This is part of probably a five or six year project to create Lost Creek into a blue ribbon fishery. Uh, I came into the position and this is one that we renewed the MOU agreement with BOR and we have been working uh, step by step to replace restrooms. Hopefully next year we'll be improving the boat ramp and some access there. And the goal is to get access clear back to into the Kilfoyle arm. Um, which is kind of the northeast main arm of the of the reservoir. Um, so it's on Blue Ribbon's potential uh, body water list. Um, the restroom re uh, is that's, sorry. The restroom being replaced is a single hole toilet that's just past the boat ramp by about a half a mile, and it is 20 plus years old and BOR is a, has agreed to replace this, re, uh, allow us to replace this restroom. So I went through the contractor who is CXT to get the contract price. Um, we're hoping again that this, although it doesn't improve access for anglers, it does improve their stay there while they are there, which um, was one of the reasons that we did not score very well. Uh, this is a picture of the old restroom. 
that uh, needs to be replaced. Um, it's pretty similar. The last the last two years, I've asked uh, money from Habitat Council and Blue Ribbon to replace restrooms, and the end of or the first of next month, we'll be replacing one below the dam. So, including this one, we'll have replaced three restrooms at Lost Creek. Um, I have other funders that also provided, uh, will provide money besides this, mainly in kind. Morgan County will do uh, the removal of the old restroom and uh, provide any ADA concrete pad material necessary for those in wheelchairs to access this. Uh, we monitor Lost Creek on a every other year or every third year basis now, um, just for population uh, work, but the fishery itself is, is fantastic. We have a lot of fish that are in, in the slot and just coming out of that slot of 22 inches. Um, it's, it's an incredible fishery. So, like I said, moving forward, we're working on trying to get access into that back arm. Uh, right now, we're just taking these little steps, kind of waiting for other projects to finish so we can ask for the focal water money next year. Any question? Great, thank you, Clint. Um, I don't see any questions. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move to um, our last Northern Region project, um, Judd McMichael Banks Stabilization Project, phase three. Go ahead. All right, so this one's been on my list for a, a long time. As many of you know, this is a walk-in access area. So this has been in walk-in access since 2005 when I started the program. And the landowners, uh, both Judd and McMichael, have wanted to have us come in and help them stabilize their banks. This money that I'm asking, I'm asking for $10,000. This is to help transport and move and haul rock and trees for this last phase of the project. Um, we have our design in place. We have that taken care of. What we're going to do is use a lot of tow wood and uh, large rock, three to five foot rock, to hold those in place on both the upstream and downstream sections of this project. Uh, TU has helped with, Paul Burnett has helped with oversight and, and kind of helping us look at this project and uh, the landowners have given us free access to, to help them with this project. So, but our funding mainly comes through Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council um, with some in-kind work by the landowners putting up fences and, and those kinds of things. Um, this project will directly enhance our fish populations uh, in this stretch of the river. Uh, we, it is up for monitoring this summer um, and since this is fish habitat and since we're putting in these big root wads, um, this will be a great habitat for the fish in both of these areas. Uh, this winter in January, we did one of the banks. So uh, Daniel's flipping through some of those slides um, and where we removed the really steep banks and put in some small uh, rock barbs basically um, within the bank just to keep the erosion um, at a minimal. We sloped the bank back and put in a bunch of willows. I'll redo those. I'll put in some more this spring as well. So this is just a continuation of this, this project. So there's a bank that has some pretty good velocity just upstream of this project in the, in the pitchers. And that's why we're putting in the root wads um, and the rock in, the, in that stretch. Um, we're we find that this is probably our most successful and best use of our money is to do this and, and it will stay there for a long time and provide some very natural uh, cover. Uh, this is a section of the Weber River that is a blue ribbon fishery for brown trout. Um, in particular, we have moved our 
bluehead sucker out of this reach and into lower reaches below Echo Reservoir. Um, but we, we still monitor and, and some of the work we'll provide is a little bit of backwater habitat for any blueheads or, or other small fish that we, we need to provide some habitat for. Um, other than that, I think this is pretty straightforward. It's, uh, it's a project that I'm not asking a lot of money because I don't think I need a lot of money to finish it up, but I would like to have some money just to tie up any loose ends, start hauling uh, logs from a work site here along Highway 89 and the private contractors that are doing that are hauling all my trees and stumps, all the trees and root wads up there. And, and I just need to have a source of um, paying those. Um, and as we move into the summer and into the next fiscal year um, to move some additional trees. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Thanks Clint. Are there any, pro any questions um, about this project? This is Paul Burnett. I just want to compliment Clint for um, for this project and and his massive efforts that he put that he's put towards this project. And um, yeah, so it's well done, Clint. And, and hopefully we can get this completed. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Hi, Clint. This is Bert. Bert Lay, I just want to second that. I also note, isn't this Judd property? It's been in walk-in access longer than any other property on the Weaver. Is that correct? That is correct. This is the very first contract that I signed in February of 2006 or January of 2006. So it was the first contract that I signed in walk-in access. And Mr. McMichael is relatively new to the project, but is uh, is interested in having similar sorts of improvements. Yeah, uh, Darren joined the walk-in access program probably in 2008, if I remember right. Um, and so they've been asking for this project to be completed, but due to um, just just things coming up, it's kind of been at the back on the back burner for. A number of years and uh so i'm kind of excited to kind of get this one off of my shoulders if you will and and have this all done but it's been a long time coming and they both are enrolled in walk-in access they both allow angling and uh, darren allows waterfowl hunting as well great thank you very much clint this is tyler how does this um, this new phase, how does it relate to the, the two or three phases that you've got already on the current project status? Well, Tyler, um, the way this, this one is for funding for this, this lower, basically for that judge, the corner, it's the, on your screen, it's that top little corner there um, that Daniel has highlighted. It's a little black corner right there. Um, and for just covering the cost of materials is basically all I'm, I'm asking for. So that's how it relates. Um, if I have to move additional materials, I have funding to move materials for the farthest upstream section that we'll be working on this fall. But all of this work will be done uh, in November this year. I have the division uh, heavy equipment crew from Ephraim coming up for two weeks to get this all knocked out and, and taken care of. So um, I'm just trying to tie everything up and, and wanna make sure that I have enough money to finish everything while I have the crew on the ground and have all the materials there ready to go for them as they, as they show up for two weeks. Uh, Clint, this is Allison. Um, so just to follow up on Tyler's question. So um, will you be requesting carry over for any of the three phases that you have currently going now or will all, all I will be I, just for next fiscal year. So that's a very good question. My goal is to have everything spent other than this money by the end of this fiscal year in June by hauling materials and those kind of things. This would be just for next year. That's that's the plan right now. I have everything scheduled. Um, I have some invoices that I still have to pay in this fiscal year, and and hopefully 
phase one and two will be completely finished and we can close that out and I won't have carry over from those. All right, thanks Clint. Any other questions? Awesome, glad you're able to utilize our heavy equipment crew too. Um, they do great work. They do great um, work. All right, okay. Uh, that kind of concludes our Northern region projects. Um, we're gonna, we have one more to discuss here. Um, and uh, Randy Opplinger will be give, presenting this. Um, and after he presents uh, this final project for our combined meeting, he will also talk about uh, the rest of the Blue Ribbon uh, protocol for the rest of your Blue Ribbon meeting today. After he finishes that, I will talk about the Habitat Council protocol for the rest of the day. So with that, Randy, I'll let you talk about the last project of our combined meeting. Okay, well, that sounds good. Uh, Daniel, you mind going over to the finance page for this one? This one's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, really for a lot of the projects we've looked at today, a lot of these are stream restoration oriented projects and um, our staff have received over the years incredible training, which has allowed them to kind of increase their tool set as they get out of college. So they're able to go in and really do good work with these projects and make these projects really successful. Um, this particular project is really a continuation of a funding request that we've been carrying out for really, I don't know how many years, but it's been a fairly extended period of time now where we're basically seeking funding so we could send our biologists out to uh, take additional trainings at various locations, either here in the state or other parts of the country, so they can, I guess, increase their skill set a little bit so they could successfully complete these projects. So, send people to, or there's a few classes in kind of Rosgen stream restoration methodologies we send people to. There's some beaver use classes we send people to, and some wetland delineation classes we send people to. In the past year, we sent eight people to different classes, uh, taking a total of 11 different courses. So that's something people have taken. And then looking at the upcoming year, we're basically uh, proposing to extend that funding request for $15,000 for Blue Ribbon, $15,000 for Habitat Council for a combined total of 30,000. And we've got in the hopper another eight, 10 people who are looking at taking some coursework this year. So of this, it's really about getting some uh, funding so we could Courses. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has us on this project. Uh, Randy, so I've got a question actually. So is there, there's a lot of people who are looking to take, uh, you know, the restoration training. Um, it, have you guys got like a strategy where you're going to get so many people per region um, or, or are you just kind of requesting people as they want to take the training to do it? Because I can see how maybe in some region we could get, you know, a whole bunch of people that are trained and other regions we don't have anyone or, or very few. Have you looked at like a kind of an overall strategy of, of doing that? You know, I'm probably not the one to ask on this. This is Don Wiley's project, but my understanding is there is a little bit of a strategy behind it where we're trying to scatter this across the regions and build up too much with all our experts being in one region, but trying to provide opportunities across all the regions to kind of scatter that expertise across the state. Great, thanks. Uh, any other questions about, about this request? Eric, this is Jeff. Eric, this is Justin, I have one. Um, it, pardon my ignorance on this, Randy, but we have we sent enough division employees to this where we can kind of self-train on, on, or is it important that we continually send year after year new employees to this? So kind of what I'm getting at is, do we have some of this expertise in house now that we could teach our own or, or not? You know, we've, we've built up a lot of expertise over the years, to be honest with you. There's there's some great classes out there and some awesome instructors. And, you know, these instructors are continually tweaking their education, you know, what they're offering to kind of keep up to date with, you know, the latest designs out there, the latest information. So I think there is some value in there and sending our people to really learn from these people who are regarded as being the best people in these subjects versus doing self-training just to keep ourselves as times as possible and make sure we're using the latest techniques. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Great question. Any, any final questions? 
Okay, with that, Randy, go ahead with your protocol for the rest of your meeting. Well, just everybody on Blue Ribbon, with Eric kind of off his directions, let's hop off the phone here. And then I sent out a link earlier, uh, I guess I would have sent it yesterday afternoon, a different link to hop into for the Blue Ribbon only section. So just head over to that link. We'll take maybe a 10 minute break after we're done here or maybe convene maybe 12, 15, something like that. Give people a chance to go to the restroom, that kind of thing. The only portion won't take very long. That's six projects to go through and a few of them are pretty, pretty straightforward projects. So I don't think they'll take too long. So okay. in, ten, in 10 minutes, you'd like to have us get back on. Is that correct, Randy? A second link portion. What I'll do is I'll send that link out. Right. Now, so I'll just let everybody have the latest link here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks Randy. Um, any other questions about how uh, the direction Blue Ribbon is going at this point? Okay, so for Habitat Council folks, um, I'm going to propose uh, we have on the agenda uh, a one hour lunch. Um, I'm thinking since we're all, most of us are, are stuck, you know, most of you are all stuck at home, although I'm at the office today, but um, I'm going to propose we do a half an hour lunch or would there be any objections to that proposal? Okay, I don't see any objections. So we're going to uh, take a half an hour lunch. After the lunch, we will convene on the same web conference link. It won't be a new link. It'll be the same one. And um, we will uh, commence with our voting on the previous projects in, in one large group. Um, and we will do the Habitat Council side of the voting uh, for that. Then uh, once we've completed that, we will continue on. We have 16 additional Habitat Council only projects uh, that we will be reviewing and we will we will commence with that. So the time right now is 12.07. Uh, let's look to be back on line um, at 12.37 and we will start uh, back with our Habitat Council um, portion of our meeting today. Uh, any Final questions before we do that. Great. Uh, with that, we are adjourned for half an hour. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, it's uh, 1237. Um, <clears throat> I am going to, the timer's still got a minute and 20 seconds. We're gonna let that time out. If anybody else is lagging behind, that'll hopefully capture them. So we've got one more minute, one more minute and we will start. Okay, we are back on. Um, thanks everybody. I hope that uh, that was uh, long enough for people to get a bite to eat, or take a break. Um, so for Habitat Council, we still have 16 additional projects to review, um, but before we do that, um, and I guess I'll be seeking any input from uh, Daniel, Danny, or Allison on if I'm missing any protocol here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, first off, we need to um, approve the minutes from the February 3rd, 13th meeting. Uh, Daniel, if you want to uh, share those briefly. Maybe you're not prepped for that. Give me one second. No problem. We'll give Daniel just a second for that. So uh, we're gonna go through and uh, approve the minutes from our previous meeting. Um, then what we will do is uh, we will, um, <clears throat> in one voting block, do a uh, approval of all of the combined meeting projects, unless uh, there is somebody who it would dissent on any specific project, we will do a, a vote specific to that project to note that. Um, any questions on that? Okay. So, okay, Daniel, I'll show that you're presenting, but I'm only seeing a black screen. Sort of. Daniel, you've got the 2019 February meeting minutes up. Okay, we're just taking a minute. Daniel's gonna pull off the minutes. We'll approve those. And as we go through to do that, I'll we'll do a roll call of just the Habitat Council um, members. And you'll give me a yes or a no. And um, that will constitute your vote. Um, do we need a motion from someone for this? Yes, we will need a motion. motion. Once we can, okay. To approve we have a the motion from Tyler. Minutes. So the minutes are showing up it's just in the tiny little corner on my screen. Am I the only one? Oh, there we go. Now I'm seeing it. Okay. 
So we have a motion to approve the minutes and we have a second to approve the minutes. And I'll go through the roll call with a yes or a no. Uh, say your name first and then I'll acknowledge. So Tyler Thompson. Tyler Thompson votes yes. Okay, thank you. Justin Shannon. Yes. Thank you, Drew Cushing. Yes. Thank you, Darren West. Darren West. Okay, we'll come back. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Thank you, Dwayne. Jack Ray. Yes. Thank you, Paul Burnett. Paul Burnett votes yes. Thank you. Uh, going back to Darren West. It doesn't okay. look like he's on at the moment. Right. Um, I, missed who, I missed who seconded the motion. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't know that we had a second. No, that I skipped that one. My bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so I will ask for a second on the motion. I will okay. second Dwayne. Okay, second from Dwayne. Okay. Um, let me know if anybody votes no at this point on the minutes. <clears throat> and it's okay that Darren's not here because uh, we have a quorum with the number we have. He and he had indicated he was going to be kind of in and out. So, all right. So, the motion carries, we approve the minutes of the previous meeting, and we are gonna move ahead and <clears throat> vote specifically on the entire block of projects that were already presented this morning in the combined uh, Habitat Council uh, Blue Ribbon Fisheries meeting. Okay. Yeah, this through, I think I have a motion. Okay, before we do that, um, and, and maybe, I, I don't know what, you can tell me if your motion is along these lines. I, I need to ask, are there any no votes on any of those projects this morning uh, that we are requesting to be approved? So I would want to hear that now. Um, th this is Justin Shannon. I don't know if it's a no vote for sure. I just... I wanted to check with maybe Paul and Drew to see if we've ever used Habitat Council dollars in the past to go towards a fishing tournament. That seemed like a new one to me. Yeah, I, uh, this is Jack Ray. I, I second the concern on that. I think it's, it's a worthwhile project, but it doesn't seem like it's a Habitat Council deal. Um, yeah, this is Paul Burnett. I'm not I aware. Oh, go ahead, Drew. This is in the in the past we've used blue ribbon for these types of things. Um, this is Paul. I was just going to reflect what Drew said. It, I, I think um, that, that may not be a, a Habitat Council uh, qualifying project. Um, I think it's a definitely a worthy effort and worthy event, and it sounds like it really engages angle, anglers. But uh, I think that one may may not qualify. It, Eric, can we vote on that one separately? Because I I don't think I'd vote in favor of it. Absolutely, we will we will vote on that one separately. Any other projects that uh, anyone desires to vote on separately, please. Eric, I'd like to pull out the the Lost Creek Reservoir restroom replacement as well. Vote on it separately. I've got a little caveat I want to attach to it. Okay. Uh, me, project 5390. Okay. This, Comment? Yeah, this is Drew. Uh, there's there's a number of those that I would put in that same category as Tyler. Uh, anything that is an infrastructure project, I'd like to with it with another partner as the managing agency. I'd like to pull those out and discuss them separately and vote on them separately. Okay. So, um, 
or I could voice my my concern with them and we can talk about how to include them with the other projects. How's that? Yeah, I mean, if you wanna, either way, we've got to highlight which ones they are and, um, and then vote on them separately. So um, if you can identify which other ones would it, that you're thinking of for this. Yeah, there was a, the, the Chicken Creek, there was the Fish Lake projects. Um, there were some restrooms in the Northern region, I think Lost Creek. Um, those are the ones that I was thinking of. And my consideration would be that anytime that we have a project where we are purchasing or replacing infrastructure, that we have a, it's contingent upon a signed agreement from both parties as to who's gonna maintain uh, that infrastructure after it's built. Yeah, I like that one too. Okay. <clears throat> so far I have the Fish Lake Birch Tournament, the Chicken Creek Project and Lost Creek to vote on separately. Are there any, any additional ones that you want to vote on separately? Would the uh, Ogden River Diversion one count? I'm looking to the committee members to provide input. What would the what would the infrastructure be there, Paul? A <clears throat> uh, pipeline and a and a diversion structure, but it, at this point for this phase would be pipeline. And I don't know. I guess I don't know. Like like in the past, we've considered screens, fish screens infrastructure, and um, so I think maybe um, defining what what we mean by infrastructure, if it's if it's just focused on the, you know, the user uh, type of elements like the like the fish cleaning stations, that sort of thing, or if it does include the the water infrastructure, which I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm I'm happy to get a signed agreement. I just I'm curious um, how we'd run for on that. For consistency, I'd say it doesn't hurt to include it in this. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to have it done. Okay, so we will also include um, the Ogden River. <clears throat> so 5389 Ogden River Marriott Ditch Diversion Reconstruction Project is a single vote or a, to be voted on individually. Um, any, any others? Um, Drew, go ahead. Sorry, Drew. Uh, did you also want to include fifty three seventeen and fifty three sixty two, all three of the Fish Lake projects, in voting separately? Yes. Okay. This is a Calvin Black. Hey, the Joe's Valley uh, proposal had a restroom and boat dock attached to it um, but the four services lead project manager on that they had already identified to take control and maintenance of those because that's why they're proposing the project not the division thank you calvin uh, i'm at a comment here from cody i don't know if you're able to jump on and talk about that really quick And um, looks like it's not working for you. Um, I'll just read your comment. <clears throat> um, Cody says the Lost Creek project maintenance has been assigned, um, signatures collected to and from Morgan County already. Uh, but we still will vote on that one individually. Okay. <clears throat> um, any others that we want to vote on separately? All right. Okay, so we're gonna start with the first one um, that we'd request the vote on separately, uh, which is 5305 Fish Lake Perch Tournament. And what I will do is I will just quickly, like we did with the minutes, run through the roster and I want a yes or a no. Tell me your, tell me your name and, and what you vote. Um, and I'll ask for a motion for these. First, um,
Yeah, so we need a motion first and a second, and then we can vote. So I need a motion to approve or to not approve. Uh, Eric, this is just, I'd make the motion that we don't approve this for funding consideration. Okay, thank you, Justin. We have a motion to not approve 5305. Is there a second? This is Paul Burnett, I'll second that. Okay, we have a second from Paul Burnett and we'll run through the roster list for a specific votes. And I'm gonna ask first really quick, uh, Allison, are you recording these then? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, for Fish Lake Perch Tournament, um, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Tyler Thompson votes yes. Justin Shannon. Uh, I, I made the motion, so I've, I'll vote no. Oh, great, okay. <clears throat> Fair enough. Drew Cushing. Isn't, isn't, isn't the motion to not approve the project? Correct. So I vote yes on that. Justin, you probably should vote yes, too. <laughs> That's a good point. So Hold on. I, all these devil negatives. I went to Box Elder High School. It was really rough. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I don't think we should fund this one, however you want to paint that. So I'd vote yes. Okay, Justin votes yes to not approve the project. Okay, um, Drew Cushing. Yes. Yes to not approve the project. Darren West. Yes, not to approve the project. Not to approve the project. Thank you, Darren. Dwayne Reading. Yes, to not approve. Yes, to not approve the project. Jack Ray? Yes. Yes, to not approve. Paul Burnett? Yes, to not approve. Yes, to not approve. The motion to not approve carries. Allison, you got that? Thank you. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, Fish Lake Marina Aerator. Uh, entertain a motion. Yeah, this is Drew. Uh, I, I move to approve contingent upon a signed agreement with the managing partner uh, for maintenance. Okay, I have a motion to approve. Do, is there a second? This is Paul Burnett, I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Paul Burnett. Uh, we'll go through the list to vote. Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Tyler Thompson votes yes to approve. Justin Shannon. I vote yes. Did I get it right, Tyler? Did I do it right that time? <laughs> yeah, you got it right. <laughs> uh, Justin like votes yes to approve. Drew Cushing. Yes. Drew votes yes to approve. Darren West. Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading. Yes to approve. Yes to approve. Jack Ray. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Yes, Paul Burnett. Yes, to approve. Paul Burnett votes yes to approve. The motion carries. Full support. Okay. Uh, next one, fish cleaning stations, 5362 Fish Lake. Uh, entertain a motion to approve or not approve. Yeah, this is uh, Drew again. Uh, make the same motion as the last project that we approve contingent upon a maintenance agreement with our managing partner. Okay, is there a second? I'll second, this is Tyler. Okay, thank you, Tyler. So Drew, uh, motions to approve with along with an agreement and Tyler makes a second to that motion. Um, so Tyler, vote. I vote yes. A votes yes to approve. Justin Shannon. I vote yes. Yes to approve. Drew Cushing. Yes. Yes to approve. Darren West. I'll recuse myself from this vote as I was not able to be on the call for the, the explanation of this project. Thank you, Darren West abstains. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Yes to approve. Jack Ray. Yes. Yes to approve. Paul Burnett. Yes to approve. Yes to approve. Motion carries. Okay, next one on the list. Uh, Fish Lake uh, cleaning stations. 
Okay, is, is there a motion on this project? Yeah, this is true again, same motion. Uh, do you need me to state it again? <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, the motion is to approve contingent upon a maintenance agreement with our partner. Okay, we have a motion to approve contingent upon a maintenance agreement with the partner. Is there a second? I'll second again. This is Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. So Drew makes the motion, Tyler makes the second. Uh, voting, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Tyler votes yes. Justin Shannon. I vote yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing. Yes. Thank you. Darren West. Okay, we'll come back. Dwayne Reading. I vote yes. Dwayne votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Votes yes. Paul Burnett. Yes. Thank you. Darren, do you want to vote on this one or abstain? Yeah, I'll also abstain. Okay, Darren West abstains. Thank you. Motion carries to approve. We're along with an agreement. Okay, the next one that we need to select. Oh, go ahead. Who seconded that one? Tyler Thompson did. Okay, thank you. Yep. The next one that we agreed uh, to individually review was the 5273 from Central Region, Chicken Creek East Boat Ramp for Strawberry Reservoir. Do we have a motion to approve or not approve? Uh, same motion, this is Drew again. I uh, move to approve uh, contingent upon a signed agreement with our partner uh, for to determine who maintains the, the uh, infrastructure. Thank you, Drew makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? This is Paul Burnett. I will second that. Thank you. Paul Burnett makes a second. Okay, we're going to go to voting. Uh, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Tyler votes yes. Justin Shannon. Yes. He votes yes. Drew Cushing. Yes. Thank you, Darren West. I will abstain again. Thank you. Wayne Reading. Yes. Wayne votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Paul Burnett. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion carries. All affirmative with one abstention. Okay, the next one on the list to vote on. Uh, Joe's Valley Boater Access Improvement included some restrooms and such. Do I have a motion? Yeah, this is Drew again. Same motion uh, that we <laughs> Prove it contingent upon a maintenance agreement with our partner. This is Tyler. I second it. Drew makes a motion. Tyler makes a second. Go for voting. Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon. Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing. Drew Cushing. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Darren West. Abstain again. Abstain. Thank you. Wayne Reading. Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett. Yes. Thank you. Votes yes. Uh, motion carries along with uh, the with an agreement contingency with a partner. Okay. Next one on the list to vote on: fifty-three eighty-nine Ogden River Marriott Ditch Diversion Reconstruction. Phase one, we have a motion to approve or not approve. <laughs> I was hoping Paul Burnett would step in here, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and make the same motion. Okay. Uh, to approve contingent upon an agreement with their partner for maintenance. Okay, we have a motion to approve. I'll second it again. This is Tyler. Tyler seconds the motion to approve contingent along with an agreement. Hey, Voting. Eric, Eric yes. do, we have, do we have many of these that we could just lump into all? I, I, I love watching Drew make the same motion time and time again. It actually cracks me up. Is there, if there's any more, can we just throw them all in the same agreement or the same wording? Um, sure. The, the only other one that we were going to vote on uh, specifically was 5390, the Lost Creek Reservoir restroom replacement. I guess so that'd be the same motion. Okay, never mind. We'll we'll do that separate then. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So individually, this is project 5389 voting. We already have a motion and a second to approve contingent with an agreement. Um, let's see, Tyler, you vote already on this one? I seconded it and I'll vote yes on it too. Okay. Tyler has a second and he votes yes. Justin Shannon. Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing. Yes. Votes yes. Darren West. Abstain. Thank you. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett. Paul Burnett. Did we lose you, man? I don't even think I'm seeing him on the list anymore. Okay, he's back. Paul Burnett, I'm looking for a vote from you. Sorry about that. I got dropped from the call. Um, I'm going to abstain. This is my project, so I'm going to abstain from voting on this one. Okay. Paul Burnett abstains. Um, with that, we have one, two, three, four, five yes votes, um, two abstentions. The motion carries. Okay. Last one that we're going to vote on individually from the morning is the Lost Creek Reservoir Restroom Replacement Phase 3. I don't, looking for a motion. Okay, I'll take this one. Okay. Uh, make a motion to approve Lost Creek Reservoir um, Restroom Phase 3 with two contingencies. First being that a agreement is in place with the entities that will do the maintenance. And second, that Clint completes his completion report from two years ago from the first res <laughs> from the first restaurant. So that's my motion. Fair enough. I like that. We have a motion to approve with <laughs> two um, contingencies that we have an agreement and second that the, the completion report is put in on previous projects. Um, do I have a second? I'll second. I'll go. Okay. Have a second from Drew. Okay, we'll go through voting. Okay. Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon. I vote yes, mostly because that just made me laugh. So. <laughs> That's a good one. Drew Cushing. Yes. Votes yes. Darren West. Abstain. Abstains. Thank you. Dwayne Reading. I vote yes. Thank you, Dwayne. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Uh, Paul Burnett. I will vote yes. Paul Burnett votes yes. Um, Allison, was that Drew or Dwayne that second? It was Drew. Maybe it was Dwayne. I don't know. Who got that one Good. first? Give it to Drew. Okay, we're giving it to Drew. Okay, good question. Um, <clears throat> Stan Beckstrom, I'm going back here um, to a comment for Fish Lake Projects, aerator and cleaning station. We do not have signed agreements, but it will not be an issue uh, for the resort marina owners to sign one. So that will be forthcoming. So, okay, good. All right. Okay, so those for all of the individual projects. Um, we'll now look to entertain a motion for the bulk of the rest of the morning project, including Lower Provo River Project, Strawberry Reservoir, uh, Co-op Cooperative Snow Plowing Agreement, um, Huntington Creek, um, Lower Dalton Creek, Culvert Fish Passage, Weber River Main Stem, uh, Habitat Augmentation, Lower Logan Conservation Easement, Near Ramp, uh, Centrarchid Habitat Enhancement, Bear Lake Tributaries Restoration, Pine View Reservoir Deep Water Structure Enhancement, uh, Pine View Reservoir Invasive Mollusk Prevention Measures, um, Judd McMichael Bank Stabilization Project, and Salt Lake Office FY21 Stream Restoration Training. Are there any of these that we still want to pull out separately? Yeah, this is Paul Burnett. Can we pull out the 
the Dalton Creek um, project just because it's my project, and so I'll have to abstain from that one. I'd like to vote on all the rest. Okay, we will pull out the Lower Dalton Creek uh, project. Um, looks like 3114. Do that individually. Are there any other ones that we want to additionally pull out? It should be by itself. Okay, if not, let's move on. Uh, 4114 Lower Dalton Creek Culvert Fish Passage. Uh, is there a motion on this one? I move to approve. This is Drew. Mm -hmm. This is Tyler. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion to approve the project from Drew and a second from Tyler. Go to voting, Tyler. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon? Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing? Yes. Darren West? Abstain. Abstains. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett? I will abstain. Abstains from the voting. Uh, the motion carries uh, with five yeses. Okay. So the rest of these projects, I will entertain a motion to approve or not approve. I'll make the motion. I make a motion to approve the remaining projects from this morning's joint session with Blue Ribbon Council uh, for funding consideration. Thank you, Tyler. We have a motion to approve. And the second was who? Jack. Jack. Jack uh, provided a second for that motion. We'll go to voting. Uh, Tyler Thompson? I vote yes. Justin Shannon? Yes. Thank you, Drew, Drew Cushing? Yes. Darren West? Abstain. Abstains. Duane Reading? Yes. Thank you, Jack Ray? Yes. Paul Burnett. I'll vote yes. Thank you. We have six yes votes and one abstention. The motion carries for the bulk of the rest of those projects. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we have 16 more. <laughs> and it's a little after one o'clock. Okay. So, but we're going to move ahead now. Um, so I'm asking Allison and Daniel from a process standpoint, am I missing anything else before we move ahead? No, I don't think so. Maybe you wanna decide on how you wanna do the voting just for um, ease of purposes, if you wanna vote after every project or if you wanna do the same protocol you, you just kind of did and do your voting at the very end. Right. So we have that option now. Typically, as Habitat Council, we voted on projects individually. Um, to be honest with you, it doesn't take that long. You know, um, I think we can go through it pretty fast. I guess I would, I would um, look to do that uh, individually, like we normally have done. Uh, does anybody have any dissension or any reason why we shouldn't do that? In that they would want to vote on everything as a bulk. Again, this is just, and I, I would prefer that we just vote project by project and keep moving. Okay. All right. Any other uh, issues with that process? Okay. We're going to go ahead and we're going to go to presentations um, from Northern Region um, for Habitat Council only. And we're going to vote project by project. We'll go through it pretty quickly. And um, let's aim to get done by 3.30 or 4 at the very latest. And so we're going to push through these. Um, first project uh, is 5332 Beaver Trapping Expense Fund Phase 3. Uh, whoever's going to present on that, you are now clear to go. It's me again. <laughs> Thank you, Swan. Um, this one shouldn't be too new for anybody either. It's the third iteration of this. Uh, the project has grown. Uh, I think we've reached a point where we're pretty comfortable with the funding uh, allowance we've been getting. 
Uh, last year's project was a similar budget and we moved a total, well, we moved, captured, housed, quarantined, uh, transported and moved a total of 42 beavers uh, into areas where they can actually do some beneficial dam building and, and wet meadow restoration instead of the nuisance that they were. Um, they were typically caught from areas that were crowded and and they were leaving or they were in areas where they were causing problems like irrigation diversions and places near infrastructure. Um, we have a place at Utah State University now that is housing them under quarantine. Uh, it's been a really good working relationship and I've enjoyed working with them. It's the costs are coming down per beaver now. Uh, generally speaking, we, we run about, you know, four to $4,500 per batch, if you will, of beavers. We capture anywhere from seven to 12 at a time that we like to house before we actually make the transport to move them to their ultimate destination. Uh, it's been pretty popular. We are now kind of moving into the arena with some of the areas, uh, typically up around the Park City area where they tend to be uh, a little more sensitive to killing things. Uh, they want to make sure that the beavers that are flooding their basements don't get killed, go figure but uh, they're willing to pay out of pocket. So we've, we've achieved a little bit of out of pocket savings on some of those instead of having to utilize my budget for, for the capture of those. So that's, we're, we're starting to move into that um, subsidized, but not yet self-funded arena. Uh, this, one, this year we're, we're asking for a similar amount of money. We've got different areas targeted. Some of them are the same. We've been, we still need a few more in the upper reaches of the Grouse Creek system and maybe another one in Mahogany. But we've also identified some areas where we'd like to put them uh, outside of those, shall I call the traditional ones we've been doing. We've been in contact with Randall and Jim here in the wildlife section. Uh, in fact, we had a, a, a meeting earlier, well, late last year, about places where we were going to absolutely prohibit their, their reintroduction or introduction, and uh, we've, we've carved out some pretty big blocks where we're just not going to do it. Otherwise, we're going to generally rely on the BRAT model to give us a good indicator of where we might be most, mostly successful in their reintroduction. Um, Randall uh, has been really good to work with here. If he gets wind of a, a nuisance one, he usually contacts me before he contacts his, his nuisance lethal trapper. And we, if I can take them, I, I generally get a hold of USU and they, they trap them and, and take those. But uh, I, I hope that we're relieving some of the pressure off Randall that way to try and address every you know, giant mouse in, in the region. So I, I'd really like to continue this program for another year or two anyway. We seem to be able, we've, we've definitely got more need uh, to move them around. So this has been a good opportunity to get that done. Thanks, thanks, uh, any, any comments? I have a question, Dwayne. Yep. Do we have pictures and evidence of the success of these projects? Of the beavers? Of, have they all lived when relocated? Is, is it a hundred percent success, or is there a percentage of them that fail? Or what is it, what's what happens once you release them? We go back and look for evidence of dam building activity in the Grouse Creek system. We've got two discrete colonies of dam building areas that have taken. Uh, we just released the ones into Mahogany late last fall, so I won't be able to tell that till spring. 
Uh, same with sugar pine. We've got, I believe, two colonies in Three Mile Creek. And then uh, uh, where was the other one? Peggy Sue or something like that over in Rich County. But by and large, we get survival to the point of establishing a colony, but we don't know if every individual beaver survived. But the colony in and, in and of itself generally seems to have survived the trans the transport. So we, we are establishing new ones. Uh, they are creating wet meadows where they're supposed to. And so far we haven't experienced any uh, out migration of of any of those newly established colonies into any problem areas. Okay, any other comment? Okay, if not, I'll entertain a motion on this project. I, I'll, this is Justin, I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Can I have a motion second. to be approved? Is that you, Tyler? Yes. Tyler made a second uh, to approve the project. Um, we'll go through the voting. Tyler Thompson? Vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon? Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing? Yes. Darren West? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett? I vote yes. Votes yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Move to the next project, uh, 5336 Northern Region Beaver Dam Analog Projects Phase 2. Is that you, Sorno? Yeah, and now on to the places where we would prefer not to put beavers at the moment. Um, and we are, uh, we're, we're doing uh, a certain amount of beaver mimicry where we would not at this time want beavers either due to the, its proximity to infrastructure, landowner concerns, uh, landowner assistance specialist concerns, and, and then our big block of where we've carved things out and said, uh, we'd rather not get involved with it right now. Um, some of these, this has gotten kind of a little bit bigger and some of them are areas that I'm not familiar with because I've, I'm working with more partners now uh, TU and, and Forest Service, and, and uh, they have areas where they want, would like to have some, some stream work done on a, oh, less than mechanical footprint. So we're actually going in and putting in some beaver dam analogs and, and some other structures, some PALs, uh, post-assisted log structures, and things like that to, to help the stream in and of itself without actually putting beavers in there. We get some of the benefits of beavers, that being the capture of sediment, slowing of the water, uh, increasing the, uh, the stage of the river and, and holding back just a little bit of water during runoff without having to deal with the possibility of out migration into areas where we don't want them of, of the animals themselves. So um, we've, we've got, targeted areas in Fish Creek up in the Chalk Creek drainage, uh, Franklin Creek, Whites. Uh, we've got a couple in the Logan and Blacksmith Fork area that I'm doing in conjunction with the Forest Service. Um, and then there's a few small streams in the Monte Cristo area. We have them in Sugar Pine already. We would like to put BDAs in some of those areas adjacent to that and seeing if we can find some attractive places if the ones in Sugar Pine out migrate that they would go there because we, you know, it's one of those places where we could put beavers, but we, it's not as high a priority at the moment if we can get some, some out migration. Um, this one, again, isn't greatly expensive. Most of it is, is some of it is the permitting costs, which I'm going to, I budgeted 500 per permit, but if, if uh, my partner uh, with TU is, is willing to do some of that. He can get them a lot cheaper than I can. We can bring that cost down a little bit. We started exploring some uh, contractual services for the actual construction of the BDAs. Uh, and, and then our materials and supplies are, are the largest chunk of the, of the funding at just about $10,000. We found some good 
good deals on some smaller diameter posts that are really pretty easy to drive instead of the, the six and seven inch ones we've been kind of sentenced to before. Um, other than that, it's just replacement of the consumable materials. Uh, and uh, we're asking uh, about 11,000 out of Habitat Council. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, any comment or questions for Cerno on this project? I just uh, have one, it's probably old hat, Sarno, but uh, we required uh, temporary water rights to be addressed before these projects are moved forward. And has, has that been done? Well, it, it's it's only where they've been requested. If if they go through the, the stream alteration permit, that triggers that query. And if there's no, uh, concern with the state engineer, then we don't have to get the water rights. It's only in places where that's triggered and they say, uh, no way, no how without water rights. And we, we aren't really in any of those areas right now. I specifically picked some watersheds that seem to be less of a problem. And for the most part, we're, we're dealing with uh, landowners and land managers that are requesting them rather than having them thrust upon them. Perfect. Thank you, Sorno. Yep. Yeah, this is Paul. I just want to reflect what Sorno said. Um, a lot of a lot of our approaches has been we've been trying to maybe in some places take more of an under under the radar approach with the water rights where uh, there are some potential concerns. But uh, and then there are some other places where I think we we would like beavers, but there are some there are quite a few places where we're trying to build these that uh, the Willow and um, Aspen community hasn't recovered. And so these are the first step to, to at least getting the Willow uh, community recovered in some of these really incised streams. Um, but my compliments to Sorno for, uh, for, for, doing this, for doing this proposal and for, for running the project. That, that is one of the things that I neglected to mention Paul brought up is that some of the places we've, we've chosen uh, to do BDAs instead of beavers. Beavers would be great if there was enough forage for them there, but we've kind of got to work on establishing the forage through bringing the water table up and slowing the water and making some, some point bars for willow colonization before we can really think about bringing in the real deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, got a question oh, sorry, for you. Um, this did come through WRI, I saw it, it did, didn't do real well. I think it got a medium ranking. I'm curious if this project only gets $11,000 from Habitat Council, is that going to slow you guys down? Do you guys still have enough work to do uh, for eleven grand, or does it need full funding? Well, it'll slow us down. We'll just have to prioritize which ones fall off the plate. Okay. I've dealt with um, that. Oh, go ahead. I've dealt with that before. I mean, okay. I've, I've had a lot of projects that got half funding, so we just do half the work. <laughs> All right. So um, just as a side note, I, I would, you know, you mentioned we talked about water rights and temporary water rights. Uh, and Tyler can jump in on this conversation, too. Uh, him and I attended a uh, online meeting uh, a couple weeks ago with the, the, the new state engineer and who encouraged us to always get a temporary water right, uh, but definitely follow the regional uh, engineer and their lead on whether to do that or not. We don't want to put ourselves in a situation where uh, we're either being sued or having complaints filed against us, uh, which is a very real possibility if folks are uncomfortable with what we're doing. So be very sensitive to that is what my counsel would be. The other thing I wanted to add to that too, this is Tyler. Um, the one thing that came up in that conversation, we talked a lot about timing, how sometimes it's taking, you know, four to six months to get those permits in place. So I just want to let everybody know, you know, if you have one of these projects coming up and you need the 500 bucks to go do the permit the year before, I think that's something that we can help out with. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. So on this project, we'll entertain a motion. I'd like to do the motion if, we, if everybody doesn't mind. 
Um, just knowing that this project came through WRI didn't do real well. I don't think it's going to get funded through WRI. Um, I'd like to make the motion that we approve it for funding consideration at the full $23,400 to Habitat Council. I second that. This is Drew. Okay, we have a motion to approve the project at the full funding amount from Habitat Council. And we have a second from Drew Cushing. Uh, we're going to go through voting now. Uh, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon. Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing. Yes. Votes yes. Darren West. Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading. I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Paul Burnett votes yes. The motion carries uh, unanimously for full project funding from Habitat Council. Be recommended. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, next project. Uh, 5339 South Fork Junction Creek Fish Passage Project Phase 1. Uh, presenter, go ahead on your project. Do we know who's presenting on this one? I don't. I haven't seen Chance around all day. I can, I can try and wing it. But um, it's a. Okay, go ahead. It's it's removing barriers on the South Fork of Jun Junction Creek in uh, out in West Box Elder County. It's. Uh, primarily for Yellowstone cutthroats. Um, uh, this is this is basically funding the engineering of the main uh, barrier, and then this the the smaller ones. Uh, I think in addition to that, there's there's a, a series of five. The the biggest one is is uh, kind of in the middle. But one of the more important ones is towards the top. And I think Chance worked out a deal with the engineer that if he could do them all at the same time, the engineering of all of them at the same time, he can get a pretty killer deal on it. Um, and then he would actually, uh, they're, they're screens for the most part, except one of them I believe is, is a reconstruction of a culvert. And I'm not sure if he's planning on putting a, a cobble bottom or a, just a, a partially buried, uh, but they, they're pretty substantial barriers. He's going to hold off on the construction of the lowest one until they've determined that what the status of the brown trout population is in the Raft River. Uh, there was a significant number in there a few years ago, but I think he's got plans for some of the upper ones to actually move into the construction phase, in phase two. Some of these aren't really substantial barriers on, on first glance, but at the time of the year when fish are moving, they, they really don't have plunge pools and they are hard for the, the fish to navigate. Now, if he if he's wants to get some of the blue heads up there, he's gonna probably need a little bit more of a, uh, well, I say a little bit less of a drop, substantially less drop and, and get some of those. But I think most of these are for Yellowstone cuts. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I remember from talking to him. Okay, there. yeah. I'm wondering, does Clint, Clint, do you have any input on this project? Yeah, so Chance, I sent him a text to see if he was presenting today. And uh, I, I think Sorno hit all the all the right spots. I mean, we were working. It's it's pretty much a single landowner throughout the basin. Um, what we're trying to do is focus on some of the diversions that he also wants to remove first. That he's gonna he's gonna do, and we want to make sure that they're fish passable before before he goes and spends time and effort doing that we want to make sure that we get a product that will um, be worthwhile instead of just a bunch of new concrete poured in in the stream so um i think 
you know, Chance had that listed out really well where he was putting his money and and what he was trying to do um, throughout throughout this process. He has a number of barriers. We're just trying to knock down some of the low hanging fruit in those and those really good ones kind of in the center to really um, open up some some movement possibilities for fish in, the, in that section. So um, other than that, I, I really don't I think Sorno hit all the all the right spots. OK, great. Are there any questions about the projects for these guys? I just have one. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, fish passage money that's listed as tentative. What exactly does that mean? What, what have you heard from from the Fish and Wildlife Service on that? Um, I think I think some of that is pending how the money that we get through Blue Ribbon and, and Habitat Council, I think, or through Habitat Council. Um, but I I'm not a hundred percent sure on on that part. I don't know if Dorito's still on or not, but um, he might be able to tell tell you why that might be tentative. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that's kind of in the back of my mind. What I have is it just they would they'd chip in as long as we got the funding. So nobody wants to be the first money in. It seems like. Uh, this is Paul. I, I haven't heard specifically about the fish fish passage money. I know that they are interested in working with us out here. Um, I think it's probably just a matter of um, uh, going through the process of develop, developing a proposal. Um, I don't know if it went through just this recent uh, set of proposals that, they, that Fish and Wildlife Service approved. Those were just approved a few weeks ago, so it's possible that that, that has gone through. So we, I can double check on that and, and verify. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions or discussion? Okay, if not, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve. This is Drew. I think it's a great project. I, I just, I've never seen a fish passage money listed as tentative. <laughs> so. Okay, we have a motion from Drew to approve. Is there a second? I'll second, Paul Burnett. Okay, we have a second from Paul Burnett to approve. Go through voting. Uh, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Tyler votes yes. Justin Shannon? Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing? Yes. Darren West? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? I vote yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett? I vote yes. Votes yes. The motion carries uh, to recommend for funding. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next project, last one from Northern Region, uh, Community Fishery Riparian Zone, Shoreline Angler Access and Aquatic Habitat Enhancements, Phase 2, 5387. Yep, uh, can you hear me now? I think I got my mic fixed. Uh, this is Cody Edwards from the Northern Region. Um, what I'll first do is re refresh on the Phase 1 of this project. Um, so over the last year, we've been working on kind of a, a relocation endeavor first was removing invasive plants at Glassman Pond, um, at Seed Pond we're putting in a floating dock, and at Clinton Pond we're installing two uh, adjustable piers uh, to improve angler access. And with that initial phase we reached out to other community uh, leaders, some city leaders and county leaders to encourage them to put forth some sort of effort um, either monetarily or uh, in kind contributions and the, the for the second phase uh, there were two uh, two cities that reached out and put forth a lot of effort over the last year to kind of show um, their investment in these projects um, so then we can move forward to what we're working on in the phase two which is the one we're applying for money for um, it's a it's got two parts to it the first is to improve angler access and the second part is to improve fish habitat and water quality so the two parts of the project that are improving angler access are first, we're hoping to install a dock at Andy Adams. And if you go into the documents, we can show a picture. 
Um, this is a substantial dock. It's going to be between 75 and 100 feet um, protruding from near the boat ramp. Um, Scott Green with uh, Case Creek Irrigation and Michelle McMillan of Layton City have put a lot of effort into this project. And so after seeing the site, uh, let's just go to the two documents. I didn't want to include these as in-kind contributions, uh, but if we can look individually at their contributions. Um, so inside the documents, there should be two more documents, one that should have Scott Green and then one that will have um, Layton City. And so what these are showing is these are showing those investments and contributions that they've put to show that they're willing to invest in these projects and so if we look at scott greens while it's loading um they've put just over ninety thousand into the project and then michelle um they've put a substantial amount as well into last year and i just got a call this morning that they're putting another four thousand in kind which i can add to um this proposal they're purchasing some gravel uh to improve the boat ramp at andy adams um, so that's the first location they put a lot of work into this um, the second community that reached out to us was Jensen uh, or Syracuse City. Um, they've approached us to assist with repairing the shoreline. Um, angler use is pretty heavy at Jensen and it's deteriorating, it's eroded. Um, if you go to the um, documents, there should be a site map of Jensen. And it just highlights the area of the, so, um, Oh, on that one, it doesn't show up very well. Um, but on kind of the northern portion um, of the pond, there's a lot of deterioration. The actual pond liner is showing at this point. And so what I encourage them to do is if they're willing to put forth some money, then we'll step up and try and assist or find funding to repair that shoreline um, by putting in some erosion protection stuff uh, like boulders and then get some material to cover that pond liner. Uh, so their investment was they put in a, um, a fence around the southwestern portion. They call it the nursery. That's an area that's off limits to fishing. Uh, it's just an area that relieves pressure and also allows some of the wildlife to utilize the pond without disruption. Uh, so those are the two angler access parts. Um, and then the third, third and fourth parts of this are habitat improvements. So this isn't specific to one site. This is actually specific to the waters along the Wasatch Front. So we've taken on an effort to try and improve habitat and retain retention of stocked fish by um, putting more habitat in to at least reduce the, the take of, of our stocked fish by cormorants or other predators. Um, so the first part is um, installing habitat at a lot of our fisheries, um, which that's where I think there's 15,000 in the finance for that. And then the other part of that is vegetation. So again, just like Jensen, a lot of our community fisheries suffer from heavy traffic. And so what that means is that periodically we need to go into these fisheries and revegetate, um, fence off those areas to protect the, the vegetation until it's, it's stable enough to withstand uh, any pressures. Um, it's a large project. Um, we hope to continue working with communities and, and improving angler access as well as the fish habitat uh, within our region. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Cody. I'm not hearing any questions. Um, okay. okay. Uh, if there's no questions, I'll entertain a motion. This is Paul Burnett. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. Okay. We have a motion from Paul Burnett to tentatively approve. There's a second. I'll second it. Okay, we have a second from Tyler. Okay, we'll go through voting. Um, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon. I also vote yes. Drew Cushing. Yes. Votes yes. Darren West. Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Votes yes, affirmative on all votes, motion carries. Okay, thank you, thanks Cody. Um, okay, we're gonna go to a central region project, uh, Thistle Creek, watershed restoration and a fire rehab, 5177, uh, you're now on. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, 
Good to see you all. Uh, I like to make a motion that we do it like this every time. <laughs> Very nice. Now, um, thanks everyone for being here. So this one is a, a landscape level um, watershed restoration project in the Thistle Creek uh, watershed. And if you'll just uh, click on that big polygon first off. So that one is just showing uh, some more work we wanna do on the Pole Creek fire. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, mudslides um, flowing onto the highway there. And so uh, because we have a lot of still slopes that are barren, we want potentially we'll reevaluate this summer and see how the regrowth has come in and then do some aerial seeding on that as needed. And that I'm asking for um, uh, $583,000 for that. And that would come out of our, our uh, fire rest uh, rehabilitation funds for that. And so more of what I'm asking funding from this group is the other components. If you'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so start with that little polygon on the top left. Yeah. So that is an area where we did some shrub plantings this last year with Mule Deer Foundation. And we'll continue to do, uh, we'd like to, there's just basically a monoculture of crested wheatgrass there. And so we want to get more shrub habitat in there for our, our winter range for big game. And so we're asking for money to go in there with the dozer and scalp and then seed on that part. You'll click on the stream. Then we've worked with our aquatic section and um, especially our native aquatics, aquatics biologist, um, Keith Lawrence. And we have a southern leatherside chub in here, um, as well as we have a brown trout and a Bonneville cutthroat trout. And um, we would like to build BDAs and just create some diversity of stream habitat in there. Uh, we do have beavers in some of it. And so the BDAs will help the population as well and help them out. Now, if you'll click on the kind of jagged plug on right there, yep. This is uh, an area where we've been working with our wildlife biologist, Rusty Robinson. and um, the in our uh, spring habitat condition evaluations we found that the condition of the winter range here is is really poor um, the sagebrush is getting hammered by the deer and that's partially because there's not a lot available to them but then also um, the numbers of deer are, are more than the habitat can handle and so uh, this portion of the project is to come in with granular plateau, which is an herbicide that will kill the cheatgrass. And as I've gone out there on the ground, I found that the cheatgrass is probably one of the big things keeping the sagebrush community from regeneration, regenerating with younger um, sagebrush. And so we're just having these old plants that are getting hammered by the deer every year and basically turning into um, just really hammered low chewed on shrubs and so um, by getting rid of the cheatgrass I think it'll remove that competition and allow for regeneration of younger plants so we can be able to have uh, maintain the the deer populations that we have there you'll click on the the other polygon so so kind of where that other polygon was is that we have sagebrush there and then moving up the hill slope we're going into the uh, phase two, phase three juniper encroachment, and we've lost the understory. So we'd like to come in and, and bull hog uh, the junipers in there and uh, understory back, which will also provide more uh, forage for the big game and allow us to, to maintain our, our deer populations. So if you want to go to the pictures, So this kind of shows some of the erosion that's happening in there. Um, and we are partnering, partnering with the NRCS on this. And they're bringing a lot of money to build some structures to help with that. Go to the next one. Just some, showing some more of that 
those mud flows. So hopefully if we can get some more uh, grass growing on those upper slopes, it'll reduce the amount of runoff coming down and reduce the, that erosion. Next picture. So it's just showing some of that phase three juniper. Uh, we like to get that understory and increase the amount of forage for a big game. Next slide. And just some more of that encroaching juniper. Next slide. Next one. And it's just showing that cheat grass underneath the sagebrush there that's uh, choking it out and, and preventing re rejuvenation of younger plants. I think that's it. Oh, this is showing the monoculture of crested wheatgrass on our Spencer Fork WMA where we'd like to come in with a dozer and scalp and put in um, more shrub seed. And just where the BDA is, I think building BDAs up here and getting some pond habitat and increasing that wet meadow habitat will also benefit upland game birds, and quail and, and turkeys, as well as our fish populations. So if you wanna to go to the finance page. So there's a lot of things on here, but I, I kind of broke it down. So cultural resource, we're asking for 18,000. Uh, the bull hog portion of the project is 382,000. Uh, the granular plateau is 37,000. BDAs, 16,000. Uh, the shrub restoration part, just $3,000 for seed. And then the fire rehab portion is five by 83. And we'll reevaluate that this summer. So this can go down to what we're looking at from Habitat Council. So it, it, I think, was the highest ranked WRI project. So it should get a lot of funding from that. Um, uh, but also would love Habitat Council to, to be a partner on it. OK, thank you, Robbie. Yeah. Are there any questions on this project? So Robbie, this is Paul Burnett. I have a, a couple of questions um, about the BDA. Um, do you have an estimate of kind of numbers of, of what you want to construct? And then um, I noticed that the the creek on the lower reaches looks like it's really been channelized. Are, are the landowners okay with what might happen with BDAs down there? Yeah, so I've I just highlighted pretty much the entire watershed from where we're having uh, wildfire impacts upstream. So I we're not going to do any work down below Nebo Creek where we're still getting uh, big flows from the fire. So we're just gonna work up upstream from there. And I'm working with Chelsea Larson from NRCS to contact those landowners. And I'm, I'm hoping we'll get a lot of them on board. Um, but then we'll also work on our WMA and then on the Forest Service. And I've already worked with the Forest Service. So um, I have money in there to build approximately, uh, you know, 100 BDAs about is what I'm hoping to do this first year uh, with contracting help and and then go from there. But I just identified the whole stream, so. Thank you. Hey, any other questions? This is Dwayne. I have a question on the granular plateau. Isn't that gonna kill everything there? Or just the cheatgrass? Yeah, great question. So um, it's the same as plateau, um, just in a granular form. And plateau is a, a pre emergent, so it just kills, uh, stops the plants from germinating. So it'll attack just those annual plants. And um, so we, we've been using the herbicide for a long time, just the liquid form. Um, but with that thick uh, shrub, cover and thatch, I'm hoping we'll get better results with the granular form where it can actually drop down through the canopy and, and hit the ground. So it'll hit the ground and then as we get moisture, it'll seep, seep into the soil and prevent that cheatgrass seed from germinating next year is, is the hope. So yeah, we're hoping to target as best we can just the cheatgrass.
Thanks, Robbie. Anything else? That's all I have. Okay. I entertain a motion on this project. This Darren West, I uh, motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay, we have a motion from Darren West to tentatively approve. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it, Eric. This is Justin. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Justin Shannon seconds the motion. Uh, we'll go to voting. So, uh, Tyler Thompson? I vote yes. Tyler votes yes. Justin Shannon? Yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing? Yes. Votes yes. Darren West? Uh, yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. I vote yes. Yes. Thank you. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett? I vote yes. Votes yes. Thank you. Uh, affirmative, all affirmative in voting, and the motion carries. Okay. Right, thank you, guys. Thanks, Robbie. All right. Hey, Eric. Uh, yeah. This is, this is Drew. I just had a question for Tyler just about fire related projects. So uh, this was a great project, but there's a lot of uh, fire damage just adjacent to the a lot of the projects that Robbie uh, is working on or going to work on here. Uh, was there any opportunity that you could see to tie that together into one big uh, fire related project? A lot of the erosion problems, I would assume, are because of the high flows in recent years. Yeah, I mean, there's all the work that we did immediately after the fire up there. Uh, we're just taking our cues from the region at this point as to what else needs to happen um, as far as damage. And just a little word about the fire rehab funding. So the past couple of years, we have received a little bit of funding up front. Um, we did receive another million dollars up front this year. And then we'll go back and ask for any additional funding that we need after the fire season's over. So this project, along with anything else that has fire-related damage, um, will be eligible for that funding. Does that include some of those adjacent uh, areas that Robbie's working on here? Yeah, if you can tie whatever you're doing in a project to damage from fire, then it'll be eligible for those special fire rehab funds. And I guess it's up to Robbie and the aquatics guys if they want to tie projects together, if they want to go separately. I always like to see them tied together as much as possible. Um, but I guess it's up to them. I guess I can just talk to a little bit. Um, yeah, this, I don't think Chris is asking for any more money on his Nebo Creek this next year. Um, so they're just kind of waiting to see how things go. Um, but then this would be, we're, this is more targeting uh, up, upstream, I guess. So whatever the reseeding effort will be directed to the fire. But then the in-stream work, I just, I'm staying away from the fire and the in-stream portion, just staying upstream of where the fire impacts are because we feel like there's still gonna be a lot of flows going in there that would just wipe out the BDAs. Um, Robbie, can you speak to what the county's doing? I know the county's gotten a substantial amount of money from the NRCS to help with a lot of that damage as well. Yeah, so Chelsea Larson from the NRCS is working uh, with the counties and landowners to, uh, they're gonna build a lot. That's kind of what I was alluding to, uh, building a lot of uh, erosion control, control structures um, and, and things like that, debris basins and so. I don't know all the specific details on on what exactly she's doing on that, but it's quite a few projects in that realm. So. Okay, thanks everybody. Is there any any additional questions for Robbie? All right, we'll entertain a motion at this time. We already approved it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I will say real quick, uh, I'll, I'll keep working with the aquatic section for down the road when, so we will put any work that they want to do probably into just one big one forward. Okay. Thanks for approving okay. that. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to move to the next project. 
uh, our one from Southeast region. So our central region folks for being on with us. Robbie, thanks for that. Um, 5357 Helper River Revitalization uh, Phase 6. That's a lot of phases. Uh, a lot up. of phases. This is Eric McCulley. Phase 6 out of 6. That is a lot of phases. Um, the Helper River Revitalization Project started in 2013 report and identified a, a bunch of um, fish passage issues and, and garbage in the river and um, now we're and uh, to the last major phase of this project um, and you can see there are some um, the other phases are uh, downstream and then gelati pond is in red up here um, Daniel, can you show that video that I sent to you? Would that be possible? I we got a we're just finishing phase five right now, and um, some locals are excited about it. And um, so I sent something to Daniel. Are you going to be able to um, Daniel or? Okay, while, right, while you're able to see it on the screen. A different, um, you might be at a different window. Yeah, you'll have to share that window, Daniel. Give me a second. Yep. So we're just finishing phase five, which is the, um, the next uh, dot downstream. Um, actually, it's a blue dot um, downstream of this and um, some some local enthusiasts are are um, getting after it on the creek right now. So, um, up oh, Daniel, I'll, oh, I, all right, Daniel, it's thinking about it. It's thinking about it. While you're doing that, um, if it doesn't come up, I don't know if it, maybe, can I present this, Daniel? Would that work? All right, All right. can folks see this? I'm gonna present this screen because I think it's, um, not coming up for Daniel. Oh. Sorry, guys. I'll uh, I apologize for this. Um, I, let me see. Um, and then okay. I'll move past this um, very soon. If it doesn't work, we're having our minor technological issues here. If it doesn't work, maybe we could all just admire Paul's craft room. <laughs> I like craft room. I'm not sure if he's going to do anything on Pinterest or not, but that's great, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. I think yeah. we nice. job at home. <laughs> Yeah, right you're not seeing you're not seeing where the real work is done on you know on the flip side of the camera here. All right, there we go. I can see a video. Oh, come on. So maybe not. Um, you can see that there used to be a um a diversion that we took out right here for the um. I was hoping for actually the, the better video, which is just after this. And um, it, it looks like it's not going to happen for me. So anyway, we um, there was some people, some locals coming down through the river on uh, on duckies with their kids. So. So um, this multi phase project has um, has allowed basically. Be opened up for. Um, it's about 
uh, six miles through uh, the city of Helper. And uh, we're going back to Daniel's screen. All right, there we go. Um, and this is the last, the last um, project. So if you could go to images and documents, go to uh, documents and pull up um, the memo, the phase six memo. Um, so what you can see here is um, there's a, a, a view from above at the top there and then a, a view of this um, obsolete irrigation structure. It, it's about 12 vertical feet and um, it, it creates a, an unnatural angle in the river um, and, and the benefits will be for um, and other uh, fish through here and then people. Um, in the end, this will basically open up, um, there'll be six, 6.2 miles of river that are opened after this. So basically from Carbon Canal um, up to um, where you can see um, the Price Canyon. Um, so we've reestablished um, about five miles downstream, another 0.7 miles of aquatic habitat reconnected upstream. So why don't we go to the, um, uh, the concept PDF. The, uh, this is the cost opinion for the whole thing. It's basically concept. So this is right around Gelati Pond and it's about a quarter mile of the Price River. Two um, little arcs are proposed to be um, grade control structures. Uh, we're shooting for about um, a one foot drop or so each of these structures um, and that will provide passage for bluehead suckers. Um, so let's go back to the, yeah, the and look at the Price River Sampling Report. So folks from the um, Division of Wildlife Resources went out there this year and, uh, and sampled some um, did some fish sampling and they found Colorado River cutthroat uh, between nine and 13 inches and um, bluehead and mountain suckers were throughout the whole reach. So um, people are really starting to um, enjoy the river there and uh, we're opening up a lot of angling opportunities and then there's opportunities for folks to, to come down the river um, as well during these high flow times. We did have uh, one of the locals who is just down below town. Um, him and his kids were floating through on duckies and, and that was what the video is. So I'll try to get that loaded on if anyone's interested. But um, they're just finishing it this week. And, uh, and so I guess these are uh, understanding that. So um, so why don't we go back to the, um, the finance. Um, so this is a any project that that helper has um you know trying to undertake and it's it's the last one and, and for good reason because it is a 12 foot about 60 feet wide um and, and so it's a significant piece of obsolete infrastructure to take out the obsolete infrastructure and then uh to put a river back in its place and um this will be the last of six. There'll, there'll probably still be some maintenance um, required, but um, this is, is basically it for the big infrastructure. So if you go down to funding, rest is for 125,000 from the Habitat Council. Um, we're working on a bunch of other funding sources, um, and this is probably gonna take about two years to implement the whole project, but, um, for now, we're trying to just um, keep the momentum. Five different projects, um, Target Basin for 319 and EPA. So we've been working with those guys and outdoor recreation and, and other groups to um, to implement this pretty pretty big project here to wrap things up. So um, questions or wants me to go into any other detail, let me know. Hey, Eric, this is Paul Burnett. I have a question. Do you have a, a typical drop structure picture uh, that you can show us? Is that what you showed earlier in the presentation or is it something different? Um, back to the other 
um, projects like phase five um, would, would probably be a um, drop structure. It's basically like a rocky ramp that is about um, 11 feet across. So this is phase five, which was just completed. And then um, I don't know if there's there's kind of a rendition uh, somewhere in there of of uh, proposed after. Um, it, it's basically it's they're pretty um, structures there. You know they span the whole river, and it's like a rock arch, and the and the crest is about cross. Um, so similar to um, you know some of these other um, grade control projects that we've. Um, Yes, it's hard to see the um, under there, but there's uh, this is uh, phase four where there were um, five of these structures put in, and they basically span the channel, uh, uh, upward facing you, a crest and different swim pathways going through. So they hold grade control, and then um, the idea is to have uh, swim pathways at at ver various flows, and then. At lower flows, it's going to be um, the middle. So, um, but I, I can, if you want, I can put, um, I can find a, a, a typical concept um, of the cross section from our phase five project. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. No, I was just curious if you if you had been have gotten that far down on the design to. to to show something like that, but I, I think I get the idea. Mm. Any other questions? Uh, my other question would be to Tyler, how did this rank in WRI? I, I see that there's quite a bit of WRI funding on this one. So Eric and I have spoken about this. It did not rank very well. It actually came out low. And the main reason is because the project fell outside of the current focus area. That yeah, was just an oversight on our part. Um, I believe that if it comes back next year, um, it will do a lot better through WRI. And hearing from Eric that it's a two-year project, um, maybe WRI funding can come in the second year to help get this done. Yes, um, and so we... This start, helper started as um, one of the highest rank projects at, at phase two, and then it dropped to the middle and then it dropped to low um, because you know there's no catastrophic wildfire benefit or very little. So um, limited livestock grazing. And so it doesn't hit some of the main, you know, focal points for um, high ranking. And so... Um, you know we're we're doing the best we can, but it, it's uh, we're we're not keeping up with the times, I guess. On um, uh, you know the the changing things, but um, or changing um, grading. But let me show you um, this real quick. It, um, uh, sorry, the uh, I guess not. Well, I'll put one of the. Um, the phase five uh, drop structures into the project folder so people can take a look at that if they want. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one, Eric. This is Justin. Um, I've, I've been to the pond quite a few times, but I've never been on that river. Is there public access to it? Right now. Um, because this structure is, um, it's pretty dangerous, you know, at, at, at high flows, especially. So if you go into the parking lot at Gelati Pond, you can stand up on a rock and look over there. It's a nasty looking structure. So there's, they put a fence up basically to keep people away from the river. It would be to, you know, enhance that access around Gelati Pond and make it more like you can fish the river or you can fish the pond. Um, together, but right now it's behind a um, chain link fence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any final discussion or questions for Eric? Thank you. If not, we'll uh, look for a motion.
Uh, sorry, I have one more question. Um, Eric, do you have, so since, since you're not getting WR money, do you, are you able to break this out into um, being able to uh, get something on the ground or design this fiscal year with the money that you're requesting from Habitat Council? Yes. Um, the idea is that we, we kind of cut this up into multiple phases. Um, we're also uh, requesting funding from 319 um, because it is the focus basin. Um, we can definitely move the project along and, and do as much as we can uh, on the ground with the funding that becomes available. So there's a you know, bunch of different requests going out there and talking to the legislature and others. So um, yes, we can absolutely move the project along with, with any amount of funding. And, you know, if we have enough funding, we can start to do some of the structures. You know, we'd love to do the project as one large, um, you know, project all together where we just take care of everything, but project to get done all at once. So we cut it into smaller pieces. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this for funding consideration. I think this has been a great project and I'd love to see this continue. Thank you, Paul. We have a motion to tentatively approve. I'll, I'll second it. Eric, this is Justin. Thank you, Justin. We have a second. Okay, we're going to go through uh, voting. Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Okay, Justin Shannon. Yes. <laughs> Drew Cushing. Yes. Thank you, Drew. Darren West. Yes. Thank you, Darren. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Thank you, Jack Ray. Yes. Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Okay, the voting is all in affirmative. The motion to recommend passes. Thank you, Eric. And thank you. Okay. Thank you. We're moving on to the next project. Um, okay. 5374 Willow Lake Fence, you're up. This is uh, Calvin Black with the division again. Um, yeah, Daniel, if you could pull up the map. That's perfect. Um, Willow Lake is a um, small reservoir um, up Barron Canyon on the Mount Isla South National Forest. The uh, um, dam and the water are all owned by the division. And so we are in charge of maintaining the, the dam and also the fence line around it. And uh, we've, uh, we've been working with the forest over the last several years on patching this fence um, that's currently around it. It's a um, rail, two rail pole fence. Um, a large chunk of it is now being um, held together by baling wire um, just because of it uh, falling apart. Uh, you can see the uh, the footprint of this this of uh, the the fence line. The south end of the reservoir that's a real steep uh, hillside, and uh, a lot of times uh, cattle and stuff and ATVs can't get up in there. And that's our biggest issue right now is we've got trespass livestock and ATVs driving up on the dam face and uh, causing some erosional issues where. Um, if we don't replace this fence entirely, uh, we're going to have to redo a, a good chunk of the dam. And so we're trying to do a preventative measure here and, and put in a good sturdy uh, long-term fence with a steel piped fence. Um, it's approximately one mile length of uh, fence line that we want to um, replace. Uh, we're in the existing footprint of the former fence that uh, the division helped pay for uh, about 25, 30 years ago. Um, the forest just recently uh, got back with me and they are going to be a partner on this project and they will actually fence the back side of the reservoir now. So those three points, those uh, at the end of the fence line, uh, the forest is going to look at a, um, a lay down cattle explosion fence across that face uh, for their part of this project and actually and close the entire reservoir. Um, and so, um, so we do have a partner with the forest now um, on this. Um, if you can go to the images, 
Um, the first picture, kind of hard to see, but that's the, uh, the original fence. Uh, this was last May. Um, again, our biggest issue is uh, the posts are so rotted away. Um, as soon as a cow or a, lion or a horse leans up against it, the railings fall down, they walk through. Um, the portions that are, are solid, we have had uh, ATV riders and um, four-wheel drive guys chainsaw sections of the, the uh, fence out and drive their trucks up on the dam to fish off the dam. So that's why we're looking at a steel pole fence to keep um, people into the parking areas. Um, you can see the road right there next to it. You're talking 25 to 50 yards from the parking areas. It's not that far to walk, but uh, um, um, but uh, what's, that's what we're looking at. So uh, budget-wise, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so this is a, a picture of the style of fence that we want to put in. This is a fence that I installed down by Monticello a couple of years ago. Uh, one more picture of there, Dan. Thank you. That's a kind of an up close picture. It's wildlife friendly. Uh, yeah, um, smaller calves and stuff can get through, but they're not the major issue of causing a lot of erosion on um, that those faces of that dam. And so that's uh, that fence line has been approved by the forest uh, before, and they agree that this is what they'd like to see around this little reservoir. Um, so currently, we're uh, we've got sixty thousand um, dollars. Slated towards this project from uh, our dam safety and dam maintenance funds from our state and regional offices. Uh, we're seeking an additional 15,000 just to make sure we have enough to cover um, extra costs or any costs higher than um, for the steel pipe fence. So um, that's that's what we're looking for today. Great, thanks, Calvin. Uh, questions. All right, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve. This is Drew. Thank you, Drew. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. We have a second from Tyler. We'll go through the voting. Uh, Tyler already seconded the motion. So Justin Shannon? Yes. Thank you. Drew already made the motion. So Darren West? Yes. Is a yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Is a yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Thank you. And Paul Burnett? I vote yes. Thank you. So the motion passes. Uh, full affirmation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Calvin. All right. Um, I want to thank our Southeast region folks for being online with us. So now we're going to move to uh, our southern region, we're in the home stretch, folks. Um, project 5213, um, aquatic and riparian improvement on the lower Beaver River near Minersville Reservoir. Go ahead. So this is a great way to all uh, present for this project. Um, so this is a section of the Beaver River we've been working on for a few years. The town of Beaver, yeah, if you'll zoom in, zoom in, Daniel, uh, it's right below Minersville Reservoir. And so um, if you look at kind of the whole big long black polygon along the river corridor, about 75% of that, the lower 75% is a stretch of river that we've already worked on. And this project would involve some maintenance for that, um, specifically retreating some Russian olive and tamarisk and then coming in and fixing some stream banks and structures and fence um, that we've had some issues with after flooding uh, last spring. So the reservoir filled and spilled and, and we had some pretty extreme flooding early last summer. So part of the project would be for maintenance, but the majority of the cost is the top or the upstream to the east by the reservoir that 25% of the polygon is where we'd be working. And that's a new section that we haven't worked on yet. Um, that's a, it's a private landowner that we're working with through there, but he signed up through our walk-in access program. He's been signed up for quite a while, probably more than 10 years. And so public access isn't an issue there. But um, so 
maybe Daniel, if you could go to the images or pictures, that'll probably be easiest. And we can look at those and I'll kind of describe the work. So this is a before picture. This is the section where we'll be working. So this is kind of just a typical stream bank. So it's the bare vertical eroding banks going straight up into like rabbit brush, sagebrush, um, no real habitat, no riffle run pool sequence, just pretty homogenous. Uh, next picture, similar stream bank. Um, so this is just kind of a typical bank where we want to go in and work and improve the habitat. So maybe the next picture. Um, so this picture and the next one just show um, some of the Russian olive. So the areas where we haven't done the Russian olive treatments, it's just, it's really dense. It's hard to um, even recreate in there. It's just so overgrown with the Russian olive and tamarisk that you can't do much. Uh, next picture. All right, next picture. Uh, so here's a stream bank we were working on in an earlier phase of the project. So you can see some of the structures we're putting in right there. The excavators putting in some um, some logs. We've been able to utilize the. It's a lot of big old Russian olive, and we've been able to strip the branches off and use the trunks and root wads for habitat as well. So you can see instead of it just being homogenous, there's some pools and riffles and and better habitat. Next picture. Uh, same thing, just putting in some structures there. Next picture. So here, so we, we'd hire a Conservation Corps crew to come in and help with some of the retreatment and spraying. Most of the, the new or the initial treatment we do with the excavator ripping it out and then we'll either pile it and burn it or we'll chip it and spread it. Next picture. We'll have those, we'll hire some Conservation Corps crews to do some planting as well. Here's some little stakes. The plantings we've done in there have done really well. Uh, next picture. Um, so I think it's just kind of a general uh, picture of some past work we've done. Next picture. Uh, so we'll also um, install a riparian fence and implement some new grazing management. So this is an earlier phase of the project. And so you can see the difference between the fence in and, and have a grazing management plan in place. And then on the, the left is the section we haven't worked on yet. Next picture. Uh, here's some willow plantings. Like I said, the, we've been just planting willow stakes, but they've done really well. Um, this is just a few months after we planted. Next picture. Um, so just some fish, fish pictures. It's a really popular area, especially with local people. There's some good brown trout and rainbow trout fishing. And eventually we'd like to try and get southern leatherside chubs back in. Um, they're historically, um, they were in this section of the Beaver River, but there aren't any, any there right now. But Hopefully, if we improve the habitat, we can reintroduce them. Next picture. Uh, so like I mentioned, we had some extreme flooding uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And um, so we've lost some of our, our fences and, and banks. Most of the stuff held up, but we do need to do some repair work. Next picture. So we can cycle through these pictures fairly quick. This is just showing most, like I said, most of the stuff held, but there are some banks we need to work on. So there's some before and after flooding, showing a bank that didn't make it. Um, but then here are some pictures of, of banks that did survive and are doing well. So the, the whole idea for that upper 25% that I showed you is just to continue with the, the work we've been doing. Yeah, so these are just all kind of stream bank pictures. And then we've got a couple uh, pictures showing the, the Russian olive treatment better. So here's a before after, so you can see how dense it was with the Russian olive before and then afterwards. All right, next picture. So that's it on. So hopefully that gives you an idea of exactly what the project is. We 
so a total budget, I, I think we're about 130,000 were um, total. Um, and so we've got about 60,000 from NRCS. That's mostly to help with the rush and olive and fence. And then uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is also contributing some money, about $12,000. We're also gonna try and apply for some money, um, some non-point source money through um, water quality. And then we, the rest of the money we need, we split kind of between Habitat Council and WRI. So from Habitat Council, we're asking for about 21,000. And I think it, it scored pretty well with WRI. I think it was in the, Kind of the middle or lower half of the um, of the green rankings for WRI or the the top projects. Are there any questions? Okay. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate your time. Um, any discussion? Okay. Um, we'll look to a motion then, maybe. I move that we tentatively approve the project. I'll second. Okay. Jack, thank you. Uh, Make, making a motion to approve the project, recommend for funding, and we have a second from Tyler. Um, go to voting. Uh, Tyler already seconded. Justin Shannon? Yes. Thank you. Drew Cushing? Yes. Thank you, Drew. Darren West? Yes. Thank you, Darren. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Thank you. Jack already made the motion. Uh, Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, had couldn't help but thinking while you were making that presentation about taking out all the Russian olive that maybe somebody in your southern region might have planted them all there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Just don't tell them we're back we're doing that. Okay. <laughs> I won't say anything. All right, next project, uh, 5250, uh, Henryville Creek Riparian Invasive Species Restoration. Go. Do we know who's on for this project? Can you hear me now? Okay, we got you, Stan, thanks. Okay, sorry, I got a new headset and I'm still figuring it out. Okay. It's not very cool, this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So yeah, this is the Henryville uh, Creek Riparian uh, Watershed Project. So this is on private land, just located south of Henryville um, in Garfield County. So a landowner approached us. Um, he'd seen the work that we'd done over on uh, the Escalante River and he approached um, that group and, and they in turn brought Clint Weirich and myself on board. So anyways, it's about 22 acres of Russian olive removal adjacent to some agricultural fields. Uh, this is the, the landowner has applied for NRCS funding too. And um, so it, it as of right now, I, I'd be very surprised if it didn't get funded, but Anyways, um, it's heavily used by turkeys. Uh, there is a lot of good things going on. A lot of the stuff that we, we usually deal with on the Escalante is um, a lot of really old growth um, tamarisk and Russian olive to the point that basically we're starting from ground zero once we uh, remove it. Here, there's a lot of young cottonwood. There's a lot of uh, grasses, forbs, um, native grasses and forbs that are well established and it's doing quite well. We're just at that or that verge where if we wait much longer, it will be gone. So like I said, NRCS funding is is there. It's through the Southwest Willow Flycatcher Initiative. 
um, that NRCS has. Uh, we want to look through a few pictures. So the pictures kind of make it look worse than it really is, but we were just there last week and it, it I re, reconfirmed my feelings. So anyways, there's a, this is a wetland behind it. And some of those Russian olives are on a neighboring private landowner. Um, we are gonna, we're hoping this project springboards more work on the Henry Creek drainage and then potentially the Perea River. Go ahead, Daniel, and go to the next picture. So again, this is just looking into it. Um, some of these areas are super thick, but you can see the cottonwoods in the back. Um, there's poplars too that are in, in there. There's young and old. There's willows still in there. With the NRCS, we're planning on doing some stream bank uh, um, work too. We basically, in some cases, a heavy flooding, we can get um, the stream bank washing away. And so we're looking to armor that. And that's something that the NRCS will just pay for. So um, pretty cheap project, relatively, con considering um, what a Russian olive project usually costs. So uh, we're looking for, I asked initially for $2,000 from Habitat Council. I, I'd like to point out some of the partnering funds, NRCS, Green 20, 21.5, and then Fish and Wildlife Service, $10,000. So um, we're, we're looking just for a little bit of funds and any, any, anything helps. The landowner is committed to do it even without additional funds. So any questions? Thanks, Dan. Looks like uh, any additional discussion? Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll take a crack at a motion on this. Uh, this one also came through WRI, came through and was ranked low. So I'd like to make a motion to include both the WRI and Habitat Council funding. So move it to funding consideration at $19,766.80 from Habitat Council. Okay, we have a motion to increase the funding to include both WRI and Habitat Council portions to $19,000. Uh, do we have any discussion or second on that motion? Um, before we second, we should maybe look at the uh, percentages of Habitat Council on that. But maybe I missed it. I'm assuming the upland game is the turkey population there, so I'm good with that. Okay. Um, I'll second the motion. Okay. We have a second on the motion from Paul Burnett. We'll go to voting now. Um, Tyler, you already made the motion, so Justin Shannon? Uh, yes. Votes yes. Drew Cushing? Yes. Votes yes. Darren West? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Thank you. And Paul Burnett had already seconded the motion, so the motion carries. Um, to increase the funding to 19,000, include both the WRI and Habitat Council portion to recommend to fund that way. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you. we're going to take a five minute break. Somebody strongly encouraged that we do that. <laughs> so we're going to take a five minute break. We'll be back on at 241. Thank you.
Okay. We'll give people just a few more seconds, another minute here. And we'll be back on. <clears throat> All right. Okay, we're going to go to the next project. Um, 5295 cutthroat trout migration barriers and maintenance. Yeah, so this is Stan Beckstrom again. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Are we ready to go, Eric? Um, yes. Okay. Stan, on your project up, we're ready to go. Go for it. Okay. Um, so this is similar to projects you've heard in the past as far as building these fish barriers on streams for the restoration of either Bonneville cutthroat trout or Colorado River cutthroat trout. Um, so this is a cup, this project this year is for building two new barriers and then doing some maintenance work on three other barriers. Uh, so the first barrier would be on the East Fork of the Severe River down on the Pontagon Plateau above Tropic Reservoir. Uh, we have treated and reestablished cutthroat trout in a couple of tributary streams. This is another barrier that we need to build. It's a temporary barrier, but we need to isolate the very top reach and then we can treat it and reestablish fish in there as well. And then this would be another source population that we can use to reestablish cutthroat trout lower in the East Fork Severe when we do the rest of the system up there. When this system is, is all completed, it's about 30 to 35 miles of new um, Bonneville cutthroat trout conservation population. Um, that would be the first barrier. It'd have to be built out of concrete blocks. That always adds a little bit of, to the cost. But, um, so there'd be that barrier. The second barrier is on UM Creek. It's up by Loa. Uh, UM Creek already has a Colorado River cutthroat trout population established above Forsyth Reservoir. And if you zoom back out a little bit, Daniel, um, a little bit more. There's Forsyth Reservoir there at the top of the map. And up above that, there's a fish barrier and we have Colorado River cutthroat trout in that stream above there. Um, recently, we found some rainbow trout in Forsyth Reservoir. They're not supposed to be in there, but um, there were some in there. So the concern is that if rainbows get established in Forsyth, they could move above that barrier in the UM Creek and uh, hurt our fear strain Colorado cutthroat trout population. And we think that those uh, rainbow trout actually came out of Mill Meadow Reservoir is the lower reservoir there. And there's nothing to, we always thought that the dam was a barrier on Forsyth, but we recently looked at it and decided it's not really a barrier. So there's, uh, it could easily be rainbow trout moved from Mill Meadow up to Forsyth. So we wanna build that another rock barrier, loose rock barrier down by Mill Meadow Reservoir to prevent any fish coming out of there and moving up to Forsyth and then reducing the risk of them getting up into further up into UM Creek. So that's that barrier. Um, the other part of this project is just doing some maintenance on, so that, that's the East Fork Severe site where we would build the barrier. And then the other picture is the UM Creek site where we would build the barrier. But the other part is we have three barriers up on North Creek up by Beaver. And uh, these, these barriers, um, Last year, the high water did a little bit of damage. We've been in there and repaired them a little bit, but there was still so much water, we just weren't able to 
repair the concrete pads that go on the bottom of the barriers. So we'd use a little bit of money from this project to go in and repair those pads. One pad is completely washed out, it disappeared, and the other two just has some holes in them that need to be patched up. Um, so these are just, this is just another project to expand cutthroat trout populations and keep the ones that we have intact as well. So it looks like um, the total cost is an estimated 33,800 and that would just be all Habitat Council. Okay, is there any uh, discussion from the council or questions? Okay, if not, we'll maybe look for a motion here. This is Drew. I'll move to approve this project. Okay, thank you, Drew. We have a motion to approve the project. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Jack. We have a second from Jack Ray. And look to the roll call for voting. Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon. My vote is yes as well. Votes yes. Drew made the motion, so to go to Darren West. Yes. Okay, thank you, Darren. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Votes yes. Jack seconded the motion, so we'll go to Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Votes yes. The motion uh, is approved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to move to the last one from our southern region, uh, southern region riparian restoration, 5348. Go ahead, you're on. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. All right, well, this is the probably about the sixth or seventh iteration of this. We started this in in the WRI database in 2014, but the program really started in the 2012. Um, essentially, this is our, our beaver management program for the southern region. It's um, what we what we're trying to do is hire seasonal employees to help us with uh, nuisance beaver, and at the same time move the uh, the nuisance beaver into places where they're not going to cause so much problems. So this map um, shows probably about. 55 to 60 dots there. So these are all locations that have uh, been submitted by multiple uh, agencies, mostly the Forest Service and DWR as sites that are potential areas where beavers could have some good ecosystem benefits. Um, so we have kind of a, this project um, really and over time has really been refined. Um, and I should give credit to Heather Talley for being kind of the architect of this. She kind of built this from the ground up and now we've got, it's kind of turned into something that's, that I think we have pretty well re refined anyway. Um, the process of choosing these sites um, is basically we get this big list, kind of a spreadsheet and then we sit down with wildlife, aquatics, and habitat, and we all rank them out. Uh, you know, priority one, two, and three. And then, due to some of our success with the Forest Service, especially on the Ponsagon, um, all the other uh, ranger districts have really become excited about getting getting beaver on their on their mountain. Um, so they also submitted a list. So what we kind of did, and Daniel, if you'll go to the uh, the documents page, and yeah, if you can go to that priority map, that second one. Okay, so here was kind of how we broke down our um, priority areas. Um, and as you can see, basically any place that the division had as a top priority and the Forest Service had as a top priority 
kind of made like the top 15. So those ones in reds, red are kind of the top 15 um, spots that we have uh, for beaver reintroduction. Um, and uh, if you go to the documents page again, that just priority streams list. Yeah, so here, here's how it kind of fell out. Um, we've got pretty much a spot to go to in each ranger district on the Fish Lake and the Dixie. And as you can see from this list, really we've been targeting our, our uh, translocation to areas that have really specific needs. And those are either fire rehab, um, riparian restoration for Bonneville cutthroat and Colorado River cutthroat. Um, we also have one that's gonna be for Arizona toad and desert sucker and rainbow trout. Um, basically what I'm saying with this is we've, we've picked spots that are high enough up on the hill that they're not gonna be a nuisance and they're all tied to some sort of ongoing uh, forest and division program um, for habitat um, improvement, for wildlife habitat, that is. Okay, so if you wanna go to the, um, the pictures, Daniel, you can just kind of start there. Um, so, one of the things I should mention about this project is this was not an easy um, thing to to sell at first. We had a lot of pushback from counties, um, and but we're now at a point through uh, you know through a lot of uh, talks with counties that the counties are actually requesting some areas to get beaver. Um, so when we do pick these areas, we're not just picking them because we want them. Anyway, um, we're making sure we've got water users on board, uh, county commissioners, forest rangers. Um, so it's a pretty detailed process. But so this picture you're seeing right now, um, this, was at, this is actually on Bunker Creek, which was affected by the Bryan Head fire. And so this is after we put beaver here, this was actually a site that was requested by Garfield County, which at one time not long ago would not allow us to put beaver in the county. And now we've got evidence that we've translocated them and they're staying um, on Bunker Creek here. So this is more evidence of, of them staying on Bunker Creek. Um, and this, this program, I think I stole this picture from a webinar that Sorno did, and I don't think I really need to go over, you know, all the all the benefits that beaver have. But um, for all the benefits they have, they sure do bring some problems too. So this project really isn't just about all this habitat improvement. It's it's also about the nuisance. Um, we we want to use the the beaver plan to its fullest, and if we have to kill trap, we have to kill trap. Um, it's, there's some areas where they just don't um, do well and um, some areas where they do. Anyway, so this project also is going to be paying for all the quarantine and processing of these beavers um, in-house at our southern region uh, quarantine facility that you can see right now. Um, we got jet tubs for them and everything. Um, and as you can see, going through these pictures, uh, Southern region is very hands-on uh, when it comes to, to uh, nuisance beaver management and translocation. So we've been putting these BHF uh, tags on, on pretty much every beaver we can, as, as many tags as we have, can. And then Annette, our uh, veterinarian, comes down as well to take vitals and, and to everything's um, if Teresa or if Heather is on this we speak to more of the nuance of the tracking the handling um, they want to anyway it's so 
to get in on it. It's a it's a really cool program. Grown in into some, you know, we, we've good, good with a lot, a lot of the local um, the different for and now we're trying to just spread out the beaver to we can, but if you know, because if they do get um, in trouble, we're committed to uh, you know taking action to to stop that um, conflict. I don't know if and uh, go to the video, but maybe we, uh, here's there's a video that might just be a link. Able to play it or not? It might take a while to download. Yeah, it looks like it's going. Anyway, this video, if it does show or not, um, is just a, a quick clip of us releasing a beaver on the uh, on the Pavant on in the Fillmore Ranger District, and um, it's a cool video because it kind of shows, you know, the the beaver finding its way and uh, has the VHF tag like that. Um, so that's unless uh, well, there we go. Yeah, I apologize if that quality is not very good on everyone else's end, but you'll see the flash of its tag when he comes out here. To mention, since this program has been going on, started on the Ponsagant Plateau and it was really tied to and cutthroat. And um, since the first ones we put up, well, um, in, in 2018 and 19, we had breeding the spot that we put the beavers and near the Podunk guard station. Since then, we've, you know, our uh, translocations in concert with uh, BDAs. Um, and we also are going to be monitoring these VHF. Um, having our seasonals go out after the season and finding the um, beaver to see if they're still there. Um, obviously, they're not always still there, um, but we have found them using the VHFs, um, sorry, VHF. And uh, this last year, I think we got about 25 that we moved. Um, the year before that, we had uh, about 55. So it's kind of a moving target there. Um, I think since 2012, we've moved probably, let's see, around 172 beavers since 2012. So um, this project really hasn't changed a lot from last year. I think we're asking for one more truck. And I think we've only, we were told that we can only have two. So it might be just two in the budget there. But these seasonals are going to be crucial for handling our our nuisance issues in the southern southern region. So we're asking for two full time seasonals and one part time seasonal. Um, also, just I should mention on the monitoring as well, we've had um, Wild Utah and their rapid um, stream assessment program. They've asked us to 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 on one of our translocation sites. They've asked us to do a uh, one of their trainings there, so we will get some uh, post uh, or pre-translocation data and post-translocation data. Um, and other than that, if unless Teresa or Heather has anything else they'd like to add, um, I'll open it up to questions. And one more thing, I, this this project did rank high in the WRI database. Uh, this is Drew. I have maybe maybe an odd question. 
taking care of nuisance animals seems a reach for Habitat Council funds. I, I'm not sure whether that's just me and a, and a philosophy difference, but uh, how does that tie into a Habitat project? Well, the way I see it happening is we pick a place to take those nuisance beavers to that they're going to actually improve the habitat. And, and I think we've proven that we've taken these nuisance beavers to areas and they've created habitat for boreal toad and for fish and for, you know, a myriad of species. So it's kind of turning a negative into a positive, I guess, is the way I look at it. J Drew, can I weigh in on this? This is Justin. Yeah. So um, I, I think, I think uh, you may have missed my, my question. It, this, does this open a door to say, you know, moving uh, nuisance elk or other things, uh, rote known treatments I know are a no-no. Those are to remove, uh, you know, uh, not unwanted fish. And I, is this the same as, as other nuisance animals? That's my question. Oh, I see what you mean. I, I, I think you're talking about like the kind of, uh, difference in in what duties each section kind of has um, in the division, and I see how you know maybe an other nuisance or depredation, you know something like that could be, you know, open the door for that. But I feel like we have enough scientific evidence of of the, you know, of what the beaver actually do, that we're going to have a nuisance issue. Either way, we got it. We have to take care of that um, if we get funded for if this or not, because that's basically our our job as uh, as the division. So, J Drew and Rhett, this is Justin. Let me weigh in on this. Uh, I had a similar question a couple of years ago, Drew, after my first Habitat Council um, meetings, and and I worked with Kevin Bunnell and Teresa in the Southern Region to do a. Uh, an enhancement, an ongoing and a budget enhancement for for nuisance beaver work. And so what we tried to do was parse that out and say things that come through WRI and through Habitat Council would be for the translocation and those types of things. And then they'd have money in their account that was E1A driven um, in order for them to deal with nuisance beavers. Because I, I, I wasn't completely comfortable with it as either. Um, I, and I'm a lot more comfortable with it now, Drew. So, yeah, it, it seems to me like there are two types of nuisances. There are nuisances that are simply um, drawing complaints from people because they're interfering with human activities or something to that effect. And then there are nuisances such as invasive species or other species that are actually creating habitat degradation, or in this case, you can actually try to find a silver lining by putting them somewhere where they can benefit, uh, you know, another habitat somewhere else. So. You know, it seems to me like if all you're doing is like going out and trapping and killing a beaver because it's bothering, a, you know, an irrigation system, that's probably not a Habitat Council funding issue. But if you're doing it as part of a broader program to um, put beavers in places where they can do some good, then I think you can find a Habitat Council justification for it. I'll buy that. Thanks, John. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I appreciate the feedback. Hey, Rhett, this is Heather. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Awesome. I just wanted to quickly add to that that beavers being a keystone species where a lot of other species are not can be a good distinguishing factor for that as well for the public to understand if it comes down to us needing to educate them about why we are able to turn that nuisance into a, like a restoration project. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate the, that and some good discussion. Are there any other comments or questions about the project? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, we'll look, look towards a motion maybe here. Uh, this is Paul. <clears throat> I, just, I just want to compliment the Southern Region on the strategic planning that you guys have gone through in developing places to put these uh, nuisance beavers and, and just the way you've 
run this program. So I'll, I'll make a motion to um, tentatively approve this for, for funding consideration. Thank you, Paul. We have a motion to tentatively approve. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Approve. I'll oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Should we co-second it, Drew? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll quit screwing around and I'll second it. Okay, but to, you have to arm wrestle, but no, we're good. Justin has seconded the motion and we'll go for a roll call vote. Uh, Tyler Thompson. Uh, always on my favorite projects every year, I vote yes. Votes yes, thank you. Justin Shannon was, was, was the second. Drew, no, Justin was the motion. Drew was the, no, I'm wrong. Justin was the second. <laughs> Drew. Yes. Votes yes. <laughs> <laughs> Getting confused here. Darren West. Yes. Votes yes. Thank you. Dwayne Reading. Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett, Burnett had the motion, correct? Okay. Motion carries. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rhett. Uh, thank Southern Region staff for, for their presentations and for all of their efforts and work here and their partners. So appreciate that. Okay, we're going to go to our last bunch of projects here now from our Northeast Region. Um, project 5023, Northeast Region Beaver Project Trapping Expense Fund. Might be a similar theme going on here. Uh, go ahead. Hey, Eric, they, they canceled this project in that email they sent out to us. Okay. So jump down to the next one. Okay, we're going to jump down to 5200 uh, Northeast Region Aquatic Operation and Maintenance. All right, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so I'm Natalie Boren. I'm the Regional Sport Fish Biologist out in the Northeastern Region. Um, if you can just go to the images and documents and pull up my PowerPoint. Perfect. All right, so this is a project we've had for a couple of years now. Um, it's become very important to our region and we are very thankful to have it each year. It allows us to do a lot of small detail oriented projects and actually conquer some big ones too. Um, if you wanna go down to the next slide. So I just wanna quickly run over the Are you guys still there? And yep, you walked up on us just for a minute, but go ahead and go. Sorry, the internet out in the basin can be super sketchy sometimes. It's like complete right. overload out here. Um, so as I said before, this project goes about maintaining and sustaining angler access and amenities, roads, um, our new Old Fort Ponds WMA and fish screens in our region. So completed tasks with the previous year's fundings include a lot of work up at Old Fort Pond WMA uh, weekly maintenance, noxious weed control, and wetland mitigation reporting for the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we just completed year three, so we'll be moving on to year four. We are required to do wash docks. Calvin's presentation early, we have that same. I mean, that, those pictures were from our big sand wash boat dock. We operate keep that maintained, we move it up and down. Um, we were able to add some bumpers and a wheel system onto that this last year that helped our, our guy that we hire be able to move it safely and not destroy some of the bottom sections of it. Fish screen maintenance on Pelican Lake um, from November to present. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Uh, finished up some cables and install of the Formerly in Lake Pier, it's now at the lower Stillwater Fishing Ponds, um, and the Forest Service is going to be taking over uh, maintenance of that. Restroom pumping uh, at Old Fort Ponds and Big Sandwash. Trex repair work at Little Montez, um, we finished that one up. Fabricating and installing a small water control structure at Old Fort Ponds to better control our in inflow. And then we've got a couple more here. Can you move that up just a hair for me? So brush removal, trash cleanup at multiple angler access report, uh, points. And then the most recent one was repairs at our big sand wash angler access restroom because someone decided to shoot windows out with a shotgun. So 
it really helps us when we have these small maintenance projects that come up. It helps us have a fund to be able to immediately go in and repair them. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so what's coming up new for 2021? Um, a lot of this includes, sorry, I got a little kid at home running around too. So if you hear that in the background, apologies. Um, noxious weed spraying. This is in conjunction with our permit requirements for the Old Fort Ponds. We do that in the spring and the fall. We do bi-weekly mowing and trimming and upkeep of the grounds around the ponds. We've got restroom cleaning that we do every two weeks and in the season pumping, we have a weekly trash pickup. All this stuff is just regular annual maintenance that we've got pretty well dialed in for being able to run that WMA and community fishing pond. The culinary water supply, delivery of irrigation shares to the pond. I hire a, a local kid to come up and clean the screen and do some trash pickup up there with this fund. Um, we talked about the report already. And then I also am using this project as a placeholder for some funding through Uena Water Conservancy District for our mitigation, for their mitigation. They're gonna help us install a pipeline that delivers water directly to Old Fort Ponds. This is still, I am still waiting. I hear things from them and I just need a placeholder for when this funding comes through to be able to put the pipeline in. So that's what that for. You still there, Natalie, with us? Are you Natalie? there yet? Oh, we're yeah. back. We're back? Yes. Sorry, the next problem that I have is every time someone calls my cell phone, it stops the internet. Okay, can you scroll down one more time? <clears throat> okay, this is a big section of what's going on in our future is these fish screens um, we've got the one above Pelican now in place. It's a full-time permanent screen. We've got the one below Starvation, which is a temporary screen. And as soon as they authorize the construction crew to begin um, installing the Red Fleet fish screen, it will be in place. And that one's going to be much more labor intensive. Um, we need some help. We need a seasonal to be able to go through and just do these maintenance projects and the screen uh, cleanings themselves. So I'll show you here in the finance page in just a second. But we've got this big sand wash dock moving that we do, Little Montez regrading and resloping project. So that one's coming up 5203. I think Pat's going to apply for that. Um, just some ongoing projects. And every season, these become a little bit different. We like to rotate through some of the large projects that we are trying to complete. So we don't overload um, the maintenance staff that we do have, which is not much. Go down to the last slide. Okay, this is just our funding request this year. So we're asking for $34,500. $21,250 of that is a nine month tech one position um, to complete all the above described tasks. We've got a little bit of motor pool um, expense in there because we do anticipate a lot of travel with this um, with the maintenance that this, this person will be doing. And then the, not, the remaining 9,800 is that Old Fort Pond general maintenance, the report writing, um, anything else that may come up in that. Got the placeholder and then some in-kind money. So like I said before, we really appreciate you guys funding this for the past few years. It's helped keep us afloat. It's helped um, fix up a lot of our amenities that we have built over the past few years. And it will keep us going into the future with these fish screens that are becoming completed in our region. So with that, I'll take any questions if you have some and sorry for the technical difficulties. Comes with the territory, right? Thanks, Natalie, appreciate your time. Uh, any discussion and questions for Natalie on this project? To okay. Was there a, did you present a Northwest, Northeast region WMA maintenance proposal at the beginning of this year to handle things like seasonals and all that? Um, I, I did not, that might be through our uh, habitat 
crew, which Pat Rainbolt does have a WMA maintenance in there. And we actually have discussed this as several, several years now. We can, anything Old Fort Pond WMA, we can eventually move over into that WMA budget. Yeah, it, it seems like you're, all of this, and you said it yourself, was just simply maintenance and it doesn't seem to be Habitat Council related. I mean, I, I understand some of it is, but it looks just like, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense that we would supply you with all these funds for all this maintenance. It, I, I'm having a tough time saying how it, what I'm trying to say here, but it should be hey, a proposal, the main maintenance proposal, and not bits and pieces here and there. It's just not a bad. It's just not a good way to do it. Hi, Dwayne. This is Pat. Uh, if I could chime in on that, yeah, I submitted that that NER WMA maintenance proposal and. Uh, that's just our general maintenance budget, um, you know, for our wildlife management areas over the years. A lot, a lot of this stuff Natalie's proposing, like, like the old Fort Pond, that's a totally new wildlife management area that, that we haven't had it accounted for in the, in the regular maintenance budget. Um, a lot of that WMA maintenance budget you saw back in January is, is, is really geared toward terrestrial projects. Um, a lot of Natalie's stuff is just is, is more geared towards towards aquatics things. Um, I guess I guess in the future, maybe we could combine those two if if that would streamline it a little bit for everyone and 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 um, you know bump that budget up. We we've kept that NER maintenance budget the same for ten plus years, so maybe it's time to revise that um, as we move along. I would agree. Yeah, this is Drew. I would I would agree as well. Uh, there's some you know consistency there and some simplicity that we're missing. I, I guess um, you know speaking for this this fiscal year, um, we we don't have the funds to in in our normal maintenance budget to. To account for Natalie's request for this this particular proposal, um, so uh, maybe moving forward and in, into the next year's proposals, we we could include that if if the council would like to see that, we could do that. I think that would be a good idea for next year. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion about that point or other questions for Natalie? Okay, uh, not hearing any. Uh, we'll look to a motion, possibly. Eric, I'll yeah, make that. You. I'll make that motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay, thank you, Justin. Uh, do I have a I'll second? second? Yeah. This okay, is Drew. We, have a, we have a second from from Drew. Uh, we'll go to the roll call. Uh, Tyler Thompson. Votes oh, yeah. yes. Justin Shannon made the motion. Drew Cushing seconded the motion. Darren West. Yes. Votes oh, yes. Dwayne Reading. I vote yes. Votes oh, yes. Jack Ray. Yes. Votes oh, yes. Paul Burnett. I vote yes. Okay. Voted yes. The motion. Uh, passes. Um, hey, uh, Natalie, can you can you please work with the Habitat crew out there and make sure that uh, those needs are addressed through their regular uh, Habitat maintenance ask? If you're yes. still there. Yeah. Thank you. And that would re that would mean everything that goes in that is involved with Old Fort Ponds WMA, correct? Everything else remains separate. Eric? What are your thoughts, Eric? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm looking to some precedent here, maybe from some of the other folks as to, you know, typically we've, we've had, you know, um, more water related things separated out, I guess. I, and so, um, so I guess I would say yes to have it include all of that next time. 
I think that was your point, Dwayne, that uh, Andrew, that uh, we wanted to include that in the, the regular request, correct? That's yes. correct. I think it'd be much simpler if this all came through in one one package is WMA maintenance requests. And then we weren't hit with another another seasonal here and another seasonal there and we knew what we were getting into. Yeah, and that was that was my point too. And I'm glad you brought it up, Dwayne. If we're gonna ask for maintenance assistance uh, that we ask for it once. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would, so just, I would just to clarify though, Natalie, everything that Natalie asked for was for WMAs, is that correct? Just on the aquatic side? No, it's not all. Only the Old Fort Pond is the WMA. Everything else is every other spot in our region that is not a WMA. We have no other funding sources for those types of things. And that's what's traditionally been funded by this Habitat Council proposal. Yeah, because there's there's a little bit of difference in my opinion. I, I, I look at our WMAs and I think they should be the flagship properties it, that we have, whether it's terrestrial or aquatic. And um, and so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to start setting precedents where we would throw in a bunch of projects or maintenance stuff that was outside of a WMA into a WA maintenance um, request. And so I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about combining every aspect of that, but um, just my two cents. So. No, thank you, Justin. Paul, do you have yeah, a comment? I, I had one other item and, and just, I, I feel like I kind of, there's there's a number of these that I, uh, there's been some guzzler maintenance, which I think regions have gone through this process through their regular uh, WMA maintenance stuff. Uh, at least I remember some guzzler maintenance project that we heard in January. And what I'd like to do at, at some point as a, as a you know, DWR staff is actually review those, those regional maintenance needs and assess where they actually belong and what we should actually create permanent funding for, or at least make that attempt and what actually needs to be addressed through this process. Uh, it just seems like everything is pretty scattered to me. Yeah, that's fair. Maybe that's a good conversation for a leadership team meeting, Drew. If if you and I and Eric took those those requests and, and had that conversation. In the meantime, I'm completely comfortable funding Natalie, uh, with, whether it's in multiple requests or single requests. Um, I think she always does a really good job with, with the work that she does out there. I think she's great, so. Agreed. Yeah, thank you for that, that comment, uh, Justin. I appreciate that. Um, so I guess what we're saying is, is um, you know, maybe looking in the next year, anything WMA related that's put over WMAs, but between Drew and Justin and myself, we will talk to the leadership team about overall maintenance funding uh, coming from this source or whether it needs to be coming from somewhere else. Um, and so it kind of brings up a bigger question. And so I appreciate that. And, and, and us three will kind of look to uh, the leadership team to uh, try to address that a little bit, a little bit more. So with that, um, let's see here. Uh, I've got one more comment here. Uh, okay. Uh, Annie, did you want to jump on with the question? Or is that something different? Yeah, I guess uh, with one thing I never quite understood, or maybe there's there and it could be maybe the region could explain it is mostly in all the regions uh, maintenance is performed by the habitat section we have we employ the maintenance specialists and so forth but in the northeast region they, there is an aquatics uh, journey maintenance specialist and I don't know if that's a difference in why this how why they kind of have a different funding mechanism here or that could be addressed as well but that that's not something I guess I totally understood of um, why that region has an extra need than over others, but. The journeyman maintenance position is actually just solely within natives. So they're funded, that position, um, that's Garrett Turnier, he is funded solely through natives. So he he does help out a little bit with um, some of the sport fish stuff, but he is very restricted on what he can spend his time on just because of the funding source. Um, and as far as your other question, 
we have lots of aquatics maintenance that needs to be done. I mean, we're adding, we're even adding stuff in, fish screens and um, yeah. So I don't have a great answer for you. It's just, that's how we've done I didn't it, mean, I guess. And I didn't mean it that way. It's just, that was, that, that's one difference within the division that is out there. And so, I, sure. and I had forgot that he was more involved with the natives. So makes sense. I think it was just really a need that Sportfish had, and we didn't have any way to work on filling it at the moment. So it was just created brainstorming with several people a few years ago and how to complete all these maintenance backlogs we had. So if it can evolve into something more permanent, I mean, that's what we would prefer is to have some help through something more permanent. But at this point, this is our only avenue to complete some of these tasks that we don't have any other funding for. So that's just kind of the history of that part. Thanks for the clarifications. I appreciate that. Uh, it's, you know, brings up a good discussion that uh, looks like we need to have at some higher levels, uh, you know, to look at division wide of how these things are occurring. So, um, so with that, uh, look towards, is, is there any other additional questions on this subject or should we look towards a motion? Okay, I'm not hearing any other questions. Go ahead, didn't Justin. We, didn't we already vote on this or am I losing my mind? <laughs> I think we did, Eric. I think you yeah, get in <laughs> I appreciate that. <clears throat> it's getting late in the day. I'm willing to vote again. I'll make the motion again. I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. If we voted, we voted. Okay, okay. I would, uh, <laughs> I'm going to put a, uh, yeah, a, an additional check mark against all of these ones to, so that I know that we've actually voted on them. Okay, we're almost done. We're getting close. Uh, 5271 Starvation Pier Irving. Go. Yeah, so I'm going to present this one. Um, Daniel, can you go to images and documents? There is a short presentation under documents. So fast. So this is kind of just to wrap up that starvation pier. Uh, we did get the all of the asphalt and the concrete work done. We got the pier installed. State Parks did a great job there. Uh, we've added things like dock lights and uh, some dock droppers and it's looking pretty good. Obviously it's not in right now. They won't put it in until probably, gosh, I, I'm not sure with COVID, but it would typically be early May, uh, I think is when they would put it in and, and they take it out early October. Um, so we've got a good five, about five months. Um, and so this is just really wrapping up one final thing that we probably overlooked um, and should have done in the first place. Um, is the presentation not coming up? Can you guys not see it? Uh-uh, cannot. I could just wing it, but there's some some pictures in there that I kind of wanted to show off, I guess. It's coming up, coming back there we on. Go. There we go. Perfect. There it is. Um, so there's a nice sign where we're acknowledging all of our funding sources. Um, Habitat Council is just uh, the division logo, which I thought was interesting. But uh, you can see the the handrails are installed. Um, all of those are permitted except for the very bottom ones. Um, the handicap signs are in and uh, it just looks really good and people have been using it. We are gonna do a grand opening, hopefully at the, towards the end of June in association with their 50th, Starvation's 50th anniversary. Um, but I guess we'll see how things all go. Um, next slide. So they did come back to finish up the handrail. So the very bottom section, it's about 314 feet. And that um, those handrails are removable so that as the water level, because that bottom section of, of sidewalk is, um, is meant to be like the top of it is the high water mark. So when starvation is full, that whole, that whole section of sidewalk will be underwater. Um, and as the water level comes down, then um, 
yeah, they'll just have to um, add in the, the handrails and move that pier down. So they got almost all the way through the handrail install, but they couldn't get all the way um, just because the water level ended up being higher this past fall than it was the previous fall when they actually laid the concrete. So they do need to finish that up. Um, and state parks, instead of seeing, or I guess in addition to those removable handrails, they wanted curbing on either side. So go to the next slide, please. Slide three. <laughs> um, is it not moving? Okay, then it, it just jumped to four. <laughs> Go back to three. <laughs> I don't know why it's being complicated, sorry. No, it's okay. It looks like we failed on it too, so you'll jump right back on. Okay, so, and, and really, I, I just kind of wanted to show the picture of um, that bottom section of sidewalk uh, that at the time was only only partially had the removable rails in place, but all of that area, like I said, it was going to be about 314 feet from the high water mark down all the way to the bottom. Um, everything like everything basically that doesn't have handrails, we're going to put a we'd, we'd like to put curbing on either side. Um, so it's the request is for fourteen thousand dollars. That's to hire a contractor. Um, so they'd remove the currently installed handrails for a five and a half by six inch um, curb along that lowermost. So they'd have to, you know, excavate a little bit out on either side, uh, and then they'd have to reinstall the handrails. So the handrails would still be functional. They would still move them, at, reinstall them, and install them as the water level moved. Um, and I, I also have to note that it all completely depends on. Um, whether or not the the whole section of sidewalk is exposed, whether or not we'd be able to do it, but um, you got to ask for it, right? I can't just ask for it when I know because that'd be September. So um, yeah, um, that's really it. Um, the next slide, that last slide, just shows a picture of one of the reasons why State Parks really wants to see that. Um, you can see that. Um, the handrails weren't completely installed at this point. They hadn't come back out and reinstalled it. So it, you know, typically in a typical year, the handrails, the removable handrails would be installed further down, but you can imagine there's still times where that pier is going to be pushed out further. And it would just be nice to have that curbing on either side so that, um, you know, the wind and wave action just doesn't move it, just rock it off of the, the sidewalk. Um, and again, asking for, uh, I think it was fourteen thousand dollars. They might have been a little bit more in there, and I have every intention of doing it this year. Of course, the water level will dictate that. I don't want to get it started, you know, and have to do it in pieces. I'd rather just do it all at once. I think so. Anyway, that's it. Um, the, I think it looks really good. I'm really excited about it and how it turned out. And um, yeah, there's some really nice smallmouth underneath that pier already. So they moved right in right away. Thanks, Trina. Is there any uh, questions or comments on that project? Okay. There's no questions. We can look towards a motion, maybe. This is Paul Burnett. I'll continue my support for this project and uh, make a motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Paul Burnett. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Dwayne, second. Okay. Um, Dwayne, I'll take yours. If that's okay, Drew. Uh, we have Dwayne as a second on that. And we'll go through the list. Tyler Thompson? I vote yes. Votes yes. Justin Shannon? Uh, I vote yes as well. Okay. Drew Cushing? Yes. All right. Darren West? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Dwayne, you were the second on the motion. Jack Ray? Yes. 
Thank you. And Paul Burnett, you made the motion. So uh, the motion passes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Okay. We'll move to the next project. Uh, uh, 5315 Bullock Draw Reservoir Eurasian uh, Water Milk Well Control Project Phase One. Go for it. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Richard Gibbs. I'm I'm here in the northeastern region. I'm the AIS biologist for the northeastern and the northern region, and we're going to be discussing Bullock Draw. The Bullock Draw is a 98-acre reservoir located between Vernal and Roosevelt, and it used to be a a fishery for tiger, muskie, and wiper, and also rainbow. And um, right now. Eurasian water milfoil is taken over the lake where you don't have any type of angler access um, from the shore or from boat. It's the worst case of milfoil that, that I've ever seen before. So it's it's to a point where the lake or the reservoir is virtually useless from a fishing standpoint. And if you wouldn't mind going to documents and pull the uh, PowerPoint there. Or not PowerPoint, but the uh, PDF. Yeah, there we go. So go to the uh, next slide or the next page. Great, thanks. So right now, we're looking to have a functioning fishery with a management plan. As I stated earlier, um, it's it's just not. There's nothing you can do right now as far as fishing, and we want to provide boating access from the shore access from the ramp and, and also a shore and and also by reducing or getting rid of the milfoil or at least controlling it it will, it will reduce the uh, abundance of habitat which supports many unwanted rough fish in the system white carp or white sucker and carp and it will also improve the water quality by the removal of the milfoil which would help with reducing the fish kills during the uh, hot summers of the month. And then also regain some of the water storage back via clean ex excavation in the future once the milfoil is, is uh, removed or controlled. Next. So first of all, we're gonna, we're gonna um, do a small scale treatment with uh, the chemical renovate prior to the larger scale treatment. And we already have enough chemical to treat 10 acres. And we're going to focus around the, uh, the primitive launch ramp and along the dam that will allow some angler access from the shore and possibly be able to get out there a little bit on a boat. And the renovate. As I mentioned, it's already purchased, so it's no cost to Habit Habitat Council. And then, and we're going to be doing that portion tentatively this year in in July, uh, when everything is when nothing being pulled from that reservoir for for irrigation. And then the following year in, in uh, FY 21 is when we're we're going to be looking to do in the large scale chemical treatment with the chemical Priscilacor, and that will treat the entire reservoir. Next slide. So total cost is for the for the whole project is going to be 68,700. Uh, we're asking 65,200 from Habitat Council, and in kind is going to be 3,500. As you see, if you can see in the picture there, you can see how bad it is out there. It's just, it's just not functional in any aspect when it comes to fishing or, or anything. So it'd be nice to have a management plan and be able to have that as a, as a fishery. So with that being said, you have any questions? Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, we're looking for any discussion or questions on this project. I just have one, Richard. This is Drew. 
Uh, what's the nature of this chemical? Is it an annual treatment? Is it uh, what's the regimen? What what does it take to maintain such a treatment? Yeah, good question. So with the uh, the large scale treatment with, with Priscilacor, that's according to the uh, the people that I was that's going to be providing the chemical and applying it. He said it's just going to be one time treatment, and then there might be some spot treatments. Um, but he said it should be just a one-time treatment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you wanted to add there, Trina or Natalie? I would just add that if we could get this to work and we could prove that we can control milfoil in a smaller setting like this, we may have hope for some of our other places. But right now we have a virtually useless fishery completely engulfed by milk oil that could be something really great. So whatever shape or form this may take this year or next year or whatever, this is really just a beginning point to trying to prove that we can control this stuff. We know it's a nasty invasive. So any support we can get from anyone anywhere basically is gonna be a good step moving forward. This is Paul Burnett. I have, I have a question about the, the chemical. So is it, I mean, if it's a one-time treatment, is it a, a does it residualize, or um, I mean, or is it is it something that just kills the whole the milfoil population within the whole lake in that one shot? But it, but are, are we still at risk of um, not having success if if there's a source somewhere else of the milfoil entering the lake? Yeah, good question. So we're always going to have a potential risk of of of, um, of a potential source um, infecting the lake, and so we need to try to see where that source came from. But as far as the chemical, it's supposed to kill everything that's in the lake at the time. And um, but yeah, it'd be potentially uh, susceptible to reestablishment if it got in there again. How does the plant propagate? I mean, does if you kill all the live plants, are there seeds left? Are there potential for things to still re regrow from that kind of thing? So, from what I understand, I mean, they it's spread through uh, fragments, and um, with Priscilacor, it, it kills them. Um, um, it's absorbed through the uh, through the plant, and then it, it kills them all the way down to the root. And uh, so everything floats to the bottom at that point. Um, so you can have a little bit of a bio or a good amount of biomass at the bottom of the lake. Um, but according to the uh, sea pro, it's, it's the guys that uh, distribute the chemical. Um, he was saying that once that chemical sets in, it's, um, it kills it completely. It's not going to spread unless it gets infected by another source. Yeah, this is I just Tyler. one more time. Sorry, Tyler. Um, a monitoring plan post treatment for the next few years would be essential to this treatment, I would think. You would have to monitor for any kind of regrowth. You'd have to do those spot treatments right away and be right on top of it. I don't think you could just treat and let it go and just see what happens. You have to keep tabs on it. Yeah, that's right, Natalie. They also, with, with that, um, with that cost, uh, the uh, the company that would be doing the application, that also includes um, multiple um, checkups and uh, on that lake to see how things are progressing. So, uh, just a question. I don't know if the northeastern region folks can answer this or not, but it seems like three, four, five years ago we got a proposal from the southern region to use a biological weevil um, on the fish lake, maybe if Nick's still on. I'm just curious how that works down on the fish lake and if that's an option here as well. We've been yes. asking Nick, oh sorry, are you on Nick? Bill, you go yeah, ahead. I'm on, this is Nick, I can answer that. Um, so we had high hopes for the weevil project and it, it just didn't work. Um, so I think this last fall was 
it was five or six years since we introduced them. And we did annual monitoring and each year we just saw fewer and fewer weevils down to where the last couple of years we didn't see any and weren't seeing any signs of significant no foil die off or anything. So I, for whatever reason, they just didn't survive and reproduce and control the no foil the way we thought it would. Um, I'm not sure if it was the elevation or the perch population or, or what, but we basically decided that it, it didn't work. And you know, it, it, it may work in another place, but it definitely didn't work at Fish Lake. We'd be really interested to see how this project turns out if it goes forward. Um, we, when I was looking into it, I had trouble finding a herbicide that we felt good about, but we were always kind of tempted by it. So this would be really interesting to see how it worked out because there's a lot of waters that could really benefit from that. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. All right, any other questions or discussion? Okay, if not, uh, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make the motion to approve it. Okay, we have a motion to approve the project. Do we have a second? This is Drew, I'll second. Thank you, Drew. So we have a motion from Tyler and a second from Drew. We'll go through the rest of the roll call now. Uh, Tyler made the motion, Justin Shannon. I vote yes, and I hope it works out. This would be great. Yes, I agree. Votes yes. Thank you. Uh, Drew made the second on the motion. Darren West? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. Paul Burnett? Uh, I vote yes. Votes yes. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously, and I, too, hope this works out. I think it could mean some, some help to other waters, too. So. Uh, be interesting to see how this works out. So thank you. Okay, two more. Uh, 5365 Lake Canyon Stream Improvements, phase two. You can go. Yeah, I'm going to present this for Brian. He's actually out at Lake Canyon today. Um, so this is just the next phase of what they're working on now, um, but specifically like really focusing more on the in-channel work. So he's posted, he didn't do a presentation, but he's got, um, he's got some pictures that we could go through. Um, so he's really gonna be focusing on the spawning gravels, um, improving the ripple functioning, um, restoring some of the fish hotels that were installed. Um, that's just, a, yeah. So if you wanna just keep going down, it's, it, his pictures kind of show some that actually are in need of repair work, um, some where like the fish hotels got sedimented in, um, that, and then some where they got damaged by cattle. We had, we've had like this, this area right here that he's showing that's just a riffle that kind of needs some improvement work. Um, and yeah, some of the fish, how fish hotels were damaged by cattle. Um, we've had trespass cattle issues in the past the, to deal with that, though, the regions really kind of stepped up, like all of the, the sections all together really taken different times of the year and said, okay, we're going to keep an eye on Lake Canyon this time of the year so that when there are trespass livestock, any kind, we can get them out of there and get the owners contacted um, and keep them from damaging. Uh, this is the, that's up right now, that's a section of the creek that just needs um, this vegetation cleared and so that this, the creek is more exposed and um, isn't just overrun with vegetation. So those are the kinds of things that they'll be working on for this next phase. Um, yeah, so they're really like, there's um, there's good habitat up above, higher up. So they're gonna be kind of moving their efforts down closer to the lake um, and just doing um, what he, like as he calls it, um, just these Rosgen style and um, just well accepted prescriptions for the different areas of Lake Canyon Creek. And it's all in an effort to try to improve 
the population or a cutthroat population there. Um, just in case you don't know, the Lake Canyon Lake, which is down below this creek, um, that is a brood population for us. And that is where we go every year to take eggs. And it is the source of our North Tavaputs fish. So all those eggs that we collect at Lake Canyon go to places like um, Willow Creek on the, the tributary to the strawberry below Soldier Creek Dam. Um, to Kirk Creek Reservoir and, and other places that are in that Tavaputs area. So it is a very important location for us and improving the cutthroats that are in the creek, improving their ability to spawn and just maintain a healthy population in higher numbers is really going to benefit us in the long run. Any questions? This is Tyler. I had a question on the budget. You've got $8,500 down for an excavator. Um, is that something that's covered with the excavator that we already lease for the heavy equipment crew each year? That is a good question. I'm going to say no, because he's got costs associated with the heavy equipment crew. Um, it would probably be best if, if, is there a way to maybe follow up with him to confirm um, but I'm, I can, I really don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I can speak to what they're doing right now. Uh, Ben crew just went out there yesterday or today. And, um, they were talking about renting a smaller mini excavator and then they decided to just use, uh, to try what, with what we have. And so I imagine that it's kind of the same thinking there. And, and maybe after the next couple of weeks, he'll have a better idea of what works, if the big excavator will, will do what they need. Do you want me to have more info? Yeah, if you wouldn't just mind following up with him and just have yes. him remove that yeah. item if it's not necessary. Okay. Okay, great. Any other questions on this? All right, let's look towards the motion then. I move to approve. This is Drew. Thank you, Drew. We have a motion to approve from Drew and a second from Tyler. Go to the roll call. Uh, Tyler already seconded. Justin Shannon? Yes. Votes yes. Drew made the motion. Darren West? Yes. Votes yes. Dwayne Reading? Yes. Votes yes. Jack Ray? Yes. Votes yes. And Paul Burnett? All votes yes. All votes yes. Thank you. Motion carries. To recommend for funding. Thank you, Trina. Okay. Last Thank one. You. Yep. Montez Creek. WMA improvements, phase one. Well, hey everyone, uh, this is Pat Rainbold in the Northeast region. Uh, this is the Montez Creek WMA improvements, phase one. Uh, a little a little bit about the WMA, it's, it's about 200 acres in size. Uh, it's an important community fishery. Um, it's about three miles Northeast of uh, the town of Roosevelt. Uh, we get a lot of a lot of people using this WMA mainly for to fish over there. Uh, see a lot of youth over there fishing, so great for uh, recruiting young anglers. Um, we've done a lot with this WMA over the past ten years to just kind of keep up with the increased demand. It went from kind of being a little secret spot in the world to we we really get a lot of heavy use over there now. So some of the upgrades we've done in the past. Um, We've ex expanded the parking area. Um, uh, the fisheries program has installed a bathroom and, and keep up with the maintenance of that. Uh, we've had a lot of Russian olive removal, a lot of uh, uh, native tree planting to replace to replace those trees, some fencing upgrades. Uh, Natalie's done a lot of work with the, uh, the pier and some underwater uh, fish habitat structures. Uh, the species there are bluegill, largemouth bass, uh, we do get a, occasionally get rainbows from the local fish hatchery there. Uh, it is one of our pheasant release sites. Um, get a lot of use from uh, youth hunters out there, and uh, 
some folks uh, use it as a, a, a place to train their dogs as well. Um, there's mule deer, there's turkey there, quail, and um, it's also become a neat spot for, uh, with our pollinator emphasis here lately, it's a, a tagging location for mon monarch butterflies to monitor their, uh, their migration. Um, so that's kind of cool. So this project, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's one of the butterflies with the, with the little tag they have on it there. And um, so this project, um, uh, it's a, it's a few things to, to really upgrade this, this WMA. It's kind of outside the scope and capabilities of our normal maintenance budget. So it's uh, one part is the engineering um, and remodeling of the fishing pier access uh, to upgrade that to uh, ADA standards. <clears throat> um, we installed this fishing pier uh, uh, maybe seven, eight years ago when Calvin was still in the region. Uh, and, and just put a ramp into it, but that ramp is really steep. Uh, it's causing some issues uh, for for folks that are disabled, as well as folks that are, are just uh, maybe pushing their kids, their small kids down there in a stroller. So it's it's a safety hazard that needs to be remedied. Um, another thing is uh, we get a lot of non-motorized watercraft use, uh, kayaks, canoes in, in this uh, in this reservoir. So uh, we'd like to provide a trail for those folks and a small little ramp just to make it easier for them so they don't have to, to bushwhack their kayak down through a, you know, and uh, through a place with no trail or anything and, and just provide them with some access. Um, <clears throat> we do need to expand the parking area with the amount of use we're, we're having there. So they're, part of this project is expanding that parking area into one of the crop fields there. Um, there are two uh, irrigated pastures we have there. The, the northern pasture is about 14 acres. Um, we grow alfalfa and uh, some grain in, in, in there for the birds and, and the, the deer like it too. So uh, some of this project funding is going towards uh, planting trees on the edge of that where we still get irrigation water um, um, that's already there. So. Um, the lower field, it's a seven acre field. It's it's adjacent to a house and the parking area. So legally you can't shoot there. Um, so we're part of this project is an upgrade of that. Uh, it's seven acres. We have uh, irrigation water already there. So this is phase one of upgrading that, uh, that field to uh, pollinator plantings. Um, this year it's herbicide only. Uh, just to kind of prep the field for future plantings. That's why this is a phase one. Um, I think in future years, we'll, we'll turn this. So here's some pictures. You, you see the PowerPoint there. You see the, the fishing pier. Uh, that's that's what it looks like almost any time you drive down there. You, you see a lot of people using that pier. Um, the, the picture on the left there, it's a scout project we had a few years ago planting some cottonwood trees to try to replace the Russian olives that were remo removed there. Uh, and uh, you see the turkey there, uh, um, they use that place quite a bit. Uh, and then the, the bottom picture, it's our, our very own Clint Sampson. You know, these guys like to bring their, their kids out and, and, and enjoy that WMA and, and uh, putting some time into that. Um, let's scroll on down to the last slide there. Uh, here you see some more of the, the, uh, the butterfly, the caterpillar there. Um, See the pheasant reliefs and uh, another turkey picture. So really cool spot in the world, gets a lot of use, um, it's really increased over the years. So this project kind of takes a, a few areas that need a lot of upgrades that are kind of outside of our regular maintenance capabilities. And uh, with that, I'll take uh, any questions. Thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, uh, discussion and questions, please. I would just add to this project that it's a pretty cool cooperative project between Habitat, Aquatics, and Outreach at this point. We've all got a lot of dedication to upgrade this site and work together to get this phase and multiple other phases done into the future. So thanks, Pat. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that too. We've worked with our um, Pheasants Forever rep, uh, Charlie Holtz, and, and Dwayne spent some time down there with me. and. Uh, looking at a potential for projects at this WMA. So uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of partners on this one. 
This is Dwayne. I've spent a lot of time on this property and it's it's well worth any effort we do to improve it. It's a it truly is a unique piece of property out there. Okay, anything else from anybody? Just on the funding, it doesn't have anything, any value for big game, um, should it? Or or is that, is there not a lot of big game in that area? I don't know very well. Um, you know, there's some side benefits from the game that for the big game. Um, as far as like a hunting opportunity, it's, it, it's not really one because of the proximity to, to the roads and vehicles and to, to the house there. So I didn't include that. It would be a very small portion. Um, we mainly feed some some wintering deer on that WMA, but as far as providing a, a, a sportsman's opportunity, um, it's really not there for big game. That's fair. Thanks. Eric, if there's nothing else, I'd make the motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay. Uh, I'll it. All right. Thank you, uh, Justin made the motion to tentatively approve for funding and was seconded by Jack, is that correct? No, I'm not sure who seconded it. Dwayne, second. Dwayne, second. Who's that? Dwayne, sorry. Thank you, Dwayne. No problem. Um, we'll go to the roll call. Uh, Tyler Thompson. I vote yes. Vote yes. Justin Shannon made the motion, Drew Cushing. Yes. Vote yes. Aaron West. Yes. Vote yes. Dwayne seconded the motion. Go to Jack. Yes. Vote yes. Paul Burnett. I vote yes. All right. We have full voting of affirmative and the motion carried. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for presenting that. And so with that, um, that's the end of uh, approving projects. Um, we have just a couple of quick business items we need to take care of on scheduling. Uh, first off, we want to, well, thank our Southeast or our Northeast region folks for being on with us, as well as any of our other staff who are still on. Thanks for being with us. Um, but we want to confirm our next meeting uh, will be the 28th that was originally scheduled for, for only a half a day. Are we, are we saying that we need to have that scheduled to be a full day? I guess I'm looking to Daniel and Allison to confirm that. Yes, this will be the big game meeting. So it'll be all day. Okay. Uh, does that still work for everybody? Yes. 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 Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, so that means we need to reschedule our final funding meeting, which was going to be originally the 28th. Um, and I guess we'll be looking for some dates probably in May. Is that a fair assessment, Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know how, how far out Daniel maybe advise as to how, how far out we want to go. I mean, we've got, um, you know, May 12th, 13th, or do we can go the week after that, like to the 19th or 20th? What are, what are people feeling? The 14th works for me. I don't know if anybody else. Yeah, I'd say the sooner the better. The 14th works for me too. Okay. Um, yeah. That could definitely work. And I can I could do the 14th as well. I can also. Awesome. Okay. We have a date for our final meeting, uh, 14th of May. Okay. Um, Al Allison or Daniel or Danny, any other business that we need to take care of? Okay, if not, um, or ask for a motion. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I will get the 
spreadsheet updated with the next meetings uh, projects and get that out to you guys soon so you can have that um, for your funding consideration information. So Sounds other than good. that, that's all I have. Okay, and Daniel, uh, if you could set the appointment in the calendar and send that out to everybody for that day, that would be great. And then um, before we adjourn or before we ask for a motion to adjourn, uh, I need to thank uh, Allison, Daniel, Danny, Lisa, Michael Christensen, Paul Gedge for everything that they've done on this. I thank the Habitat Council members for staying on for a long full day online and a web conference. I think I think it went well and uh, and we made it work. So I appreciate everybody a lot um, making this work and and hopefully we can get back to normal and doing this more more normal way one of these days and you can also get lunch too. But with that, is there any other questions or discussion for today? Well done everybody. Thank you. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I suppose we're all unanimous, correct? Yes. Okay. Hey, hey Tyler, Tyler, why did you decline the calendar invite? I thought you said you could meet the 14th. Oh, that was just, I thought that was a mistake by you sending it to everybody. You Me? sent it to everyone, yeah. What was it? It was Habitat Council. I sent it? You sent it to everybody, yeah. People do that all the time. Yeah. I got it. Oh, I got it. Sorry, guys. I don't know okay. what I'm doing. Out. All right. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you again, everybody. Appreciate everybody's help and work. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Okay. Michael, Paul, thank you so much. Appreciate all your efforts. Allison, 